Under the reign of Almamon at Baghdad, of Michael the Stammerer of, at Constantinople, the islands of Crete and Sicily were subdued by the Arabs. The former of these conquests is disdained by their own writers, who were ignorant of the fame of Jupiter and Minos, but it has not been overlooked by the Byzantine historians, who now begin to cast a clear light on the affairs of their own times. A band of Andalusian volunteers, discontented with the climate or government of Spain, explored their adventures by sea, but as they sailed in no more than ten or twenty galleys, their warfare must be branded with the name of piracy. As the subjects and sectaries of the white party, they might lawfully invade the dominions of the black caliphs. A rebellious faction introduced them into Alexandria. They cut in pieces both friends and foes, pillaged the churches and the mosques, sold about six thousand Christian captives, and maintained their station in the capital of Egypt, till they were oppressed by the forces and the presence of Almamon himself. From the mouth of the Nile to the Hellespont, the islands and sea coasts, both of the Greeks and Moslems, were exposed to their depredations. They saw, they invited, they tasted the fertility of Crete, and soon returned with forty galleys to a more serious attack. The Andalusians wandered over the land fearless and unmolested. But when they descended with their plunder to the seashore, their vessels were in flames, and their chief, Abu Kaab, confessed himself the author of the mischief. Their clamors accused his madness or treachery. Of what do you complain? replied the crafty Emir. I have brought you to a land flowing with milk and honey. Here is your true country, repose from your toils, and forget the barren place of your nativity. And our wives and children? Your beauteous captives will supply the place of your wives, and in their embraces you will soon become the fathers of a new progeny. The first habitation was their camp, with a ditch and rampart in the bay of Suda, but an apostate monk led them to a more desirable position in the eastern parts, and the name of Kandax, their fortress and colony, has been extended to the whole island, and as a corrupt and modern appellation of Candia. The hundred cities of the age of Minos were diminished to thirty, and of these only one, most probably Chidonia, had courage to retain the substance of freedom and the profession of Christianity. The Saracens of Crete soon repaired the loss of their navy, and the timbers of Mount Ida were launched into the main. During a hostile period of 138 years, the princes of Constantinople attacked these licentious corsairs with fruitless curses and ineffectual arms. The loss of Sicily was occasioned by an act of superstitious rigor. An amorous youth, who had stolen a nun from her cloister, was sentenced by the emperor to the amputation of his tongue. Euphemius appealed to the reason and policy of the Saracens of Africa, and soon returned with the imperial purple, a fleet of one hundred ships, and an army of seven hundred horse and ten thousand foot. They landed at Mazara, near the ruins of the ancient Selenus. But after some partial victories, Syracuse was delivered by the Greeks. The apostate was slain before her walls, and his African friends were reduced to the necessity of feeding on the flesh of their own horses. In their turn they were relieved by a powerful reinforcement of their brethren of Andalusia. The largest and western part of the island was gradually reduced, and the commodious harbor of Palermo was chosen for the seat of the naval and military power of the Saracens. Syracuse preserved about fifty years the faith which she had sworn to Christ and to Caesar. In the last and fatal siege, her citizens displayed some remnant of the spirit which had formerly resisted the powers of Athens and Carthage. They stood about twenty days against the battering rams and catapult, the mines and tortoises of the besiegers, and the place might have been relieved if the mariners of the imperial fleet had not been detained at Constantinople in building a church to the Virgin Mary. The deacon Theodosius, with the bishop and clergy, was dragged in chains from the altar to Palermo, 
cast into a subterraneous dungeon, and exposed to the hourly peril of death or apostasy. His pathetic and not inelegant complaint may be read as the epitaph of his country. From the Roman conquest to this final calamity, Syracuse, now dwindled to the primitive isle of Ortigia, had insensibly declined. Yet the relics were still precious. The plate of the cathedral weighed five thousand pounds of silver. The entire spoil was computed at one million of pieces of gold, about four hundred thousand pounds sterling. And the captives must outnumber the seventeen thousand Christians, who were transported from the sack of Tauromenium into African servitude. In Sicily, the religion and language of the Greeks were eradicated, and such was the docility of the rising generation, that fifteen thousand boys were circumcised and clothed on the same day with the son of the Fatimite caliph. The Arabian squadrons issued from the harbors of Palermo, Biserta, and Tunis. A hundred and fifty towns of Calabria and Campania were attacked and pillaged, nor could the suburbs of Rome be defended by the name of the Caesars and Apostles. Had the Mohammedans been united, Italy must have fallen an easy and glorious accession to the empire of the Prophet. But the caliphs of Baghdad had lost their authority in the West. The Aglabites and Fatimites usurped the provinces of Africa. Their emirs of Sicily aspired to independence, and the design of conquest and dominion was degraded to a repetition of predatory inroads. In the sufferings of prostrate Italy, the name of Rome awakens a solemn and mournful recollection. A fleet of Saracens from the African coast presumed to enter the mouth of the Tiber, and to approach a city which even yet, in her fallen state, was revered as the metropolis of the Christian world. The gates and ramparts were guarded by a trembling people, but the tombs and temples of St. Peter and St. Paul were left exposed in the suburbs of the Vatican and of the Ostian Way. Their invisible sanctity had protected them against the Goths, the Vandals, and the Lombards, but the Arabs disdained both the gospel and the legend, and their rapacious spirit was approved and animated by the precepts of the Koran. The Christian idols were stripped of their costly offerings, a silver altar was torn away from the shrine of St. Peter, and if the bodies or the buildings were left entire, their deliverance must be imputed to the haste, rather than the scruples of the Saracens. In their course along the Appian Way, they pillaged Fundi and besieged Cayeta, but they had turned aside from the walls of Rome, and by their divisions the capital was saved from the yoke of the prophet of Mecca. The same danger still impended on the heads of the Roman people, and their domestic force was unequal to the assault of an African emir. They claimed the protection of their Latin sovereign, but the Carlovingian standard was overthrown by attachment of the barbarians. They meditated the restoration of the Greek emperors, but the attempt was treasonable, and the succor remote and precarious. Their distress appeared to receive some aggravation from the death of their spiritual and temporal chief, but the pressing emergency superseded the forms and intrigues of an election. And the unanimous choice of Pope Leo the Fourth was the safety of the church and city. This pontiff was born a Roman. The courage of the first ages of the Republic glowed in his breast, and, amidst the ruins of his country, he stood erect, like one of the firm and lofty columns that rear their heads above the fragments of the Roman Forum. The first days of his reign were consecrated to the purification and removal of relics, to prayers and processions, and to all the solemn offices of religion, which served at least to heal the imagination and restore the hopes of the multitude. The public defense had been long neglected, not from the presumption of peace, but from the distress and poverty of the times. As far as the scantiness of his means and the shortness of his leisure would allow, the ancient walls were repaired by the command of Leo. Fifteen towers in the most accessible stations were built or renewed. Two of these commanded on either side of the Tiber, 
and an iron chain was drawn across the stream to impede the ascent of a hostile navy. The Romans were assured of a short respite by the welcome news that the siege of Cayeta had been raised, and that a part of the enemy with their sacrilegious plunder had perished in the waves. But the storm, which had been delayed, soon burst upon them with redoubled violence. The Aglabite, who reigned in Africa, had inherited from his father a treasure and an army, a fleet of Arabs and Moors, after a short refreshment in the harbors of Sardinia, cast anchor before the mouth of the Tiber, sixteen miles from the city, and their discipline and numbers appeared to threaten, not a transient inroad, but a serious design of conquest and dominion. But the vigilance of Leo had formed an alliance with the vassals of the Greek Empire, the free and maritime states of Gaeta, Naples, and Amalfi, and in the hour of danger their galleys appeared in the port of Ostia, under the command of Caesarius, the son of the Neapolitan duke, a noble and valiant youth, who had already vanquished the fleets of the Saracens. With his principal companions, Caesarius was invited to the Lateran palace, and the dexterous pontiff affected to inquire their errand, and to accept with joy and surprise their providential succor. The city bands in arms attended their father to Ostia, where he reviewed and blessed his generous deliverers. They kissed his feet, received the communion with martial devotion, and listened to the prayer of Leo, that the same God who had supported St. Peter and St. Paul on the waves of the sea would strengthen the hands of his champions against the adversaries of his holy name. After a similar prayer, and with equal resolution, the Muslims advanced to the attack of the Christian galleys, which preserved their advantageous station along the coast. The victory inclined to the side of the allies, when it was less gloriously decided in their favor by a sudden tempest, which confounded the skill and courage of the stoutest mariners. The Christians were sheltered in a friendly harbor, while the Africans were scattered and dashed in pieces among the rocks and islands of a hostile shore. Those who escaped from shipwreck and hunger neither found nor deserved mercy at the hands of their implacable pursuers. The sword and the gibbet reduced the dangerous multitude of captives, and the remainder was more usefully employed to restore the sacred edifices which they had attempted to subvert. The pontiff, at the head of the citizens and allies, paid his grateful devotion at the shrines of the apostles, and, among the spoils of this naval victory, thirteen Arabian bows of pure and massy silver were suspended round the altar of the fishermen of Galilee. The reign of Leo IV was employed in the defense and ornament of the Roman state. The churches were renewed and embellished. Near four thousand pounds of silver were consecrated to repair the losses of St. Peter, and his sanctuary was decorated with a plate of gold of the weight of two hundred and sixteen pounds, embossed with the portraits of the Pope and Emperor, and encircled with a string of pearls. Yet this vain magnificence reflects less glory on the character of Leo than the paternal care with which he rebuilt the walls of Horta and Ameria, and transported the wandering inhabitants of Centum Cali to his new foundation of Leopolis, twelve miles from the seashore. By his liberality, a colony of Corsicans, with their wives and children, was planted in the station of Porto, at the mouth of the Tiber. The falling city was restored for their use. The fields and vineyards were divided among the new settlers. Their first efforts were assisted by a gift of horses and cattle. And the hardy exiles, who breathed revenge against the Saracens, swore to live and die under the standard of St. Peter. The nations of the West and North who visited the threshold of the Apostles had gradually formed the large and populous suburb of the Vatican, and their various habitations were distinguished, in the language of the times, as the schools of the Greeks and Goths, of the Lombards and Saxons. But this venerable spot was still open to sacrilegious insult. The design of enclosing it with walls and towers exhausted all that authority could command, or charity would supply. 
and the pious labor of four years was animated in every season and at every hour by the presence of the indefatigable pontiff. The love of fame, a generous but worldly passion, may be detected in the name of the Leonine city, which he bestowed on the Vatican. Yet the pride of the dedication was tempered with Christian penance and humility. The boundary was trod by the bishop and his clergy, barefoot, in sackcloth and ashes, the songs of triumph were modulated to psalms and litanies, the walls were besprinkled with holy water, and the ceremony was concluded with a prayer, that, under the guardian care of the apostles and the angelic host, both the old and the new Rome might ever be preserved pure, prosperous, and impregnable. The Emperor Theophilus, son of Michael the Stammerer, was one of the most active and high-spirited princes who reigned at Constantinople during the Middle Age. In offensive or defensive war, he marched in person five times against the Saracens, formidable in his attack, esteemed by the enemy in his losses and defeats. In the last of those expeditions, he penetrated into Syria and besieged the obscure town of Sosopetra, the casual birthplace of the Caliph Motassem, whose father Harun was attended in peace or war by the most favored of his wives and concubines. The revolt of a Persian impostor employed at that moment the arms of the Saracen, and he could only intercede in favor of a place for which he felt and acknowledged some degree of filial affection. These solicitations determined the emperor to wound his pride in so sensible a part. Susopetra was leveled with the ground. The Syrian prisoners were marked or mutilated with ignominious cruelty, and a thousand female captives were forced away from the adjacent territory. Among these a matron of the house of Abbas invoked, in an agony of despair, the name of Motassem, and the insults of the Greeks engaged the honor of her kinsman to avenge his indignity, and to answer her appeal. Under the reign of the two elder brothers, the inheritance of the youngest had been confined to Anatolia, Armenia, Georgia, and Circassia. This frontier station had exercised his military talents, and among his accidental claims to the name of Octonary, the most meritorious are the eight battles which he gained or fought against the enemies of the Koran. In this personal quarrel, the troops of Iraq, Syria, and Egypt were recruited from the tribes of Arabia and the Turkish hordes. His cavalry might be numerous, though we should deduct some myriads from the hundred and thirty thousand horses of the royal stables, and the expense of the armament was computed at four million sterling, or one hundred thousand pounds of gold. From Tarsus, the place of assembly, the Saracens advanced in three divisions along the high road of Constantinople. Motassem himself commanded the center, and the vanguard was given to his son Abbas, who, in the trial of the first adventurers, might succeed with the more glory, or fail with the least reproach. In the revenge of his injury, the caliph prepared to retaliate a similar affront. The father of Theophilus was a native of Amorium in Phrygia. The original seat of the imperial house had been adorned with privileges and monuments, and, whatever might be the indifference of the people, Constantinople itself was scarcely of more value in the eyes of the sovereign and his court. The name of Amorium was inscribed on the shields of the Saracens, and their three armies were again united under the walls of the devoted city. It had been proposed by the wisest councillors to evacuate Amorium, to remove the inhabitants and to abandon the empty structures to the vain resentment of the barbarians. The emperor embraced the more generous resolution of defending, in a siege and battle, the country of his ancestors. When the armies drew near, the front of the Mahometan line appeared to a Roman eye, more closely planted with spears and javelins. But the event of the action was not glorious on either side, to the national troops. The Arabs were broken, but it was by the swords of thirty thousand Persians, who had obtained service and settlement in the Byzantine Empire. The Greeks were repulsed and vanquished, 
and it was by the arrows of the Turkish cavalry, and had not their bowstrings been damped and relaxed by the evening rain, very few of the Christian could have escaped with the emperor from the field of the battle. They breathed at Doloim, at the distance of three days, and Theophilus, reviewing his trembling squadrons, forgave the common flight both of the prince and people. After this discovery of his weakness, he vainly hoped to deprecate the fate of Amorium. The inexorable caliph rejected with contempt his prayers and promises, and detained the Roman ambassadors to be the witnesses of his great revenge. They had nearly been the witnesses of his shame. The vigorous assaults of fifty-five days were encountered by a faithful governor, a veteran garrison, and a desperate people, and the Saracens must have raised the siege, if a domestic traitor had not pointed to the weakest part of the wall, a place which was decorated with the statues of a lion and a bull. The vow of Motosem was accomplished with unrelenting rigor. Tired, rather than satiated, with distraction, he returned to his new palace of Samara. In the neighborhood of Baghdad, while the unfortunate Theophilus implored the tardy and doubtful aid of his western rival, the Emperor of the Franks. Yet in the siege of Amorium, about 70,000 Moslems had perished. Their loss had been revenged by the slaughter of 30,000 Christians, and the sufferings of an equal number of captives, who were treated as the most atrocious criminals. Mutual necessity could sometimes extort the exchange or ransom of prisoners, but in the national and religious conflict of the two empires, peace was without confidence, and war without mercy. Quarter was seldom given in the field. Those who escaped the edge of the sword were condemned to hopeless servitude, or exquisite torture. And the Catholic emperor relates, with visible satisfaction, the execution of the Saracens of Crete, who were flayed alive or plunged into cauldrons of boiling oil. To a point of honor, Matassem had sacrificed a flourishing city, two hundred thousand lives, and the property of millions. The same caliph descended from his horse and dirtied his robe to relieve the distress of a decrepit old man who, with his laden ass, had tumbled into a ditch. On which of these actions did he reflect with the most pleasure when he was summoned by the angel of death? With Modasem, the eighth of the Abbasides, the glory of his family and nation expired. When the Arabian conquerors had spread themselves over the east and were mingled with the servile crowds of Persia, Syria, and Egypt, they incessantly lost the free-born and martial virtues of the desert. The courage of the south is the artificial fruit of discipline and prejudice. The active power of enthusiasm had decayed, and the mercenary forces of the caliphs were recruited in those climates of the north of which valor is the hardy and spontaneous production. Of the Turks who dwelt beyond the Oxus and Jahartis, the robust youths, either taken in war or purchased in trade, were educated in the exercises of the field and the profession of the Mahometan face. The Turkish guards stood in arms round the throne of their benefactor, and their chiefs usurped the dominion of the palace and the provinces. Matassem, the first author of this dangerous example, introduced into the capital above 50,000 Turks. Their licentious conduct provoked the public indignation, and the quarrels of the soldiers and people induced the caliph to retire from Baghdad, and establish his own residence and the camp of his barbarian favorites at Samara on the Tigris, about twelve leagues above the city of peace. His son Motavakal, was a jealous and cruel tyrant. Odious to his subjects, he cast himself on the fidelity of the strangers, and these strangers, ambitious and apprehensive, were tempted by the rich promise of a revolution. At the instigation, or at least in the cause of his son, they burst into his apartment at the hour of supper, and the caliph was cut into seven pieces by the same swords which he had recently distributed among the guards of his life and throne. To this throne, yet streaming with the father's blood, Montasseur was triumphantly led. But, in a reign of six months, he found only the pangs of a guilty conscience. 
if he wept at the sight of an old tapestry which represented the crime and punishment of the son of Cosroes, if his days were abridged by grief and remorse, we may allow some pity to a parricide, who exclaimed, in the bitterness of death, that he had lost both this world and the world to come. After this act of treason, the ensigns of royalty, the garment and walking staff of Mahomet, were given and torn away by the foreign mercenaries, who, in four years, created, deposed, and murdered three commanders of the faithful. As often as the Turks were inflamed by fear or rage or avarice, these caliphs were dragged by the feet, exposed naked to the scorching sun, beaten with iron clubs, and compelled to purchase, by the abdication of their dignity, a short reprieve of inevitable fate. At length, however, the fury of the tempest was spent or diverted. The Abbasides returned to the less turbulent residence of Baghdad. The insolence of the Turks was curbed with a firmer and more skilful hand, and their numbers were divided and destroyed in foreign warfare. But the nations of the East had been taught to trample on the successors of the Prophet, and the blessings of domestic peace were obtained by the relaxation of strength and discipline. So uniform are the mischiefs of military despotism, that I seem to repeat the story of the Praetorians of Rome. While the flame of enthusiasm was damped by the business, the pleasure, and the knowledge of the age, it burned with consecrated heat in the breasts of the chosen few, the congenial spirits who were ambitious of reigning either in this world or in the next. How carefully, soever, the book of prophecy had been sealed by the apostle of Mecca, the wishes and, if he may profane the word, even the reason, of fanaticism, might believe that, after the successive missions of Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and Mahomet, the same God, in the fullness of time, would reveal a still more perfect and permanent law. In the 277th year of the Hegira, and in the neighborhood of Kaffa, an Arabian preacher, of the name of Karmas, assumed the lofty and incomprehensible style of the guide, the director, the demonstration, the word, the Holy Ghost, the camel, the herald of the Messiah, who can converse with him in a human shape, and the representative of Mohammed, the son of Ali, of St. John the Baptist, and of the angel Gabriel. In his mystic volume, the percepts of the Koran were refined to a more spiritual sense. He relaxed the duties of ablution, fasting, and pilgrimage, allowed the indiscriminate use of wine and forbidden food, and nourished the fervor of his disciples by the daily repetition of fifty prayers. The idleness and ferment of the rustic crowd awakened the attention of the magistrates of Kaffa. A timid persecution assisted the progress of the new sect, and, the name of the prophet became more revered after his person had been withdrawn from the world. His twelve apostles dispersed themselves among the Bedouins, a race of men, says Abu Feda, equally devoid of reason and of religion. And the success of their preaching seemed to threaten Arabia with a new revolution. The Karamessians were ripe for rebellion, since they disclaimed the title of the house of Abbas, and abhorred the worldly pomp of the caliphs of Baghdad. They were susceptible of discipline, since they vowed a blind and absolute submission to their imam, who was called to the prophetic office by the voice of God and the people. Instead of the legal ties, he claimed the fifth of their substance and spoil. The most flagitious sins were no more than the type of disobedience, and the brethren were united and concealed by an oath of secrecy. After a bloody conflict, they prevailed in the province of Bahrain, along the Persian Gulf. Far and wide, the tribes of the desert were subject to the scepter, or rather to the sword of Abu Sa'id and his son Abu Taher. And these rebellious imams could muster in the field a hundred and seven thousand fanatics. The mercenaries of the caliph were dismayed at the approach of an enemy, who neither asked nor accepted quarter, and the difference between them in fortitude and patience is expressive of the change with three centuries of prosperity had effected in the character of the Arabians. 
Such troops were discomfited in every action. The cities of Raqqa and Baalbek, of Kaffa and Bassora, were taken and pillaged. Baghdad was filled with consternation, and the caliph trembled behind the veils of his palace. In a daring inroad beyond the Tigris, Abu Taher advanced to the gates of the capital with no more than five hundred horse. By the special order of Mokhtadeh, the bridges had been broken down, and the person or head of the rebel was expected every hour by the commander of the faithful. His lieutenant, from a motive of fear or pity, apprised Abu Taher of his danger, and recommended a speedy escape. "'Your master,' said the intrepid Carmassian to the messenger, "'is at the head of thirty thousand soldiers. Three such men as these are wanting in his host.' At the same instant, turning to three of his companions, he commanded the first to plunge a dagger into his breast, the second to leap into the tigris, and the third to cast himself headlong down a precipice. They obeyed without a murmur. Relate, continued the imam, what you have seen. Before the evening your general shall be chained among my dogs. Before the evening the camp was surprised and the menace was executed. The rapine of the Carmathians was sanctified by their aversion to the worship of Mecca. They robbed a caravan of pilgrims, and twenty thousand devout Moslems were abandoned on the burning sands to the death of hunger and thirst. Another year they suffered the pilgrims to proceed without interruption. But in the festival of devotion, Abu Taher stormed the holy city and trampled on the most venerable relics of the Mohammedan faith. Thirty thousand citizens and strangers were put to the sword. The sacred precincts were polluted by the burial of three thousand dead bodies. The well of them them over flooded with blood. The golden spout was forced from its place. The veil of the Kaaba was divided among these impious sectaries. And the black stone, the first monument of the nation, was borne away in triumph to their capital. After this deed of sacrilege and cruelty, they continued to infest the confines of Iraq, Syria, and Egypt. But the vital principle of enthusiasm had withered at the root. Their scruples, or their avarice, again opened the pilgrimage of Mecca, and restored the black stone of the Kaaba. And it is needless to inquire into what factions they were broken, or by whose sword they were finally extirpated. The sect of the Carmathians may be considered as a second visible cause of the decline and fall of the empire of the caliphs. The third and most obvious cause was the weight and magnitude of the empire itself. The caliph al-Mamun might proudly assert that it was easier for him to rule the east and the west than to manage a chessboard of two feet square. Yet I suspect that in both those games he was guilty of many fatal mistakes. And I perceive that in the distant provinces the authority of the first and most powerful of the Abbasides was already impaired. The analogy of despotism invests the representative with the full majesty of the prince. The division and balance of powers might relax the habits of obedience, might encourage the passive subject to inquire into the origin and administration of civil government. He who is born in the purple is seldom worthy to reign, but the elevation of a private man, of a peasant, perhaps, or a slave, affords a strong presumption of his courage and capacity. The viceroy of the remote kingdom aspires to secure the property and inheritance of his precarious trust. The nations must rejoice in the presence of their sovereign, and the command of armies and treasures are at once the object and the instrument of his ambition. A change was scarcely visible as long as the lieutenants of the caliph were content with their vicarious title, while they solicited for themselves or their sons a renewal of the imperial grant, and still maintained on the coin and in public prayers the name and prerogative of the commander of the faithful. But in the long and hereditary exercise of power, they assumed the pride and attributes of royalty, the alternative of peace or war, of reward and punishment, depended solely on their will, and the revenues of their government were reserved for local services or private magnificence. 
instead of a regular supply of men and money, the successors of the prophet were flattered with the ostentatious gift of an elephant, or a cast of hawks, a suit of silk hangings, or some pounds of musk and amber. After the revolt of Spain from the temporal and spiritual supremacy of the Abbasides, the first symptoms of disobedience broke forth in the province of Africa. Ibrahim, the son of Aglab, the lieutenant of the vigilant and rigid Harun, bequeathed to the dynasty of Aglabites the inheritance of his name and power. The indolence or policy of the caliphs dissembled the injury and loss, and pursued only with poison the founder of the Idrisites, who erected the kingdom and city of Fez on the shores of the western ocean. In the east, the first dynasty was that of the Tahirites, the posterity of the valiant Taha, who, in the civil wars of the sons of Harun, had served with too much zeal and success the cause of Almamon, the younger brother. He was sent into honorable exile to command on the banks of the Oxus, and the independence of his successors, who reigned in Khorasan till the fourth generation, was palliated by their modest and respectful demeanor, the happiness of their subjects and the security of their frontier. They were supplanted by one of those adventurers so frequent in the annals of the East, who left his trade of a brazier, from whence the name of Sophorides, for the profession of a robber. In a nocturnal visit to the treasure of the prince of Sistan, Jacob, the son of Lais, stumbled over a lump of salt, which he unwarily tasted with his tongue. Salt, among the Orientals, is the symbol of hospitality, and the pious robber immediately retired without spoil or damage. The discovery of this honorable behavior recommended Jacob pardon and trust. He led an army at first for his benefactor, at last for himself, subdued Persia, and threatened the residence of the Abbasides. On his march towards Baghdad, the conqueror was arrested by a fever. He gave audience in bed to the ambassador of the caliph, and beside him on a table were exposed a naked scimitar, a crust of brown bread, and a bunch of onions. If I die, said he, your master is delivered from his fears. If I live, this must determine between us. If I am vanquished, I can return without reluctance to the homely fare of my youth. From the haze where he stood, the descent would not have been so soft or harmless, a timely death secured his own repose and that of the caliph, who paid with the most lavish concessions the retreat of his brother Amro to the palaces of Shiraz and Ispahan. The Abbasides were too feeble to contend, too proud to forgive. They invited the powerful dynasty of the Samanides, who passed the Oxus with ten thousand horse so poor that their stirrups were of wood, so brave that they vanquished the Sofarian army eight times more numerous than their own. The captive Amro was sent in chains, a grateful offering to the court of Baghdad, and as the victor was content with the inheritance of Transoxiana and Khorasan, the realms of Persia returned for a while to the allegiance of the caliphs. The provinces of Syria and Egypt were twice dismembered by the Turkish slaves of the race of Tolon and Ilkshid, these barbarians, in religion and manners the countrymen of Mahomet, emerged from the bloody factions of the palace to a provincial command and an independent throne. Their names became famous and formidable in their time. But the founders of these two potent dynasties confessed, either in words or actions, the vanity of ambition. The first on his deathbed implored the mercy of God to a sinner, ignorant of the limits of his own power. The second, in the midst of four hundred thousand soldiers and eight thousand slaves, concealed from every human eye the chamber where he attempted to sleep. Their sons were educated in the vices of kings, and both Egypt and Syria were recovered and possessed by the Abbasides during an interval of thirty years. In the decline of the empire, Mesopotamia, with the important cities of Mosul and Aleppo, was occupied by the Arabian princes of the tribe of Hamadan. The poets of their court could repeat without a blush that nature had formed their countenances for beauty, 
their tongues for eloquence, and their hands for liberality and valor. But the genuine tale of the elevation and reign of the Hamadanites exhibits a scene of treachery, murder, and parricide. At the same fatal period, the Persian kingdom was again usurped by the dynasty of the Bovides, by the sword of three brothers, who, under various names, were styled the support and columns of the state, and who, from the Caspian Sea to the ocean, would suffer no tyrants but themselves. Under their reign, the language and genius of Persia revived, and the Arabs, three hundred and four years after the death of Mohammed, were deprived of the sceptre of the east. Rahadi, the twenties of the Abbasides, and the thirty-ninth of the successors of Mohammed, was the last who deserved the title of commander of the faithful. The last, says Abu Feda, who spoke to the people, or conversed with the learned, the last who, in the expense of his household, represented the wealth and magnificence of the ancient caliphs. After him, the lords of the eastern world were reduced to the most abject misery, and exposed to the blows and insults of a servile condition. The revolt of the provinces circumscribed their dominions within the walls of Baghdad, but that capital still contained an innumerable multitude, vain of their past fortune, discontented with their present state, and oppressed by the demands of a treasury which had formerly been replenished by the spoil and tribute of nations. Their idleness was exercised by faction and controversy. Under the mask of piety, the rigid followers of Hanbal invaded the pleasures of domestic life, burst into the houses of plebeians and princes. The vine broke the instruments, beat the musicians, and dishonored, with infamous suspicions, the associates of every handsome youth. In each profession, which allowed room for two persons, the one was a votary, the other an antagonist, of Ali, and the Abbasides were awakened by the clamorous grief of the sectaries, who denied their title and cursed their progenitors. A turbulent people could only be repressed by a military force, but who could satisfy the avarice or assert the discipline of the mercenaries themselves? The African and the Turkish guards drew their swords against each other, and the chief commanders, the emirs al Omra imprisoned or deposed their sovereigns, and violated the sanctuary of the mosque and harem. If the caliphs escaped to the camp or court of any neighboring prince, their deliverance was a change of servitude, till they were prompted by despair to invite the Bovids, the sultans of Persia, who silenced the factions of Baghdad by their irresistible arms. The civil and military powers were assumed by Moez al the second of the three brothers, and a stipend of sixty thousand pounds sterling was assigned by his generosity for the private expense of the commander of the faithful. But on the fortieth day, at the audience of the ambassadors of Khorasan, and in the presence of a trembling multitude, the caliph was dragged from his throne to a dungeon, by the command of the stranger and the rude hands of his delimates. His palace was pillaged, his eyes were put out, and the mean ambition of the Abbasides aspired to the vacant station of danger and disgrace. In the school of adversity, the luxurious caliphs resumed the grave and abstemious virtues of the primitive times. Despoiled by their armor and silken robes, they fasted, they prayed, they studied the Koran and the tradition of the Sunnites. They performed, with zeal and knowledge, the functions of their ecclesiastical character. The respect of nations still waited on the successors of the apostle, the oracles of the law and conscience of the faithful, and the weakness or division of their tyrants sometimes restored the Abbasides to the sovereignty of Baghdad. But their misfortunes had been embittered by the triumph of the Fatimites, the real or spurious progeny of Ali. Arising from the extremity of Africa, these successful rivals extinguished, in Egypt and Syria, both the spiritual and temporal authority of the Abbasides, and the monarch of the Nile insulted the humble pontiff on the banks of the Tigris. In the declining age of the caliphs, in the century which elapsed after the war of Theophilus and Motosem, the hostile transactions of the two nations were confined to some inroads by sea and land 
the fruits of their close vicinity and indelible hatred. But when the eastern world was convulsed and broken, the Greeks were roused from their lethargy by the hopes of conquest and revenge. The Byzantine Empire, since the accession of the Basilian race, had reposed in peace and dignity, and they might encounter with their entire strength the front of some petty emir, whose rear was as assaulted and threatened by his national foes of the Mahometan faith. The lofty titles of the Morning Star and the death of the Saracens were applied in the public acclamations to Nicephorus Phocas, a prince as renowned in the camp as he was unpopular in the city, in the subordinate station of great domestic, or general of the East. He reduced the island of Crete and extirpated the nest of pirates who had so long defied, with impunity, the majesty of the empire. His military genius was displayed in the conduct and success of the enterprise, which had so often failed with loss and dishonor. The Saracens were confounded by the landing of his troops on safe and level bridges, which he cast from the vessels to the shore. Seven months were consumed in the siege of Candia. The despair of the native Cretans were stimulated by the frequent aid of their brethren of Africa and Spain, and after the massive wall and double ditch had been stormed by the Greeks, a hopeless conflict was still maintained in the streets and houses of the city. The whole island was subdued in the capital, and a submissive people accepted, without resistance, the baptism of the conqueror. Constantinople applauded the long-forgotten pomp of a triumph, but the imperial diadem was the sole reward that could repay the services or satisfy the ambition of Nicephorus. After the death of the younger Romanus, the fourth in lineal descent of the Basilian race, his widow, Theophania, successively married Nicephorus Phocas and his assassin, John Tzimiskes, the two heroes of the age. They reigned as the guardians and colleagues of her infant sons, and the twelve years of their military command form the most splendid period of the Byzantine annals. The subjects and confederates whom they led to war appeared, at least in the eyes of an enemy, two hundred thousand strong, and of these about thirty thousand were armed with cuirasses. A train of four thousand mules attended their march, and their evening camp was regularly fortified with an enclosure of iron spikes. A series of bloody and undecisive combats is nothing more than an anticipation of what would have been effected in a few years by the course of nature. But I shall briefly prosecute the conquests of the two emperors from the hills of Cappadocia to the desert of Baghdad. The sieges of Mopsuestia and Tarsus in Kilikia first exercised the skill and perseverance of their troops, on whom, at this moment, I shall not hesitate to bestow the name of Romans. In the double city of Mopsuestia, which is divided by the river Sarus, two hundred thousand Moslems were predestined to death or slavery, a surprising degree of population, which must at least include the inhabitants of the dependent districts. They were surrounded and taken by assault, but Tarsus was reduced by the slow progress of famine, and no sooner had the Saracens yielded on honorable terms that they were mortified by the distant and unprofitable view of the naval succors of Egypt. They were dismissed with a safe conduct to the confines of Syria. A part of the old Christians had quietly lived under their dominion, and the vacant habitations were replenished by a new colony. But the mosque was converted into a stable, the pulpit was delivered to the flames, many rich crosses of gold and gems, the spoils of Asiatic churches, were made a grateful offering to the piety or avarice of the emperor, and he transported the gates of Mopsuestia and Tarsus, which were fixed in the walls of Constantinople, an eternal monument of his victory. After they had forced and secured the narrow passes of Mount Amanus, the two Roman princes repeatedly carried their arms into the heart of Syria. Yet, instead of assaulting the walls of Antioch, the humanity or superstition of Nicephorus appeared to respect the ancient metropolis of the east. He contented himself with drawing round the city a line of circumvallation, left a stationary army, and instructed his lieutenant to expect, without impatience, the return of spring. But in the depths of winter, in a dark and rainy night, an adventurous subaltern, 
with three hundred soldiers, approached the rampart, applied his scaling ladders, occupied two adjacent towers, stood firm against the pressure of multitudes, and bravely maintained his post, till he was relieved by the tardy, so effectual, support of his reluctant chief. The first tumult of slaughter and rapine subsided. The reign of Caesar and of Christ was restored, and the efforts of a hundred thousand Saracens, of the armies of Syria and the fleets of Africa, were consumed without effect before the walls of Antioch. The royal city of Aleppo was subject to Saifat Dovlat, of the dynasty of Hamadan, who clouded his past glory by the precipitate retreat, which abandoned his kingdom and capital to the Roman invaders. In his stately palace that stood without the walls of Aleppo, they joyfully seized a well-furnished magazine of arms, a stable of fourteen hundred mules, and three hundred bags of silver and gold. But the walls of the city withstood the strokes of their battering rams, and the besiegers pitched their tents on the neighboring mountain of Jaushan. Their retreat exasperated the quarrel of the townsmen and mercenaries. The guard of the gates and ramparts was deserted, and while they furiously charged each other in the marketplace, they were surprised and destroyed by the sword of a common enemy. The male sex was exterminated by the sword. Ten thousand youths were led into captivity. The weight of the precious spoil exceeded the strength and number of the beasts of burden. The superfluous remainder was burnt, and, after a licentious possession of ten days, the Romans marched away from the naked and bleeding city. In their Syrian inroad they commanded the husbandsmen to cultivate their lands, that they themselves, in the ensuing season, might reap the benefit. More than a hundred cities were reduced to obedience and eighteen pulpits of the principal mosques were committed to the flames to expiate the sacrilege of the disciples of Mohammed. The classic names of Hierapolis, Apamea, and Emesa revive for a moment in the list of conquest. The emperor Timiscus encamped in the paradise of Damascus and accepted the ransom of a submissive people. And the torrent was only stopped by the impregnable fortress of Tripoli on the sea coast of Nicaea. Since the days of Heraclius, the Euphrates, below the passage of Mount Taurus, had been impervious and almost invisible to the Greeks. The river yielded a free passage to the victorious Simiscus, and the historian may imitate the speed with which he overran the once famous cities of Samosata, Edessa, Martyropolis, Amida, and Nisibis, the ancient limit of the empire in the neighborhood of the Tigris. His ardor was quickened by the desire of grasping the virgin treasures of Ekpatana, a well-known name under which the Byzantine writer has concealed the capital of the Abbasides. The consternation of the fugitives had already diffused the terror of his name, but the fancied riches of Baghdad had already been dissipated by the avarice and prodigality of domestic tyrants. The prayers of the people and the stern demands of the lieutenant of the Bovids required the caliph to provide for the defense of the city. The helpless Mosi replied that his arms, his revenues, and his provinces had been torn from his hands, and that he was ready to abdicate a dignity which he was unable to support. The emir was inexorable, the furniture of the palace was sold, and the paltry price of forty thousand pieces of gold was instantly consumed in private luxury. But the apprehensions of Baghdad were relieved by the retreat of the Greeks. Thirst and hunger guarded the desert of Mesopotamia, and the emperor, satiated with glory and laden with oriental spoils, returned to Constantinople, and displayed in his triumph the silk, the aromatics, and three hundred myriads of gold and silver. Yet the powers of the East had been bent, not broken, by this transient hurricane. After the departure of the Greeks, the fugitive princes returned to their capitals. The subjects disclaimed their involuntary oaths of allegiance. The Moslems again purified their temples, and overturned the idols of the saints and martyrs. The Nestorians and Jacobites preferred the Saracen to an orthodox master. And the numbers and spirit of the Melchites were inadequate to the support of the church and state. Of these extensive conquests, Antioch, with the cities of Cilicia and the Isle of Cyprus, was alone restored, a permanent and useful accession to the Roman Empire. 
fate of the Eastern Empire in the tenth century, extent and division, wealth and revenue, palace of Constantinople, titles and offices, pride and power of the emperors, tactics of the Greeks, Arabs, and Franks, loss of the Latin tongue, studies and solitude of the Greeks. A ray of historic light seems to beam from the darkness of the tenth century. We open with curiosity and respect the royal volumes of Constantine Porphyrogenitus, which he composed at a mature age for the instruction of his son, and which promised to unfold the state of the Eastern Empire, both in peace and war, both at home and abroad. In the first of these works, he minutely describes the pompous ceremonies of the church and palace of Constantinople, according to his own practice and that of his predecessors. In the second, he attempts an accurate survey of the provinces, the themes, as they were denominated, both of Europe and Asia, the system of Roman tactics, the discipline and order of the troops, and the military operations by land and sea. Are explained in the third of these didactic collections, which may be ascribed to Constantine or his father Leo. In the fourth of the administration of the empire, he reveals the secrets of the Byzantine policy, in friendly or hostile intercourse with the nations of the earth. The literary labors of the age, the practical systems of law, agriculture, and history, might redound to the benefit of the subject and the honor of the Macedonian princes. The sixty books of the Basilics, the Code and Pandex of Civil Jurisprudence, were gradually framed in the three first regions of that prosperous dynasty. The art of agriculture had amused the leisure and exercised the pens of the best and wisest of the ancients, and their chosen precepts are comprised in the twenty books on the geoponics of Constantine. At his command. The historical examples of vice and virtue were methodized in fifty-three books, and every citizen might apply to his contemporaries or to himself the lesson or the warning of past times. From the august character of a legislator, the sovereign of the East descends to the more humble office of a teacher and a scribe. And if his successors and subjects were regardless of his paternal cares, we may inherit and enjoy the everlasting legacy. A closer survey will indeed reduce the value of the gift and the gratitude of posterity. In the possession of these imperial treasures, we may still deplore our poverty and ignorance, and the fading glories of their authors will be obliterated by indifference or contempt. The basilics will sink to a broken copy, a partial and mutilated version in the Greek language of the laws of Justinian. But the sense of the old civilians is often superseded by the influence of bigotry, and the absolute prohibition of divorce, concubinage, and interest for money enslaves the freedom of trade and the happiness of private life. In the historical book, a subject of Constantine might admire the inimitable virtues of Greece and Rome. He might learn to what a pitch of energy and elevation the human character had formerly aspired. But a contrary effect must have been produced by a new edition of the lives of the saints, which the great logothete or chancellor of the empire was directed to prepare, and the dark fund of superstition was enriched by the fabulous and florid legends of Simon the Metaphrast. The merits and miracles of the whole calendar are of less account in the eye of a sage than the toil of a single husbandman, who multiplies the gifts of the Creator. And supplies the food of his brethren. Yet the royal authors of the Geoponics were more seriously employed in expounding the precepts of the destroying art, which had been taught since the days of Xenophon as the art of heroes and kings. But the tactics of Leo and Constantine are mingled with the baser alloy of the age in which they lived. It was destitute of original genius. They implicitly transcribed the rules and maxims which had been confirmed by victories. It was unskilled in the property of style and method. They blindly confounded the most distant and discordant institutions. The phalanx of Sparta and that of Macedon, the legions of Cato and Trajan, of Augustus and Theodosius. Even the use, or at least the importance, of these military rudiments may be fairly questioned. 
their general theory is dictated by reason. But the merit, as well as difficulty, consists in the application. The discipline of a soldier is formed by exercise rather than by study. The talents of a commander are appropriated to those calm, though rapid, minds, which nature produces to decide the fate of armies and nations. The former is the habit of a life, the latter the glance of a moment, and the battles won by lessons of tactics may be numbered with the epic poems created for the rules of criticism. The Book of Ceremonies is a recital, tedious yet imperfect, of the despicable pageantry which had infected the church and state since the gradual decay of the purity of the one and the power of the other. A review of the themes or provinces might promise such authentic and useful information, as the curiosity of government only can obtain, instead of traditionary fables on the origin of the cities, and malicious epigrams on the vices of their inhabitants. Such information the historian would have been pleased to record. Nor should his silence be condemned, if the most interesting objects, the population of the capital and provinces, the amount of the taxes and revenues, the numbers of subjects and strangers who served under the imperial standard, have been unnoticed by Leo the philosopher and his son Constantine. His treatise of the public administration is strained with the same blemishes, yet it is discriminated by peculiar merit. The antiquities of the nations may be doubtful or fabulous, but the geography and manners of the barbaric world are delineated with curious accuracy. Of these nations, the Franks alone were qualified to observe in their turn, and to describe, the metropolis of the East. The ambassador of the great Otho, a bishop of Cremona, has painted the state of Constantinople about the middle of the tenth century. His style is glowing, his narrative lively, his observations keen and even the prejudices and passions of Litprand are stamped with an original character of freedom and genius. From this scanty fund of foreign and domestic materials, I shall investigate the form and substance of the Byzantine Empire, the provinces and wealth, the civil government and military force, the character and literature of the Greeks in a period of six hundred years. From the reign of Heraclius, to his successful invasion of the Franks or Latins. After the final division between the sons of Theodosius, the swarms of barbarians from Scythia and Germany overspread the provinces and extinguished the empire of ancient Rome. The weakness of Constantinople was concealed by extent of dominion. Her limits were inviolate, or at least entire and the kingdom of Justinian was enlarged by the splendid acquisition of Africa and Italy. But the possession of these new conquests were transient and precarious, and almost a moiety of the Eastern Empire was torn away by the arms of the Saracens. Syria and Egypt were oppressed by the Arabian Caliphs, and, after the reduction of Africa, their lieutenants invaded and subdued the Roman province, which had been changed into the Gothic monarchy of Spain. The islands of the Mediterranean were not inaccessible to their naval powers, and it was from their extreme stations, the harbours of Crete and the fortress of Sicilia, that the faithful or rebel emirs insulted the majesty of the throne and capital. The remaining provinces, under the obedience of the emperors, were cast into a new mould, and the jurisdiction of the presidents, the consulars, and the counts was superseded by the institution of the themes or military governments which prevailed under the successors of Heraclius, and are described by the pen of the royal author. Of the twenty-nine themes, twelve in Europe and seventeen in Asia, the origin is obscure, the etymology doubtful or capricious, the limits were arbitrary and fluctuating, but some particular names, that sound the most strangely to Aria, were derived from the character and attributes of the troops that were maintained at the expense, and for the guard, of the respective divisions. The vanity of the Greek princes most eagerly grasped the shadow of conquest and the memory of lost dominion. A new Mesopotamia was created on the western side of the Euphrates. 
the appellation and praetor of Sicily were transferred to a narrow slip of Calibria, and a fragment of the duchy of Beneventum was promoted to the style and title of the theme of Lombardy. In the decline of the Arabian Empire, the successors of Constantine might not indulge their pride in more solid advantages. The victories of Nicephorus, John Zimaces, and Basil the Second revived the fame and enlarged the boundaries of the Roman name. The province of Cilicia, the islands of Crete and Cyprus, were restored to the allegiance of Christ and Caesar. One third of Italy was annexed to the throne of Constantinople. The kingdom of Bulgaria was destroyed, and the last sovereigns of the Macedonian dynasty extended their sway from the sources of the Tigris to their neighbourhood of Rome. In the eleventh century, the prospect was again clouded by new enemies and new misfortunes. The relics of Italy were swept away by the Norman adventurers, and almost all the Asiatic branches were dissevered from the Roman trunk by the Turkish conquerors. After these losses, the emperors of the Comemnian family continued to reign from the Danube to Peloponnesus, and from Belgrade to Nice, Tresbond, and the winding stream of the Meander. The spacious provinces of Thrace, Macedonia, and Greece were obedient to their sceptre. The possession of Cyprus, Rhodes, and Crete was accompanied by the fifty islands of the Aegean or a holy sea and the remnant of their empire transcends the measure of the largest of the European kingdoms. The same princes might assert, with dignity and truth, that of all the monarchs of Christendom, they possess the greatest city, the most ample revenue, the most flourishing and populous state. With the decline and fall of the empire, the cities of the west had decayed and fallen. Nor could the ruins of Rome, all the mud walls, wooden hovels, and narrow precincts of Paris and London, prepare the Latin stranger to contemplate the situation and extent of Constantinople, her stately palaces and churches, and the arts and luxury of an innumerable people. Her treasures might attract, but her virgin strength had repelled, and still promised to repel, the audacious invasion of the Persian and Bulgarian, the Arab and the Russian. The provinces were less fortunate and impregnable, and few districts, few cities, could be discovered which had not been violated by some fierce barbarian, impatient to despoil, because he was hopeless to possess. From the age of Justinian, the Eastern Empire was sinking below its former level. The powers of destruction were more active than those of improvement, and the calamities of war were embittered, by the more permanent evils of civil and ecclesiastical tyranny. The captive who had escaped from the barbarians was often stripped and imprisoned by the ministers of his sovereign. The Greek superstition relaxed the mind by prayer, and emaciated the body by fasting. And the multitude of convents and festivals diverted many hands and many days from the temporal service of mankind. Yet the subjects of the Byzantine Empire were still the most dexterous and diligent of nations. Their country was blessed by nature with every advantage of soil, climate, and situation. And, in the support and restoration of the arts, their patient and peaceful temper was more useful than the warlike spirit and feudal anarchy of Europe. The provinces that still adhered to the empire were repeopled, and enriched by the misfortunes of those which were irrevocably lost. From the yoke of the caliphs, the Catholics of Syria, Egypt, and Africa retired to the allegiance of their prince, to the society of their brethren. The movable wealth, which eludes the search of oppression, accompanied and alleviated their exile, and Constantinople received into her bosom the fugitive trade of Alexandria and Tyre. The chiefs of Armenia and Scythia, who fled from hostile or religious persecution, were hospitably entertained. Their followers were encouraged to build new cities, and to cultivate wastelands, and many spots, both in Europe and Asia, preserved the name, the manners, or at least the memory, of these national colonies. Even the tribes of barbarians, 
who had seated themselves in arms on the territory of the empire, were gradually reclaimed to the laws of the church and state. And as long as they were separated from the Greeks, their posterity supplied a race of faithful and obedient soldiers. Did we possess sufficient materials to survey the twenty-nine themes of the Byzantine monarchy, our curiosity might be satisfied with a chosen example. It is fortunate enough that the clearest light should be thrown on the most interesting province, and the name of Peloponnesus will awaken the attention of the classic reader. As early as the eighth century, in the troubled reign of the iconoclasts, Greece, and even Peloponnesus, were overrun by some Sclavonian bands, who outstripped the royal standard of Bulgaria. The strangers of old, Cadmus, and Danaeus, and Pelops, had planted in that fruitful soil the seeds of policy and learning. But the savages of the north eradicated what yet remained of their sickly and withered roots. In this eruption, the country and the inhabitants were transformed, the Grecian blood was contaminated, and the proudest nobles of Peloponnesus were branded with the names of foreigners and slaves. By the diligence of succeeding princes, the land was in some measure purified from the barbarians, and the humble remnant was bound by an oath of obedience, tribute, and military service, which they often renewed and often violated. The siege of Patras was formed by a singular occurrence of the Sclavonians of Peloponnesus, and the Saracens of Africa. In their latest distress, a pious fiction of the approach of the Praetor of Corinth revived the courage of the citizens. Their sally was bold and successful. The strangers embarked, the rebels submitted, and the glory of the day was ascribed to a phantom or a stranger, who fought in the foremost ranks under the character of St. Andrew the Apostle. The shrine, which contained his relics, was decorated with the trophies of victory, and the captive race was forever devoted to the service and vassalage of the metropolitan church of Patras. By the revolt of the two Sclovian tribes, in the neighbourhood of Helos and Lacedaemon, the peace of the peninsula was often disturbed. They sometimes insulted the weakness, and sometimes resisted the oppression of the Byzantine government, till at length, the approach of their hostile brethren, exhorted a golden bull to define the rights and obligations of the Ezerites, Ezerites, of the Ezerites and Melengi, whose annual tribute was defined at twelve hundred pieces of gold. From these strangers, the imperial geographer has accurately distinguished a domestic and perhaps original race, who, in some degree, might derive their blood from the much-injured helots. The liberty of the Romans, and especially of Augustus, had enfranchised the maritime cities from the dominion of Sparta, and the continuance of the same benefit ennobled them with the title of Eletheroe, of free Laconians. In the time of Constantine Porphyrogenitus, they had acquired the name of Minotis, under which they dishonoured the claim of liberty by the inhuman pillage of all that is shipwrecked on their rocky shores. Their territory, barren of corn, but fruitful of olives, extended to the Cape of Malia. They accepted a chief or prince from the Byzantine Praetor, and a light tribute of four hundred pieces of gold was the badge of their immunity, rather than of their dependence. The freemen of Laconia assumed the character of Romans, and long adhered to the religion of the Greeks. By the zeal of the Emperor Basil, they were baptized in the faith of Christ. But the altars of Venus and Neptune had been crowned by these rustic votaries five hundred years after they were prescribed in the Roman world. In the theme of Peloponnesus, forty cities were still numbered, and the declining state of Sparta, Argos, and Corinth may be suspended in the tenth century at an equal distance, perhaps, between their antique splendour and their present desolation. The duty of military service, either in person or by substitute, was imposed on the lands or benefices of the province, 
a sum of five pieces of gold was assessed on each of the substantial tenants. And the same capitation was shared among several heads of inferior value. On the proclamation of an Italian war, the Peloponnesians excused themselves by a voluntary oblation of one hundred pounds of gold, four thousand pounds sterling, and a thousand horses with their arms and trappings. The churches and monasteries furnished their contingent. A sacrilegious profit was exhorted from the sale of ecclesiastical honours. And the indignant Bishop of Lucada was made responsible for a pension of one hundred pieces of gold. But the wealth of the province and the trust of the revenue were founded on the fair and plentiful produce of trade and manufacturers, and some symptoms of liberal policy may be traced in a law which exempts from all personal taxes the mariners of Peloponnesus and the workmen in parchment and purple. This denomination may be fairly applied or extended to the manufacturers of linen, woollen, and more especially of silk. The two former of which had flourished in Greece since the days of Homer, and the last was introduced perhaps as early as the reign of Justinian. These arts, which were exercised at Corinth, Thebes, and Argos, afforded food and occupation to a numerous people. The men, women, and children were distributed according to their age and strength, and if many of these were domestic slaves, their masters, who directed the work and enjoyed the profit. were of a free and honourable condition. The gifts which a rich and generous matron of Peloponnesus presented to the Emperor Basil, her adopted son, were doubtless fabricated in the Grecian looms. Danielis bestowed a carpet of fine wool, of a pattern which imitated the spots of a peacock's tail, of a magnitude to overspread the floor of a new church erected in the triple name of Christ, of Michael the Archangel. And of the prophet Elijah. She gave six hundred pieces of silk and linen, of various use and denomination. The silk was painted with the Tyrian dye, and adorned by the labors of the needle, and the linen was so exquisitely fine that an entire piece might be rolled in the hollow of a cane. In his description of the Greek manufacturers, an historian of Sicily discriminates their price. According to the weight and quality of the silk, the closeness of the texture, the beauty of the colors, and the taste and materials of the embroidery, a single or even a double or treble thread was thought sufficient for ordinary sale. But the union of six threads composed a piece of stronger and more costly worksmanship. Among the colors, he celebrates, with affectation of eloquence, the fiery blaze of scarlet. And the softer lustre of the green. The embroidery was raised either in silk or gold. The more simple ornament of stripes or circles was surpassed by the nice imitation of flowers. The vestments that were fabricated for the palace or for the altar often glittered with precious stones. And the figures were delineated in strings of oriental pearls. Till the twelfth century, Greece alone, of all the countries of Christendom. Was possessed of the instinct who is taught by nature, and of the workmen who are instructed by art to prepare this elegant luxury. But the secret had been stolen by the dexterity and diligence of the Arabs. The caliphs of the East and West scorned to borrow from the unbelievers their furniture and apparel. And two cities of Spain, Almeria and Lisbon, were famous for the manufacture, the use, and perhaps the exportation of silk. It was first introduced into Sicily by the Normans, and this emigration of trade distinguishes the victory of Roger from the uniform and fruitless hostilities of every age. After the sack of Corinth, Athens, and Thebes, his lieutenant embarked with a captive train of weavers and artificers of both sexes, a trophy glorious to their master and disgraceful to the Greek emperor. The king of Sicily was not insensible of the value of the present. And in the restitution of the prisoners, he accepted only the male and female manufacturers of Thebes and Corinth, who labor, says the Byzantine historian, under a barbarous lord, like the old Eretrians in the service of Darius. 
a stately edifice. In the palace of Palamo was erected for the use of this industrious colony, and the art was propagated by their children and disciples to satisfy the increasing demand of the Western world. The decay of the looms of Sicily may be ascribed to the troubles of the island and the competition of the Italian cities. In the year 1314, Lucca alone, among her sister republics, enjoyed the lucrative monopoly. A domestic revolution dispersed the manufacturers to Florence, Bologna, Venice, Milan, and even the countries beyond the Alps. And thirteen years after this event, the statutes of Medina enjoin the planting of mulberry trees, and regulate the duties on raw silk. The northern climates are less proprietors to the education of the silkworm, but the industry of France and England is... I must repeat the complaint, that the vague and scanty memorials of the times will not afford any just estimate of the taxes, the revenue, and the resources of the Greek Empire. From every province of Asia and Europe, the rivulets of gold and silver discharged into the imperial reservoir, a copious and perennial stream. The separation of the branches from the trunk increased the relative magnitude of Constantinople, and the maxims of despotism contracted the state to the capital, the capital to the palace, and the palace to the royal person. A Jewish traveller, who visited the East in the twelfth century, is lost in his admiration of the Byzantine riches. It is here, says Benjamin of Tadila, in the Queen of Cities, that the tributes of the Greek Empire are annually deposited, and the lofty towers are filled with precious magazines of silk, purple, and gold. It is said that Constantinople pays each day to her sovereign twenty thousand pieces of gold, which are levied on the shops, taverns, and markets, on the merchants of Persia and Egypt, of Russia and Hungary, of Italy and Spain, who frequent the capital by sea and land. In all pecuniary matters, the authority of a Jew is doubtless respectable. But, as the 365 days would produce an yearly income exceeding seven million sterling, I am tempted to retrench at least the numerous festivals of the Greek calendar. The mass of treasure that was saved by Theodora and Basil II will suggest a splendid, though indefinite, idea of their supplies and resources. The mother of Michael, before she retired to a cloister, attempted to check or expose the prodigality of her ungrateful son by a free and faithful account of the wealth which he inherited, one hundred and nine thousand pounds of gold and three hundred thousand of silver, the fruits of her own economy and that of a deceased husband. The avarice of Basil is not less renowned than his valour and fortune. His victorious armies were paid and rewarded, without breaking into the mass of two hundred thousand pounds of gold, about eight million sterling, which he had buried in the subterraneous vaults of the palace. Such accumulation of treasure is rejected by the theory and practice of modern policy, and we are more apt to compute the national riches by the use and abuse of the public credit. Yet the maxims of antiquity are still embraced by a monarch formidable to his enemies, by a republic respectable to her allies, and both have attained their respective ends of military power and domestic tranquillity. Whatever might be consumed for the present wants, or reserved for the future use of the state, the first and most sacred demand was for the pomp and pleasure of the emperor, and his discretion only could define the measure of his private expense. The princes of Constantinople were far removed from the simplicity of nature, yet, with the revolving seasons, they were led by taste or fashion to withdraw to a purer air from the smoke and tumult of the capital. They enjoyed, or affected to enjoy, the rustic festival of the vintage. Their leisure was amused by the exercise of the chase and the calmer occupation of fishing and in the summer heats they were shielded from the sun and refreshed by the cooling breezes from the sea. The coasts and islands of Asia and Europe were covered with their magnificent villas, but, 
instead of the modest art which secretly strives to hide itself and to decorate the scenery of nature, the marble structure of their gardens served only to expose the riches of the lord and the labours of the architect. The successive casualties of inheritance and forfeiture had rendered the sovereign proprietor of many stately houses in the city and suburbs, of which twelve were appropriated to the ministers of state. But the great palace, the centre of the imperial residence, was fixed during eleven centuries to the same position, between the Hippodrome, the Cathedral of St. Sophia, and the gardens, which descended by many a terrace to the shores of the Propontis. The primitive edifice of the first Constantine was a copy or rival of ancient Rome. The gradual improvements of his successors aspired to emulate the wonders of the old world, and in the tenth century the Byzantine palace excited the admiration, at least of the Latins, by an unquestionable pre-eminence of strength, size, and magnificence. But the toil and treasure of so many ages had produced a vast and irregular pile. Each separate building was marked with the character of the times and of the founder, and the want of space might excuse the reigning monarch, who demolished, perhaps with secret satisfaction, the works of his predecessors. The economy of the emperor Theophilus allowed a more free and ample scope for his domestic luxury and splendor. A favorite ambassador. Who had astonished the Abbasides themselves by his pride and liberality, presented on his return the model of a palace, which the Caliph of Baghdad had recently constructed on the banks of the Tigris. The model was instantly copied and surpassed. The new buildings of Theophilus were accompanied with gardens and with five churches, one of which was conspicuous for size and beauty. It was crowned with three domes. The roof of gilt brass reposed on columns of Italian marble, and the walls were encrusted with marbles of various colours. In the face of the church, a semicircular portico of the figure and name of the Greek sigma was supported by fifteen columns of Phrygian marble, and the subterraneous vaults were of a similar construction. The square before the sigma was decorated with a fountain. And the margin of the basin was lined and encompassed with plates of silver. In the beginning of each season, the basin, instead of water, was replenished with the most exquisite fruits, which were abandoned to the populace for the entertainment of the prince. He enjoyed this tumultuous spectacle from a throne resplendent with gold and gems, which was raised by a marble staircase to the height of a lofty terrace. Below the throne were seated the officers of his guard, the magistrates, the chiefs of the factions of the circus. The inferior steps were occupied by the people, and the place below was covered with troops of dancers, singers, and pantomimes. The square was surrounded by the hall of justice, the arsenal, and the various offices of business and pleasure, and the purple chamber was named from the annual distribution of robes of scarlet and purple. By the hand of the empress herself, the long series of the apartments was adapted to the seasons, and decorated with marble and porphyry, with painting, sculpture, and mosaics, with the profusion of gold, silver, and precious stones. His fanciful magnificence employed the skill and patience of such artists as the times could afford, but the taste of Athens would have despised their frivolous and costly labors. A golden tree, with its leaves and branches, which sheltered a multitude of birds warbling their artificial notes, and two lions of massy gold and of natural size, who looked and roared like their brethren of the forest. The successors of Theophilus, of the Basilian and Comnenian dynasties, were not less ambitious of leaving some memorial of their residence, and the portion of the palace most splendid and august. Was dignified with the title of the Golden Triclium. With becoming modesty, the rich and noble Greeks aspired to imitate their sovereign, and when they passed through the streets on horseback, in their robes of silk and embroidery, they were mistaken by the children for kings. A matron of Peloponnesus, who had cherished the infant fortunes of Basil the Macedonian, 
was excited by tenderness or vanity to visit the greatness of her adopted son. In a journey of five hundred miles from Patras to Constantinople, her age or indolence declined the fatigue of a horse or carriage. The soft litter or bed of Danielis was transported on the shoulder of ten robust slaves, and as they were relieved at easy distances, a band of three hundred was selected for the performance of this service. She was entertained in the Byzantine palace with filial reverence, and the honours of a queen. And, whatever might be the origin of her wealth, her gifts were not unworthy of the regal dignity. I have already described the fine and curious manufacturers of Peloponnesus, of linen, silk, and woollen. But the most acceptable of her presents consisted in three hundred beautiful youths, of whom one hundred were eunuchs. For she was not ignorant, says the historian, that the air of the palace is more congenial to such insects than a shepherd's dairy to the flies of the summer. During her lifetime, she bestowed the greater part of her estates in Peloponnesus, and her testament insulted Leo, the son of Basil, her universal heir. After the payment of the legacies, fourscore villas or farms were added to the imperial domain and three thousand slaves of Danielis were enfranchised by their new lord, and transported as a colony to the Italian coast. From this example of a private matron, we may estimate the wealth and magnificence of the empress. Yet our enjoyments are confined by a narrow circle, and, whatsoever may be its value, the luxury of life is possessed with more innocence and safety by the master of his own house, than by the steward of the public fortune. In an absolute government, which levels the distinction of noble and plebeian birth, the sovereign is the sole fountain of honour, and the rank, both in the palace and the empire, depends on the titles and offices which are bestowed and resumed by his arbitrary will. Above a thousand years, from Vespasian to Alexis Comnenus, the Caesar was the second person, or at least the second degree, after the supreme title of Augustus, was more freely communicated to the sons and brothers of the reigning monarch. To elude, without violating his promise to a powerful associate, the husband of his sister, and, without giving himself an equal, to reward the piety of his brother Isaac, the crafty Alexis interposed a new and supreme eminent dignity. The happy flexibility of the Greek tongue allowed him to compound the name of Augustus and Emperor, Sebestus, and Autocrator, and the union produces the sonorous title of Sebestocrator. He was exalted above the Caesar on the first step of the throne. The public acclamations repeated his name, and he was only distinguished from the sovereign by some peculiar ornaments of the head and feet. The emperor alone could assume the purple or red buskins, and the close diadem or tiara, which imitated the fashion of the Persian kings. It was a high pyramidal cap of cloth or silk, almost concealed by a profusion of pearls and jewels. The crown was formed by a horizontal circle and two arches of gold. At the summit, the point of their intersection, was placed a globe or cross, and two strings or lappets of pearl depended on either cheek. Instead of red, the buskins of the Sebastocrator Crator and Caesar were green, and on their open coronets or crowns, the precious gems were more sparingly distributed. Beside and below the Caesar, the fancy of Alexis created the pan Sebastos, and the proto Sebastos, whose sound and signification will satisfy a Grecian ear. They imply a superiority and a priority above the simple name of Augustus, and this sacred and primitive title of the Roman prince was degraded to the kinsmen and servants of the Byzantine court. The daughter of Alexis applauds, with fond complacency, this artful gradation of hopes and honours. But the science of words is accessible to the meanest capacity, and this vain dictionary was easily enriched by the pride of his successors. 
to their favourite sons or brothers, they imparted the more lofty appellation of lord or despot, which was illustrated with new ornaments and prerogatives, and placed immediately after the person of the emperor himself. The five titles of 1. Despot 2. Sebasto Creator 3. Caesar 4. Panhyper Sebastus and 5. Proto Sebastus were usually confined to the princes of his blood. They were the emanations of his majesty, but as they exercised no regal functions, their existence was useless and their authority precarious. But in every monarchy the substantial powers of government must be divided and exercised by the ministers of the palace and treasury, the fleet and army. The titles alone can differ, and in the revolution of ages, the counts and prefects, the praetor and quaestor, insensibly descended, while their servants rose above their heads to the first honours of the state. 1. In a monarchy, which refers every object to the person of the prince, the care and ceremonies of the palace form the most respectable department. The cura palate, so illustrious in the age of Justinian, was supplanted by the proto whose primitive functions were limited to the custody of the wardrobe. From thence his jurisdiction was extended over the numerous menials of pomp and luxury, and he presided with a silver wand at the public and private audience. 2. In the ancient system of Constantine, the name of Logothate, or accountant, was applied to the receivers of the finances. The principal officers were distinguished as the Logothates of the domain, of the posts, the army, the private and public treasure. And the great Logothate, the supreme guardian of the laws and revenues, is compared with the chancellor of the Latin monarchies. His discerning eye pervaded the civil administration, and he was assisted, in due subordination, by the eparch or prefect of the city. The first secretary, and the keepers of the privy seal, the archives, and the red or purple ink, which was reserved for the sacred signature of the emperor alone. The introductor and interpreter of foreign ambassadors. were well, the great Chaucer and the dragoman, two names of Turkish origin, and which are still familiar to the sublime port. 3. From the humble style and service of the guards, the domestics insensibly rose to the station of generals. The military themes of the East and West, the legion of Europe and Asia, were often divided, till the great domestic was finally invested with the universal and absolute command of the land forces. The protostrata, in his original functions, was the assistant of the emperor when he mounted on horseback. He gradually became the lieutenant of the great domestic in the field, and his jurisdiction extended over the stables, the cavalry, and the royal train of hunting and hawking. The Stratopedarch was the great judge of the camp. The Protospathere commanded the guards. The constable, the great Atriarch, and the Acolyth were the separate chiefs of the Franks, the Barbarians, and the Varangi, or English, the mercenary strangers who, at the decay of the national spirit, formed the nerve of the Byzantine armies. 4. The naval powers were under the command of the great duke. In his absence they obeyed the great drangere of the fleet, and in his place the emir or admiral, a name of Saracen extraction, but which has been naturalized in all the modern languages of Europe. Of these officers, and of many more whom it would be useless to enumerate, the civil and military hierarchy was framed. Their honours and emoluments, their dress and titles, their mutual salutations and respective preeminence, were balanced with more exquisite labour than would have fixed the constitution of a free people. And the code was almost perfect, when this baseless fabric, the monument of pride and servitude, was forever burned in the ruins of the empire. The most lofty titles and the most humble postures, which devotion has applied to the supreme being, have been prostituted by flattery and fear to creatures of the same nature with ourselves. The mode of adoration, of falling prostrate on the ground and kissing the feet of the emperor, 
was borrowed by Diocletian from Persian servitude, but it was continued and aggravated till the last age of the Greek monarchy, excepting only on Sundays when it was waved, from a motive of religious pride. This humiliating reverence was extracted from all who entered the royal presence, from the princes invested with the diadem and purple, and from the ambassadors who represented their independent sovereigns, the caliphs of Asia, Egypt, or Spain, the kings of France and Italy, and the Latin emperors of ancient Rome. In his transactions of business, Lutprand, bishop of Cremonia, asserted the free spirit of a Frank and the dignity of his master, Otho. Yet his sincerity cannot disguise the abasement of his first audience. When he approached the throne, the birds of the golden tree began to warble their notes, which were accompanied by the roarings of two lions of gold. With his two companions, Lutprand was compelled to bow and to fall prostrate, and thrice to touch the ground with his forehead. He arose, but in the short interval, the throne had been hoisted from the floor to the ceiling. The imperial figure appeared in new and more gorgeous apparel, and the interview was concluded in haughty and majestic silence. In this honest and curious narrative, the Bishop of Cremona represents the ceremonies of the Byzantine court, which are still practised in the sublime port, and which were preserved in the last ages by the dukes of Muscovy or Russia. After a long journey by sea and land from Venice to Constantinople, the ambassador halted at the Golden Gate, till he was conducted by the formal officers to the hospitable palace prepared for his reception. But this palace was a prison, and his jealous keepers prohibited all social intercourse either with strangers or natives. At his first audience, he offered the gifts of his master, slaves and golden vases and costly armour. The ostentatious payment of the officers and troops displayed before his eyes the riches of the empire. He was entertained at a royal banquet, in which the ambassadors of the nations were marshalled by the esteem or contempt of the Greeks. From his own table, the emperor, as the most signal favour, sent the plates which he had tasted, and his favourites were dismissed with a robe of honour. In the morning and evening of each day, his civil and military servants attended their duty in the palace. Their labours were repaid by the sight, perhaps by the smile of their lord. His commands were signified by a nod or a sign. But all earthy greatness stood silent and submissive in his presence. In his regular or extraordinary processions through the capital, he unveiled his person to the public view. The rites of policy were connected with those of religion, and his visits to the principal churches were regulated by the festivals of the Greek calendar. On the eve of these processions, the gracious or devout intention of the monarch was proclaimed by the heralds. The streets were cleared and purified, the pavement was strewn with flowers, the most precious furniture, the gold and silver plate and silken hangings, were displayed from the windows and balconies, and a severe discipline restrained and silenced the tumult of the populace. The march was opened by the military officers at the head of their troops. They were followed in long order by the magistrates and ministers of the civil government. The person of the emperor was guarded by his eunuchs and domestics and at the church door he was solemnly received by the patriarch and his clergy. The task of applause was not abandoned to the rude and spontaneous voice of the crowd. The most convenient stations were occupied by the bands of the blue and green factions of the circus, and their furious conflicts, which had shaken the capital, were insensibly sunk to an emulation of servitude. For me the side they echoed in responsive melody the praises of the emperor, their poets and musicians directed the choir, and long life and victory were the burden of every song. The same acclamations were performed at the audience, the banquet, and the church, and as an evidence of boundless sway, they were repeated in Latin, Gothic, Persian, French, and even English language, by the mercenaries who sustained the real or fictitious character of those nations. By the pen of Constantine Porphogenitus, this science of form and flattery had been reduced into a pompous and trifling volume, 
which the vanity of succeeding times might enrich with an ample supplement. Yet the calmer reflection of a prince would surely suggest that the same acclamations were applied to every character in every reign. And if he had risen from a private rank, he might remember that his own voice had been the loudest and most eager in applause, at the very moment when he envied the fortune or conspired against the life of his predecessor. The princes of the north, of the nation, says Constantine, without faith or fame, were ambitious of mingling their blood with the blood of the Caesars, by their marriage with a royal virgin, or by the nuptials of their daughters with a Roman prince. The aged monarch, in his instructions to his son, reveals the secret maxims of policy and pride, and suggests the most decent reasons for refusing these insolent and unreasonable demands. Every animal, says the discreet emperor, is prompted by the distinction of language, religion, and manners. A just regard to the purity of descent preserves the harmony of public and private life. But the mixture of foreign blood is the fruitful source of disorder and discord. Such had ever been the opinion and practice of the sage Romans. Their jurisprudence prescribed the marriage of a citizen and a stranger. In the days of freedom and virtue, a senator would have scorned to match his daughter with a king. The glory of Mark Antony was sullied by an Egyptian wife, and the emperor Titus was compelled, by popular censure, to dismiss with reluctance the reluctant Bernice. This perpetual interdict was ratified by the fabulous sanction of the great Constantine. The ambassadors of the nations, more especially of the unbelieving nations, were solemnly admonished, that such strange alliances had been condemned by the founder of the church and city. The irrevocable law was inscribed on the altar of St. Sophia, and the impious prince who should stain the majesty of the purple was excluded from the civil and ecclesiastical communion of the Romans. If the ambassadors were instructed by any false brethren in the Byzantine history, they might produce three memorable examples of the violation of this imaginary law the marriage of Leo, or rather of his father Constantine the Fourth, with the daughter of the king of the Shazars, the nuptials of the granddaughter of Romanus with a Bulgarian prince, and the union of Bertha of France or Italy with young Romanus, the son of Constantine Porphogenitus himself. To these objections three answers were prepared, which solved the difficulty and established the law. The deed and guilt of Constantine Corponimus were acknowledged. The Isaurian heretic, who sullied the baptismal font and declared war against the holy images, had indeed embraced a barbarian wife. By this impious alliance he accomplished the measures of his crime, and was devoted to the just cause of and was devoted to the just censure of the one. The deed and guilt of Constantine Corponimus were acknowledged. The Assyrian heretic, who sullied the baptismal font and declared war against the holy images, had indeed embraced a barbarian wife. By this impious alliance he accomplished the measure of his crimes, and was devoted to the just censure of the church and of posterity. 2. Romanus could not be alleged as a legitimate emperor. He was a plebeian usurper, ignorant of the laws and regardless of the honour of the monarchy. His son Christopher, the father of the bride, was the third in rank in the College of Princes, at once the subject and the accomplice of a rebellious parent. The Bulgarians were sincere and devout Christians, and the safety of the empire, with the redemption of many thousand captives, depended on this preposterous alliance. Yet no consideration could dispense from the laws of Constantine. The clergy, the senate, and the people disapproved the conduct of Romanus, and he was reproached, both in his life and death, as the author of the public disgrace. 3. For the marriage of his own son with the daughter of Hugo, king of Italy, a more honourable defence is contrived by the wise Porphyrogenitus. Constantine, the great and holy, esteem the fidelity and valour of the Franks, and his prophetic spirit beheld the vision of their future greatness. 
they alone were excepted from the general prohibition. Hugo, king of France, was the lineal descendant of Charlemagne, and his daughter Bertha inherited the prerogatives of her family and nation. The voice of truth and malice insensibly betrayed the fraud or error of the imperial court. The patrimonial estate of Hugo was reduced from the monarchy of France to the simple country of Arles, though it was not denied that, in the confusion of the times, he had usurped the sovereignty of province, and invaded the kingdom of Italy. His father was a private noble, and if Bertha derived her female descent from the Carlovingian line, every step was polluted with illegitimacy or vice. The grandmother of Hugo was the famous Valdara, the concubine, rather than the wife, of the second Lothar, whose adultery, divorce, and second nuptials had provoked against him the thunders of the Vatican. His mother, as she was styled, the great Bertha, was successfully the wife of the Count of Arles and of the Marquess of Tuscany. France and Italy were scandalized by her gallantries, and, till the age of threescore, her lovers of every degree were the zealous servants of her ambition. The example of maternal incontinence was copied by the king of Italy, and the three favoured concubines of Hugo were decorated with the classic names of Venus, Juno, and Semele. The daughter of Venus was granted to the solicitations of the Byzantine court. Her name of Bertha was changed to that of Eudoxa, and she was wedded, or rather betrothed, to young Romanus the future heir of the Empire of the East. The consummation of this foreign alliance was suspended by the tender age of the two parties, and, at the end of five years, the union was dissolved by the death of the virgin spouse. The second wife of the Emperor Romanus was a maiden of plebeian, but of Roman birth, and their two daughters, Theophano and Anne, were given in marriage to the princes of the earth. The eldest was bestowed, as the pledge of peace, on the eldest son of the great Otho, who had solicited this alliance with arms and embassies. It might legally be questioned how far a Saxon was entitled to the privilege of the French nation, but every scruple was silenced by the fame and piety of a hero who had restored the empire of the West. After the death of her father-in-law and husband, Theophano governed Rome, Italy, and Germany during the minority of her son, the third Otho. And the Latins have praised the virtues of an empress, who sacrificed to his superior duty the remembrance of her country. In the nuptials of her sister Anne, every prejudice was lost, and every consideration of dignity was superseded, but the stronger argument of necessity and fear. A pagan of the north, Wolodomir, great prince of Russia, aspired to a daughter of the Roman purple, and his claim was enforced by the threats of war, the promise of conversion, and the offer of a powerful succour against a domestic rebel. A victim of her religion and country, the Grecian princess was torn from the palace of her fathers, and condemned to a savage reign and a hopeless exile on the banks of the Borysthenes or in the neighbourhood of the polar circle. Yet the marriage of Anne was fortunate and fruitful. The daughter of her grandson, Jerusalus, was recommended by her imperial descent, and the king of France, Henry I, sought a wife on the last borders of Europe and Christendom. In the Byzantine palace, the emperor was the first slave of the ceremonies which he imposed, of the rigid forms which regulated each word and gesture, besieged him in the palace, and violated the leisure of his rural solitude. But the lives and fortunes of millions hung on his arbitrary will, and the firmest minds, superior to the allurements of pomp and luxury, may be seduced by the more active pleasure of commanding their equals. The legislative and executive powers were centred in the person of the monarch, and the last remains of the authority of the senate, were finally eradicated by Leo, the philosopher. A lethargy of servitude had benumbed the minds of the Greeks. In the wildest tumults of rebellion they never aspired to the idea of a free constitution. 
and the private character of the prince was the only source and measure of their public happiness. Superstition riveted their chains. In the church of St. Sophia he was solemnly crowned by the patriarch. At the foot of the altar they pledged their passive and unconditional obedience to his government and family. On his side he engaged to abstain as much as possible from the capital punishments of death and mutilation. His orthodox creed was subscribed with his own hand, and he promised to obey the decrees of the seven synoids and the canons of the holy church. But the assurance of mercy was loose and indefinite. He swore, not to his people, but to an invisible judge. And, except the inexpiable guilt of heresy, the ministers of heaven were always prepared to preach the indefeasible right, and to absolve the venial transgressions of their sovereign. The Greek ecclesiasticals were themselves the subjects of the civil magistrate. At the nod of a tyrant, the bishops were created, or transferred, or deposed, or punished with an ignominious death. Whatever might be their wealth or influence, they could never succeed like the Latin clergy in the establishment of an independent republic. And the patriarch of Constantinople condemned, what he secretly envied, the temporal greatness of his Roman brother. Yet the exercise of boundless despotism is happily checked by the laws of nature and necessity. In proportion to his wisdom and virtue, the master of an empire is confined to the path of his sacred and laborious duty. In proportion to his vice and folly, he drops the sceptre too weighty for his hands, and the motions of the royal image are ruled by the imperceptible thread of some minister or favourite, who undertakes for his private interest to exercise the task of the public oppression. In some fatal moment, the most absolute monarch may dread the reason or the caprice of a nation of slaves. And experience has proved that whatever is gained in the extent is lost in the safety and solidity of regal power. Whatever titles a despot may assume, whatever claims he may assert, it is on the sword that he must ultimately depend to guard him against his foreign and domestic enemies. From the age of Charlemagne to that of the Crusades, the world, for I overlook the remote monarchy of China, was occupied and disputed by the three great empires or nations of the Greeks, the Saracens, and the Franks. Their military strength may be ascertained by a comparison of their courage, their arts and riches, and their obedience to a supreme head, who might call into action all the energies of the state. The Greeks, far inferior to their rivals in the first, were superior to the Franks, and at least equal to the Saracens in the second and third of these warlike qualifications. The wealth of the Greeks enabled them to purchase the service of the poorer nations, and to maintain a naval power for the protection of their coasts and the annoyance of their enemies. A commerce of the mutual benefit exchanged the gold of Constantinople, for the blood of Sclovians and Turks, the Bulgarians and Russians. Their valour contributed to the victories of Nicephorus and Zimiskis. And if a hostile people pressed too closely on the frontier, they were recalled to the defence of their country and the desire of peace by the well-managed attack of a more distant tribe. The command of the Mediterranean, from the mouth of the Tineus to the columns of Hercules, was always claimed and often possessed by the successors of Constantine. Their capital was filled with naval stores and dexterous artifices. The situation of Greece and Asia, the long coasts, deep gulfs and numerous islands, accustomed their subjects to the exercise of navigation. And the trade of Venice and Amalfi supplied a nursery of seamen to the imperial fleet. Since the time of the Peloponnesian and Punic Wars, the sphere of action had not been enlarged, and the science of naval architecture appears to have declined. The art of constructing these stupendous machines which displayed three or six or ten ranges of oars, rising above or falling behind each other, was unknown to the shipbuilders of Constantinople, as well as to the 
as well as to the mechanician of modern days. The Dramones, or light galleys of the Byzantine Empire, were content with two tier of oars. Each tier was composed of five and twenty benches, and two rowers were seated on each bench, who plied their oars on either side of the vessel. To these we must add the captain or centurion, who, in time of action, stood erect with his armour-bearer on the poop, two steersmen at the helm, and two officers at the prow, the one to manage the anchor, the other to point and play against the enemy the tube of liquid fire. The whole crew, as in the infancy of the art, performed the double service of mariners and soldiers. They were provided with defensive and offensive arms, with bows and arrows, which they used from the upper deck, with long pikes, which they pushed through the portholes of the lower tier. Sometimes, indeed, the ships of war were of a larger and more solid construction, and the labours of combat and navigation were more regularly divided between seventy soldiers and two hundred and thirty mariners. But, for the most part, they were of the light and manageable size. And, as the Cape of Malaya in Peloponnesus was still clothed with its ancient terrors, an imperial fleet was transported five miles over land across the Isthmus of Corinth. The principles of maritime tactics had not undergone any change since the time of Thucydides. A squadron of galleys still advanced in a crescent, charged to the front, and strove to impel their sharp beaks against the feeble sides of their antagonists. A machine for casting stones and darts was built of strong timbers in the midst of the deck and the operation of boarding was effected by a crane that hosted baskets of armed men. The language of signals, so clear and copious in the naval grammar of the moderns, was imperfectly expressed by the various positions and colours of a commanding flag. In the darkness of the night, the same orders to chase, to attack, to halt, to retreat, to break, to form, were conveyed by the lights of the leading galley, by land, the fire signals were repeated from one mountain to another. A chain of eight stations commanded a space of five hundred miles, and Constantinople, in a few hours, was appraised of the hostile motions of the Saracens of Tarsus. Some estimate may be formed of the power of the Greek emperors, by the curious and minute detail of the armament which was prepared for the reduction of Crete. A fleet of one hundred and twelve galleys and seventy-five vessels of the Pamphylian style were equipped in the capital, the islands of the Aegean Sea, and the seaports of Asia, Macedonia, and Greece. It carried thirty-four thousand mariners, seven thousand three hundred and forty soldiers, seven hundred Russians, and five thousand and eighty-seven maridates, whose fathers had been transplanted from the mountains of Libanus. Their pay, most probably of a month, was computed at thirty-four centenaries of gold, about one hundred and thirty-six thousand pounds sterling. Our fancy is bewildered by the endless recapitulation of arms and engines, of clothes and linen, of bread for the men and of forage for the horses, and of stores and utensils of every description, inadequate to the conquest of a petty island but amply sufficient for the establishment of a flourishing colony. The invention of the Greek fire did not, like that of gunpowder, produce a total revolution in the art of war. To these liquid combustibles, the city and empire of Constantine owed their deliverance, and they were employed in sieges and sea-fights with terrible effect. But they were either less improved or less susceptible of improvement, the engines of antiquity, the catapult, ballista, and battering rams, were still of most frequent and powerful use in the attack and defence of fortifications. Nor was the decision of battles reduced to the quick and heavy fire of a line of infantry, whom it were fruitless to protect with armour against a similar fire of their enemies. Steel and iron were still the common instruments of destruction and safety and the helmets, cuirasses, and shields of the tenth century did not, either in form or substance, essentially differ from those which had covered the champions of Alexander or Achilles. But, 
instead of accustoming the modern Greeks like the legionnaires of old to the constant and easy use of this sultry weight. Their armors laid aside in light chariots, which followed the march, till, on the approach of an enemy, they resumed with haste and reluctance the unusual encumbrance. Their offensive weapons consisted of swords, battle-axes, and spears, but the Macedonian pike was shortened a fourth of its length, and reduced to the more convenient measure of twelve cubits or feet. The sharpness of the Scythian and Arabian arrows had been severely felt, and the emperors lament the decay of archery as a cause of the public misfortunes, and recommended, as an advice and a command, that the military youth, till the age of forty, should assiduously practise the exercise of the bow. The bands, or regiments, were usually three hundred strong, and, as a medium between the extremes of four and sixteen, the foot-soldiers of Leo and Constantine were formed eight deep. But the cavalry charged in four ranks, from the reasonable consideration that the weight of the front could not be increased by any pressure of the hindermost horses. If the ranks of the infantry or cavalry were sometimes doubled, this cautious array betrayed a secret distrust of the courage of the troops, whose numbers might swell the appearance of the line, but of whom only a chosen band would dare to encounter the spears and swords of the barbarians. The order of the battle must have varied according to the ground, the object, and the adversary, but their ordinary disposition, in two lines and a reserve, presented a succession of hopes and resources most agreeable to the temper as well as the judgment of the Greeks. In case of a repulse, the first line fell back into the intervals of the second, and the reserve, breaking into two divisions, wheeled round the Franks to improve the victory or cover the retreat. Whatever authority could enact was accomplished, at least in theory, by the camps and marches, the exercises and evolutions, the edicts and books of the Byzantine monarch. Whatever art could have produced from the forge, the loom, or the laboratory, was abundantly supplied by the riches of the prince, and the industry of his numerous workmen. But neither authority nor art could frame the most important machine, the soldier himself. And if the ceremonies of Constantine always supposed a safe and triumphal return of the emperor, his tactics seldom saw above the means of escaping a defeat and procrastinating the war. Notwithstanding some transient success, the Greeks were sunk in their own esteem and that of their neighbours. A cold hand and a curious tongue were the vulgar description of a nation. The author of the tactics was besieged in his capital, and the last of the barbarians, who trembled at the name of the Saracens or Franks, could proudly exhibit the medals of gold and silver which they had exhorted from the feeble sovereign of Constantinople. What spirit their government and character denied might have been inspired in some degree by the influence of religion, but the religion of the Greeks could only teach them to suffer and to yield. The emperor Nicephorus, who restored for a moment the discipline and glory of the Roman name, was desirous of bestowing the honours of martyrdom on the Christians, who lost their lives in a holy war against the infidels. But this political law was defeated by the opposition of the patriarch, the bishops, and the principal senators. And they strenuously urged the canons of St. Basil, that all who were polluted by the bloody trade of a soldier should be separated, during three years, from the communion of the faithful. These scruples of the Greeks have been compared with the tears of the primitive Moslems, when they were held back from battle, and this contrast of base superstition and high-spirited enthusiasm unfolds to a philosophic eye the history of the rival nations. The subjects of the last caliphs had undoubtedly degenerated from the zeal and faith of the companions of the Prophet, yet their martial creed still represented the deity as the author of war. The vital, though latent spark of fanaticism, the vital, though latent spark of fanaticism, still glowed in the heart of their religion, and among the Saracens, who dwelt on the Christian borders, it was frequently rekindled to a lively and active flame. 
their regular force was formed of the valiant slaves, who had been educated to guard the person and accompany the standard of their lord. But the Moslem people of Syria and Sicilia, of Africa and Spain, were awakened by the trumpet which proclaimed a holy war against the infidels. The rich were ambitious of death or victory in the cause of God, the poor were eluded by the hopes of plunder, and the old, the infirm, and the women assumed their share of meritorious service by sending their substitutes, with arms and horses, into the field. These offensive and defensive arms were similar in strength and temper to those of the Romans, whom they far excelled in the management of the horse and the bow. The massy silver of their belts, their bridles, and their swords displayed the magnificence of a prosperous nation, and except some black archers of the south, the Arabs disdained the naked bravery of their ancestors. Instead of wagons, they were attended by a long train of camels, mules, and asses. The multitude of these animals, whom they bedecked with flags and streamers, appeared to swell the pomp and magnitude of their host. And the horses of the enemy were often disordered by the uncouth figure and odious smell of the camels of the east. Invincible by their patience of thirst and heat, their spirits were frozen by a winter's cold, and the consciousness of their propensity to sleep exacted the most rigorous precautions against the surprises of the night. Their order of battle was a long square of two deep and solid lines, the first of archers, the second of cavalry. In their engagements by sea and land, they sustained with patient firmness the fury of the attack, and seldom advanced to the charge till they could discern and oppress the lassitude of their foes. But if they were repulsed and broken, they knew not how to rally or renew the combat, and their dismay was heightened by the superstitious prejudice that God had declared himself on the side of their enemies. The decline and fall of the caliphs countenanced their fearful opinion, nor were there wanting, among the Mohammedans and Christians, some obscure prophecies which prognosticated their alternate defeats. The unity of the Arabian Empire was dissolved, but the independent fragments were equal to populous and powerful kingdoms, and in their navy and military armaments, an emir of Aleppo or Tunis might command no despicable fund of skill and industry and treasure. In their transactions of peace and war with the Saracens, the princes of Constantinople too often felt that these barbarians had nothing barbarous in their discipline, and, if they were destitute of original genius, they had been endowed with a quick spirit of curiosity and imitation. The model was indeed more perfect than the copy. Their ships and engines and fortifications were of a less skilful construction, and they confess without shame that the same God who has given a tongue to the Arabians had more nicely fashioned A name of some German tribes between the Rhine and the Weiser had spread its victorious influence over the greatest part of Gaul, Germany, and Italy, and the common appellation of Franks was applied by the Greeks and Arabians to the Christians of the Latin Church, the nations of the West, who stretched beyond their knowledge to the shores of the Atlantic Ocean. The vast body had been inspired and united by the soul of Charlemagne, but the division and degeneracy of his race soon annihilated the imperial power, which would have rivalled the Caesars of Byzantium, and revenged the indignities of the Christian name. The enemies no longer feared, nor could the subjects any longer trust, the application of a public revenue, the labours of trade and manufactures in the military service, the mutual aid of provinces and armies and the naval squadrons which were regularly stationed from the mouth of the Elbe to that of the Tiber. In the beginning of the tenth century, the family of Charlemagne had almost disappeared. His monarchy was broken into many hostile and independent states. The regal title was assumed by the most ambitious chiefs. Their revolt was imitated in a long subordination of anarchy and discord, and the nobles of every province disobeyed their sovereign, oppressed their vassals, and exercised perpetual hostilities against their equals and neighbours. 
their private wars, which overturned the fabric of government, fermented the martial spirit of the nation. In the system of modern Europe, the power of the sword is possessed, at least in fact, by five or six mighty potentates. Their operations are conducted on a distant frontier, by an order of men who devote their lives to the study and practice of the military art. The rest of the country and community enjoys, in the midst of war, the tranquillity of peace, and is only made sensible of the change by the aggravation or decrease of the public taxes. In the disorders of the tenth and eleventh centuries, every peasant was a soldier, and every village a fortification. Each wood or valley was a scene of murder and rapine, and the lords of each castle were compelled to assume the character of princes and warriors. To their own courage and policy they boldly trusted for the safety of their family, the protection of their lands, and the revenge of their injuries. And, like the conquerors of a large size, they were too apt to transgress the privilege of defensive war. The powers of the mind and body were hardened by the presence of danger and necessity of resolution. The same spirit refused to desert a friend and to forgive an enemy. And, instead of sleeping under the guardian care of a magistrate, they proudly disdained the authority of the laws. In the days of feudal anarchy, the instruments of agriculture and art were converted into the weapons of bloodshed. The peaceful occupations of civil and ecclesiastical society were abolished or corrupted. And the bishop who exchanged his mitre for a helmet was more forcibly urged by the manners of the times than by the obligation of his tenure. The love of freedom and of arms was felt, with conscious pride, by the Franks themselves, and is observed by the Greeks with some degree of amazement and terror. The Franks, says the Emperor Constantine, are bold and valiant to the verge of termity, and their dauntless spirit is supported by the contempt of danger and death. In the field and in close onset, they press to the front, and rush headlong against the enemy, without deigning to compute either his numbers or their own. Their ranks are formed by the firm connections of consanguinity and friendship, and their martial deeds are prompted by the desire of saving or revenging their dearest companions. In their eyes, a retreat is a shameful flight, and flight is indelible infamy. A nation endowed with such high and intrepid spirit must have been secure of victory if these advantages had not been counterbalanced by many weighty defects. The decay of their naval power left the Greeks and Saracens in possession of the sea, for every purpose of annoyance and supply. In the age which preceded the institution of knighthood, the Franks were rude and unskilful in the service of cavalry, and in all perilous emergencies, their warriors were so conscious of their ignorance that they chose to dismount from their horses and fight on foot. Unpractised in the use of pikes or of missile weapons, they were encumbered by the length of their swords, the weight of their armour, the magnitude of their shields, and, if I may repeat the satire of the meagre Greeks, by their unwieldy intemperance. Their independent spirit disdained the yoke of subordination, and abandoned the standard of their chief, if he attempted to keep the field beyond the term of their stipulation or service. On all sides they were open to the snares of an enemy less brave, but more artful than themselves. They might be bribed, for the barbarians were venial, or surprised in the night, for they neglected the precautions of a close encampment or vigilant sentinels. The fatigues of a summer's campaign exhausted their strength and patience, and they sunk in despair if their voracious appetite was disappointed of the plentiful supply of wine and of food. This general character of the Franks was marked with some national and local shades, which I should ascribe to accident rather than to climate, but which were visible both to natives and to foreigners. An ambassador of the great Otho declared, in the palace of Constantinople, that the Saxons could dispute with swords better than with pens, and that they preferred inevitable death to the dishonour of turning their backs to an enemy. It was the glory of the nobles of France, that in their humble dwellings war and rapine were the only pleasure, the sole occupation of their lives, 
they affected to deride the palaces, the banquets, the polished manner of the Italians, who, in the estimate of the Greeks themselves, had degenerated from the liberty and valour of the ancient Lombards. By the well-known edict of Caracalla, his subjects, from Britain to Egypt, were entitled to the name and privileges of Romans, and their national sovereign might fix his occasional or permanent residence in any province of their common country. In the division of the east and west, an ideal unity was scrupulously observed, and in their titles, laws, and statutes. The successors of Arcadius and Honorius announced themselves as the inseparable colleagues of the same office, as the joint sovereigns of the Roman world and city, which were bounded by the same limits. After the fall of the western monarchy, the majesty of the purple resided solely in the princes of Constantinople. And of these, Justinian was the first who, after a divorce of sixty years, regained the dominion of ancient Rome, and asserted, by the right of conquest, the august title of emperor of the Romans. A motive of vanity or discontent solicited one of his successors, Constan the Second, to abandon the Thracian Bosphorus, and to restore the pristine honours of the Tiber. An extravagant project, exclaims the malicious Byzantine, as if he had despoiled a beautiful and blooming virgin, to enrich, or rather to expose, the deformity of a wrinkled and decrepit matron. But the sword of the Lombards opposed his settlement in Italy. He entered Rome not as a conqueror, but as a fugitive, and, after a visit of twelve days, he pillaged, and forever deserted, the ancient capital of the world. The final revolt and separation of Italy was accomplished about two centuries after the conquest of Justinian, and from his reign we may date the gradual oblivion of the Latin tongue. That legislator had composed his institutes, his code, and his pandects, in a language which he celebrates as the proper and public style of the Roman government the consecrated idiom of the palace and senate of Constantinople, of the camps and tribunals of the east. But this foreign dialect was unknown to the people and soldiers of the Asiatic provinces. It was imperfectly understood by the greater part of the interpreters of the laws and the ministers of the state. After a short conflict, nature and habit prevailed over the obsolete institutions of human power. For the general benefit of his subjects, Justinian promulgated his novels in the two languages. The several parts of his voluminous jurisprudence were successively translated. The original was forgotten, the version was studied, and the Greek, whose intrinsic merit deserved indeed the preference, obtained a legal as well as a popular establishment in the Byzantine monarchy. The birth and residence of succeeding princes estranged them from the Roman idiom. Tiberius by the Arabs, and Morris by the Italians, are distinguished as the first of the Greek Caesars, as the founders of a new dynasty and empire. The silent revolution was accomplished before the death of Heraclius, and the ruins of the Latin speech were darkly preserved in the terms of jurisprudence and the acclamations of the palace. After the restoration of the Western Empire by Charlemagne and the Othos, the names of Franks and Latins acquired an equal signification and extent, and these haughty barbarians asserted, with some justice, their superior claim to the language and dominion of Rome. They insulted the alien of the East, who had renounced the dress and idiom of Romans, and their reasonable practice will justify the frequent appellation of Greeks. But this contemptuous appellation was indignantly rejected by the prince and people to whom it was applied. Whatsoever changes had been introduced by the lapse of ages, they alleged a lineal and unbroken succession from Augustus and Constantine. And, in the lowest period of degeneracy and decay, the name of Romans adhered to the last fragments of the empire of Constantinople. While the government of the East was transacted in Latin, the Greek was the language of literature and philosophy. Nor could the masters of this rich and perfect idiom be tempted to envy the borrowed learning and imitative taste of their Roman disciples. After the fall of paganism, the loss of Syria and Egypt, 
and the extinction of the schools of Alexandria and Athens. The studies of the Greeks insensibly retired to some regular monasteries, and, above all, to the royal college of Constantinople, which was burnt in the reign of Leo the Asurian. In the pompous style of the age, the president of that foundation was named the son of science. His twelve associates, the professors in the different arts and faculties, were the twelve signs of the zodiac. A library of thirty-six thousand five hundred volumes was open to their inquiries, and they could show an ancient manuscript of Homer, on a roll of parchment one hundred and twenty feet in length, the intestines, as it was fabled, of a prodigious serpent. But the seventh and eighth centuries were a period of discord and darkness. The library was burnt, the college was abolished, the iconoclasts are represented as the foes of antiquity, and a savage ignorance and contempt of letters has disgraced the princes of the Heraclean and Isurian dynasties. In the ninth century we trace the first drawings of the restoration of science. After the fanaticism of the Arabs had subsided, the caliphs aspired to conquer the arts rather than the provinces of the empire. Their liberal curiosity rekindled the emulation of the Greeks, brushed away the dust from their ancient libraries, and taught them to know and reward the philosophers, whose labours had been hitherto repaid by the pleasure of study and the pursuit of truth. The Caesar Bardas, the uncle of Michael the Third, was the generous protector of letters a title which alone has preserved his memory and excused his ambition. A particle of the treasure of his nephew was sometimes diverted from the indulgence of vice and folly. A school was opened in the palace of Magnara, and the presence of Bardas excited the emulation of the masters and students. At their head was the philosopher Leo, archbishop of Thessalonica. His profound skill in astronomy and the mathematics was admired by the strangers of the East, and this occult science was magnified by vulgar credulity, which modestly supposes that all knowledge superior to its own must be the effect of inspiration or magic. At the pressing entreaty of the Caesar, his friend, the celebrated Photius, renounced the freedom of a secular and studious life, ascended the patriarchal throne, and was alternatively excommunicated and absolved by the synods of the East and West. By the confession even of priestly hatred, no art or science, except poetry, was foreign to this universal scholar, who was deep in thought, indefatigable in reading, and eloquent in diction. Whilst he exercised the office of Protosapthir, or captain of the guards, Photius was sent ambassador to the Caliph of Baghdad. The tedious hours of exile, perhaps of confinement, were beguiled by the hasty composition of his library, a living monument of erudition and criticism. Two hundred and fourscore writers, historians, orators, philosophers, theologians, are reviewed without any regular method. He abridges their narrative or doctrine, appreciates their style and character, and judges even the fathers of the church with a discreet freedom which often breaks through the superstition of the times. The Emperor Basil, who lamented the defects of his own education, entrusted to the care of Photius, his son and successor, Leo the philosopher, and the reign of that prince and of his son Constantine Porphogenitus forms one of the most prosperous eras of the Byzantine literature. By their munificence the treasures of antiquity were deposited in the imperial library, by their pens, or those of their associates, they were imparted in such extracts and abridgments as might amuse the curiosity, without oppressing the indolence of the public. Besides the basilics, or codes of law, the arts of husbandry and war, of feeding or destroying the human species, were propagated with equal diligence. And the history of Greece and Rome was digested into fifty-three heads or titles, of which two only, of embassies and of virtues and vices, have escaped the injuries of time. In every station, the reader might contemplate the image of the past world, apply the lesson or warning of each page, and learn to admire, perhaps to imitate, the examples of a brighter period. 
I shall not expatiate on the works of the Byzantine Greeks, who, by the assiduous study of the ancients, have deserved, in some measure, the remembrance and gratitude of the moderns. The scholars of the present age may still enjoy the benefit of the philosophical commonplace book of Stobius, the grammatical and historical lexicon of Suidas, the Kiliads of Testes, which comprise six hundred narratives into twelve thousand verses, and the commentaries on Homer of Eustathius, Archbishop of Thessalonica, who, from his horn of plenty, has poured the names and authorities of four hundred writers. From these originals, and from the numerous tribe of scholiasts and critics, some estimate may be formed of the literary wealth of the twelfth century. Constantinople was enlightened by the genius of Homer and Demosthenes, of Aristotle and Plato, and in the enjoyment or neglect of our present riches, we must envy the generation that could still peruse the history of Thermopus, the orations of Hypades, the comedies of Menander, and the odes of Alcius and Sappho. The frequent labour of illustration attests not only the existence but the popularity. The general knowledge of the age may be deduced from the example of two learned females, the Empress Eudocia and the Princess Anna Comnena, who cultivated in the purple the arts of rhetoric and philosophy. The vulgar dialect of the city was gross and barbarous. A more correct and elaborate style distinguished the discourse. Or at least the compositions of the church and palace, which sometimes affected to copy the purity of the Attic models. In our modern education, the painful though necessary attainment of two languages, which are no longer living, may consume the time and damp the ardor of the youthful student. The poets and orators were long imprisoned in the barbarous dialects of our western ancestors, devoid of har- devoid of harmony or grace. And their genius, without precept or example, was abandoned to the rural and native powers of their judgment and fancy. But the Greeks of Constantinople, after purging away the impurities of their vulgar speech, acquired the free use of their ancient language, the most happy composition of human art, and a familiar knowledge of the sublime masters who had pleased or instructed the first of nations. But these advantages only tend to aggravate the reproach and shame of a degenerate people. They held in their lifeless hands the riches of their fathers, without inheriting the spirit which had created and improved that sacred patrimony. They read, they praised, they complied, but their languid souls seemed alike incapable of thought and action. In the revolution of ten centuries. Not a single discovery was made to exalt the dignity or promote the happiness of mankind. Not a single idea has been added to the speculative systems of antiquity. And a succession of patient disciples became, in their turn, the dogmatic teachers of the next servile generation. Not a single composition of history, philosophy, or literature has been saved from oblivion by the intrinsic beauties of style or sentiment, of original fancy. Or even of successful imitation. In prose, the least offensive of the Byzantine writers are absolved from censure by their naked and unpresuming simplicity. But the orators, most eloquent in their own conceit, are the furthest removed from the models whom they affect to emulate. In every page, our taste and reason are wounded by the choice of gigantic and obsolete words, a stiff and intricate phraseology. The discord of images, the childish play of false or unseasonable ornament, and the painful attempt to elevate themselves, to astonish the reader, and to evolve a trivial meaning in the smoke of obscurity and exaggeration. Their prose is soaring to the vicious affectation of poetry. Their poetry is sinking below the flatness and insipidity of prose. The tragic, epic, and lyric muses were silent and inglorious. The bards of Constantinople seldom rose above a riddle or epigram, a panegyric or tale. They forgot even the rules of prosody, and with the melody of Homer yet sounding in their ears, they confounded all measure of feet and syllables in the impotent strains which have received the name of political or city verses. 
the minds of the Greek were bound in the fetters of a base and imperious superstition, which extends her dominion round the circle of profane science. Their understandings were bewildered in metaphysical controversy. In the belief of visions and miracles, they had lost all principles of moral evidence, and their taste was vitiates by the homilies of the monks, an absurd melody of declamation and scripture. Even these contemptible studies were no longer dignified by the abuse of superior talents. The leaders of the Greek church were humbly content to admire and copy the oracles of antiquity, nor did the schools of pulpit produce any rivals of the fame nor did the schools of pulpit produce any rifles of the fame of Athanasius and Chrysostom. In the pursuits of active and speculative life, the emulation of states and individuals is the most powerful spring of the efforts and improvements of mankind. The cities of ancient Greece were cast in the happy mixture of union and independence, which is repeated on a larger scale, but in a looser form, by the nations of modern Europe. The union of language, religion, and manners, which renders them spectators and judges of each other's merit. The independence of government and interest, which asserts their separate freedom, and excites them to strive for preeminence in the career of glory. The situation of the Romans was less favourable, yet in the early ages of the Republic, which fixed the national character, a similar emulation was kindled among the states of Latium and Italy and in the arts and science, they aspired to equal or surpass their Grecian masters. The empire of the Caesars undoubtedly checked the activity and progress of the human mind. Its magnitude might indeed allow some scope for domestic competition. But when it was gradually receded, at first to the east, and at last to Greece and Constantinople, the Byzantine subjects were degraded to an abject and languid temper the natural effect of their solitary and insulated state. From the north they were oppressed by nameless tribes of barbarians, to whom they scarcely imparted the appellation of man. The language and religion of the more polished Arabs was an insurmountable bar to all social intercourse. The conquerors of Europe were their brethren in the Christian faith, but the speech of the Franks or Latins was unknown, their manners were rude, and they were rarely connected, in peace or war, with the successors of Heraclius. Alone in the universe, the self-satisfied pride of the Greeks was not disturbed by the comparison of foreign merit, and it is no wonder if they fainted in the race, since they had neither competitors to urge their speed, nor judges to crown their victory. The nations of Europe and Asia were mingled by the expeditions to the Holy Land, and it is under the Comnenian dynasty that a faint emulation of knowledge and military virtue. Origin and Doctrine of the Paletians, the Persecution by the Greek Emperors, Revolt in Armenia, etc., Transplantation into Thrace, Propagation in the West, The Seeds, Character, and Consequences of the Reformation. In the profession of Christianity, the variety of national characters may be clearly distinguished. The natives of Syria and Egypt abandoned their lives to lazy and contemplative devotion. Rome again aspired to the dominion of the world, and the wit of the lively and loquacious Greeks was consumed in the disputes of metaphysical theology. The incomprehensible mysteries of the Trinity and Incarnation, instead of commanding their silent submission, were agitated in vehement and subtle controversies, which enlarged their faith at the expense, perhaps, of their charity and reason. From the Council of Nice to the end of the 7th century, the peace and unity of the Church was invaded by these spiritual wars, and so deeply did they affect the decline and fall of the Empire that the historian has too often been compelled to attend the synods, to explore the creeds, and to enumerate the sects of this busy period of ecclesiastical annals. From the beginning of the 8th century to the last stages of the Byzantine Empire, the sound of controversy was seldom heard. Curiosity was exhausted, zeal was fatigued, and in the decrees of six councils the articles of the Catholic faith had been irrevocably defined. The spirit of dispute, however vain and pernicious, requires some energy and exercise of the mental faculties, and the prostrate Greeks were content to fast, to pray, 
and to believe in blind obedience to the patriarch and his clergy. During a long dream of superstition, the Virgin and the saints, their visions and miracles, their relics and images, were preached by the monks and worshipped by the people, and the appellation of people might be extended without injustice to the first ranks of civil society. At an unseasonable moment, the Isaurian emperors attempted somewhat rudely to awaken their subjects. Under their influence, reason might obtain some proselytes. A far greater number was swayed by interest or fear. But the Eastern world embraced or deplored their visible deities, and the restoration of images was celebrated as the Feast of Orthodoxy. In this passive and unanimous state, the ecclesiastical rulers were relieved from the toil or deprived of the pleasure of persecution. The pagans had disappeared, the Jews were silent and obscure, the disputes with the Latins were rare and remote hostilities against a national enemy, and the sects of Egypt and Syria enjoyed a free toleration under the shadow of the Arabian caliphs. About the middle of the seventh century, a branch of Manichaeans was selected as the victims of spiritual tyranny. Their patience was at length exasperated to despair and rebellion, and their exile has scattered over the West the seeds of reformation. These important events will justify some inquiry into the doctrine and story of the Paulicians, and as they cannot plead for themselves, our candid criticism will magnify the good and abate or suspect the evil that is reported by their adversaries. The Gnostics, who had distracted the infancy, were oppressed by the greatness and authority of the Church. Instead of emulating or surpassing the wealth, learning, and numbers of the Catholics, their obscure remnant was driven from the capitals of the East and West, and confined to the villages and mountains along the borders of the Euphrates. Some vestige of the Marcionites may be detected in the 5th century, but the numerous sects were finally lost in the odious name of the Manichaeans, and these heretics, who presumed to reconcile the doctrines of Zoroaster and Christ, were pursued by the two religions with equal and unrelenting hatred. Under the grandson of Heraclius, in the neighborhood of Samosoda, more famous for the birth of Lucian than for the title of a Syrian kingdom, a reformer arose, esteemed by the Paulicians as the chosen messenger of truth. In his humble dwelling of Mananalus, Constantine entertained a deacon who returned from Syrian captivity and received the inestimable gift of the New Testament which was already concealed from the vulgar by the prudence of the Greek, and perhaps of the Gnostic clergy. These books became the measure of his studies and the rule of his faith, and the Catholics, who dispute his interpretation, acknowledge that his text was genuine and sincere. But he attached himself with particular devotion to the writings and character of St. Paul. The name of the Paulicians is derived by their enemies from some unknown and domestic teacher, but I am confident that they gloried in their affinity to the apostle of the Gentiles. His disciples, Titus, Timothy, Silvanus, Tychicus, were represented by Constantine and his fellow laborers. The names of the apostolic churches were applied to the congregations which they assembled in Armenia and Cappadocia, and this innocent allegory revived the example and memory of the first ages. In the Gospel and the Epistles of St. Paul, his faithful follower investigated the creed of primitive Christianity, and whatever might be the success, the Protestant reader will applaud the spirit of the inquiry. But if the scriptures of the Paulicians were pure, they were not perfect. Their founders rejected the two epistles of St. Peter, the Apostle of the Circumcision, whose dispute with their favorite for the observance of the law could not easily be forgiven. They agree with their Gnostic brethren in the universal contempt for the Old Testament, the Book of Moses and the Prophets, which have been consecrated by the decrees of the Catholic Church. With equal boldness, and doubtless with more reason, Constantine, the new Sylvanus, disclaimed the visions which, in so many bulky and splendid volumes, had been published by the Oriental sects, the fabulous productions of the Hebrew patriarchs and the sages of the East. The spurious gospels, epistles, and acts, which in the first age had overwhelmed the orthodox code, 
the theology of Manus and the authors of the kindred heresies, and the thirty generations or eons which had been created by the fruitful fancy of Valentine. The Paulicians sincerely condemned the memory and opinions of the Manichaean sect, and complained of the injustice which imprisoned that invidious name on the simple votaries of St. Paul and of Christ. Of the ecclesiastical chain, many links had been broken by the Paulician reformers, and their liberty was enlarged as they reduced the number of masters at whose voice profane reason must bow to mystery and miracle. The early separation of the Gnostics had preceded the establishment of the Catholic worship, and against the gradual innovations of discipline and doctrine, they were strongly guarded by habit and aversion, as by the silence of St. Paul and the Evangelists. The objects which had been transformed by the magic of superstition appeared to the eyes of the Paulicians in their genuine and naked colors. An image made without hands was the common workmanship of a mortal artist to whose skill alone the wood and canvas must be indebted for their merit or value. The miraculous relics were a heap of bones and ashes, destitute of life or virtue, or of any relation, perhaps, with the person to whom they were ascribed. The true and vivifying cross was a piece of sound or rotten timber, the body and blood of Christ, a loaf of bread and a cup of wine, the gifts of nature and the symbols of grace. The mother of God was degraded from her celestial honors and immaculate virginity, and the saints and angels were no longer solicited to exercise the laborious office of meditation in heaven and ministry upon earth. In the practice, or at least in the theory, of the sacraments, the Paulicians were inclined to abolish all visible objects of worship, and the words of the gospel were, in their judgment, the baptism and communion of the faithful. They indulged a convenient latitude for the interpretation of Scripture, and as often as they were pressed by the literal sense, they could escape to the intricate mazes of figure and allegory. Their utmost diligence must have been employed to dissolve the connection between the Old and the New Testament, since they adored the latter as the oracles of God, and abhorred the former as the fabulous and absurd invention of men or demons. We cannot be surprised that they should have found in the gospel the orthodox mystery of the Trinity, but instead of confessing the human nature and substantial sufferings of Christ, they amused their fancy with a celestial body that passed through the Virgin like water through a pipe, with a fantastic crucifixion that eluded the vain and important malice of the Jews. A creed thus simple and spiritual was not adapted to the genius of the times, and the rational Christian, who might have been contented with the light yoke and easy burden of Jesus and his apostles, was justly offended that the Paulicians should dare to violate the unity of God, the first article of natural and revealed religion. Their belief and their trust was in the Father, of Christ, of the human soul, and of the invisible world. But they likewise held the eternity of matter, a stubborn and rebellious substance, the origin of a second principle of an active being who has created this visible world and exercises his temporal reign till the final consummation of death and sin. The appearances of moral and physical evil had established the two principles in the ancient philosophy and religion of the East, from whence this doctrine was transfused to the various swarms of the Gnostics. A thousand shades may be devised in the nature and character of Ariman, from a rival god to a subordinate demon, from passion and frailty to pure and perfect malevolence. But, in spite of our efforts, the goodness and the power of Ormuz are placed at the opposite extremities of the line, and every step that approaches the one must recede in equal proportion from the other. The apostolic labors of Constantine Sylvanus soon multiplied the number of his disciples, the secret recompense of spiritual ambition. The remnant of the Gnostic sects, and especially the Manichaeans of Armenia, were united under his standard. Many Catholics were converted or seduced by his arguments, and he preached with success in the regions of Pontus and Cappadocia, 
which had long since imbibed the religion of Zoroaster. The Paulician teachers were distinguished only by their scriptural names, by the modest title of fellow pilgrims, by the austerity of their lives, their zeal or knowledge, and the credit of some extraordinary gifts of the Holy Spirit. But they were incapable of desiring, or at least of obtaining, the wealth and honors of the Catholic prelacy. Such anti-Christian pride they bitterly censured, and even the ranks of elders or presbyters was condemned as an institution of the Jewish synagogue. The new sect was loosely spread over the provinces of Asia Minor to the westward of the Euphrates. Six of their principal congregations represented the churches to which St. Paul had addressed his epistles, and their founder chose his residence in the neighborhood of Colonia, in the same district of Pontus which had been celebrated by the altars of Bologna and the miracles of Gregory. After a mission of twenty-seven years, Sylvanus, who had retired from the tolerating government of the Arabs, fell a sacrifice to Roman persecution. The laws of the pious emperors, which seldom touched the lives of less odious heretics, proscribed without mercy or disguise the tenets, the books, and the persons of the Montanists and Manichaeans. The books were delivered to the flames, and all who should presume to secrete such writings or to profess such opinions were devoted to an ignominious death. A Greek minister, armed with legal and military powers, appeared at Colonia to strike the shepherd and to reclaim, if possible, the lost sheep. By a refinement of cruelty, Simeon placed the unfortunate Sylvanus before a line of his disciples, who were commanded, as the price of their pardon and the proof of their repentance, to massacre their spiritual father. They turned aside from the impious office. The stones dropped from their filial hands, and of the whole number, only one executioner could be found, a new David, as he is styled by the Catholics, who boldly overthrew the giant of heresy. This apostate, Justin was his name, again deceived and betrayed his unsuspecting brethren, and a new conformity to the Acts of St. Paul may be found in the conversion of Simeon. Like the apostle, he embraced the doctrine which he had been sent to persecute, renounced his honors and fortunes, and required among the Paulicians the fame of a missionary and a martyr. They were not ambitious of martyrdom, but in a calamitous period of 150 years, their patience sustained whatever zeal could inflict, and power was insufficient to eradicate the obstinate vegetation of fanaticism and reason. From the blood and ashes of the first victims, a succession of teachers and congregations repeatedly arose. Amidst their foreign hostilities, they found leisure for domestic quarrels. They preached, they disputed, they suffered. And the virtues, the apparent virtues, of Sergius, in a pilgrimage of thirty-three years, are reluctantly confessed by the orthodox historians. The native cruelty of Justinian II was stimulated by a pious cause and he vainly hoped to extinguish, in a single conflagration, the name and memory of the Paulicians. By their primitive simplicity, their abhorrence of popular superstition, the iconoclast princes might have been reconciled to some erroneous doctrines, but they themselves were exposed to the calumnies of the monks, and they chose to be the tyrants, lest they should be accused as the accomplices of the Manichaeans. Such a reproach has sullied the clemency of Nicephorus, who relaxed in their favor the severity of the penal statutes, nor will his character sustain the honor of a more liberal motive. The feeble Michael I, the rigid Leo the Armenian, were foremost in the race of persecution, but the prize must doubtless be adjudged to the sanguinary devotion of Theodora who restored the images to the Oriental Church. Her inquisitors explored the cities and mountains of the Lesser Asia, and the flatterers of the Empress have affirmed that, in a short reign, one hundred thousand Paulicians were extirpated by the sword, the gibbet, or the flames. 
Her guilt or merit has perhaps been stretched beyond the measure of truth, but if the account be allowed, it must be presumed that many simple iconoclasts were punished under a more odious name, and that some who were driven from the church unwillingly took refuge in the bosom of heresy. The most furious and desperate of rebels are the sectaries of a religion long persecuted and at length provoked. In a holy cause they are no longer susceptible of fear or remorse. The justice of their arms hardens them against the feelings of humanity, and they revenge their father's wrongs on the children of their tyrants. Such have been the Hussites of Bohemia and the Calvinists of France, and such in the ninth century were the Paulicians of Armenia and the adjacent provinces. They were first awakened to the massacre of a governor and bishop who exercised the imperial mandate of converting or destroying the heretics, and the deepest recesses of Mount Argaeus protected their independence and revenge. A more dangerous and consuming flame was kindled by the persecution of Theodora and the revolt of Carbaeus, a valiant Paulician who commanded the guards of the general of the East. His father had been impaled by the Catholic inquisitors, and religion, or at least nature, might justify his desertion and revenge. Five thousand of his brethren were united by the same motives. They renounced the allegiance of anti-Christian Rome, a Saracen emir introduced Carbaeus to the caliph, and the commander of the faithful extended his scepter to the implacable enemy of the Greeks. In the mountains between Siwas and Trebizond, he founded or fortified the city of Tefrica, which is still occupied by a fierce or licentious people, and the neighboring hills were covered with the Paulician fugitives, who now reconciled the use of the Bible and the sword. During more than thirty years, Asia was afflicted by the calamities of foreign and domestic war. In their hostile inroads, the disciples of St. Paul were joined with those of Mohammed, and the peaceful Christians, the aged parent and tender virgin, who were delivered into barbarous servitude, might justly accuse the intolerant spirit of their sovereign. So urgent was the mischief, so intolerable the shame, that even the dissolute Michael, the son of Theodora, was compelled to march in person against the Paulicians. He was defeated under the walls of Samosota, and the Roman emperor fled before the heretics whom his mother had condemned to the flames. The Saracens fought under the same banner, but the victory was ascribed to Carbaeus, and the captive generals, with more than a hundred tribunes, were either released by his avarice or tortured by his fanaticism. The valor and ambition of Chrysocheir, his successor, embraced a wider circle of rapine and revenge. In alliance with his faithful Moslems, he boldly penetrated into the heart of Asia, the troops of the frontier and the palace were repeatedly overthrown. The edicts of persecution were answered by the pillage of Nice and Nicomedia, of Ancyra and Ephesus. Nor could the Apostle St. John protect from violation his city and sepulchre. The cathedral of Ephesus was turned into a stable for mules and horses, and the Paulicians vied with the Saracens in their contempt and abhorrence of images and relics. It is not unpleasing to observe the triumph of rebellion over the same despotism which had disdained the prayers of an injured people. The Emperor Basil, the Macedonian, was reduced to sue for peace, to offer a ransom for the captives, and to request, in the language of moderation and charity, that Chrysocheir would spare his fellow Christians, and content himself with a royal donative of gold and silver and silk garments. If the emperor, replied the insolent fanatic, be desirous of peace, let him abdicate the east and reign without molestation in the west. If he refuse, the servants of the Lord will precipitate him from the throne. The reluctant Basil suspended the treaty, accepted the defiance, and led his army into the land of heresy, which he wasted with fire and sword. The open country of the Paulicians was exposed to the same calamities which they had inflicted. But when he had explored the strength of Tefrica, the multitude of the barbarians, and the ample magazine of arms and provisions, he desisted with a sigh from the hopeless siege. On his return to Constantinople, 
he labored, by the foundation of convents and churches, to secure the aid of his celestial patrons, of Michael the Archangel and the prophet Elijah, and it was his daily prayer that he might live to transpierce, with three arrows, the head of his impious adversary. Beyond his expectation, the wish was accomplished. After a successful inroad, Chrysokir was surprised and slain in his retreat, and the rebel's head was triumphantly presented at the foot of the throne. On the reception of this welcome trophy, Basil instantly called for his bow, discharged three arrows with unerring aim, and accepted the applause of the court, who hailed the victory of the royal archer. With Chrysokir, the glory of the Paletians faded and withered. On the second expedition of the emperor, the impregnable Tefrique was deserted by the heretics, who sued for mercy or escaped to the borders. The city was ruined, but the spirit of independence survived in the mountains. The Paulicians defended, above a century, their religion and liberty, infested the Roman limits, and maintained their perpetual alliance with the enemies of the empire and the About the middle of the 8th century, Constantine, surnamed Capronimus by the worshippers of images, had made an expedition into Armenia, and found in the cities of Melitene and Theodosiopolis a great number of Paulicians, his kindred heretics. As a favor or punishment, he transplanted them from the banks of the Euphrates to Constantinople and Thrace, and by this emigration their doctrine was introduced and diffused in Europe. If the sectaries of the metropolis were soon mingled with the promiscuous mass, those of the country struck a deep root in a foreign soil. The Paulicians of Thrace resisted the storms of persecution, maintained a secret correspondence with their Armenian brethren, and gave aid and comfort to their preachers, who solicited, not without success, the infant faith of the Bulgarians. In the tenth century they were restored and multiplied by a more powerful colony, which John Zemiscus transported from the Chalibian hills to the valleys of Mount Hamas. The Oriental clergy, who would have preferred the destruction, impatiently sighed for the absence of the Manichaeans. The warlike emperor had felt and esteemed their valor. Their attachment to the Saracens was pregnant with mischief, but on the side of the Danube against the barbarians of Scythia, their service might be useful and their loss would be desirable. Their exile in a distant land was softened by a free toleration. The Paulicians held the city of Philippopolis and the keys of Thrace. The Catholics were their subjects, the Jacobite emigrants their associates. They occupied a line of villages and castles in Macedonia and Epirus, and many native Bulgarians were associated to the communion of arms and heresy. As long as they were awed by power and treated with moderation, their voluntary bands were distinguished in the armies of the empire, and the courage of these dogs, ever greedy of war, ever thirsty of human blood, is noticed with astonishment, and almost with reproach, by the pusillanimous Greeks. The same spirit rendered them arrogant and contumacious. They were easily provoked by caprice or injury, and their privileges were often violated by the faithless bigotry of the government and clergy. In the midst of the Norman War, 2,500 Manichaeans deserted the standard of Alexius Comnenus and retired to their native homes. He dissembled till the moment of revenge, invited the chiefs to a friendly conference, and punished the innocent and guilty by imprisonment, confiscation, and baptism. In an interval of peace, the emperor undertook the pious office of reconciling them to the church and state. His winter quarters were fixed at Philippopolis, and the thirteenth apostle, as he is styled by his pious daughter, consumed whole days and nights in theological controversy. His arguments were fortified, their obstinacy was melted, by the honors and rewards which he bestowed on the most eminent proselytes. And a new city, surrounded with gardens, enriched with immunities, and dignified with his own name, was founded by Alexius, for the residence of his vulgar converts. The important station of Philippopolis was wrested from their hands. The contumacious leaders were secured in a dungeon, or banished from their country, 
and their lives were spared by the prudence rather than the mercy of an emperor at whose command a poor and solitary heretic was burnt alive before the church of Santa Sophia. But the proud hope of eradicating the prejudices of a nation was speedily overturned by the invincible zeal of the Paulicians, who ceased to dissemble or refused to obey. After the departure and death of Alexius, they soon resumed their civil and religious laws. In the beginning of the thirteenth century, their pope or primate, a manifest corruption, resided on the confines of Bulgaria, Croatia, and Dalmatia, and governed by his vicars the filial congregations of Italy and France. From that era, a minute scrutiny might prolong and perpetuate the chain of tradition. At the end of the last age, the sect or colony still inhabited the valleys of Mount Hamus, where their ignorance and poverty were more frequently tormented by the Greek clergy than by the Turkish government. The modern Paulicians have lost all memory of their origin, and their religion is disgraced by the worship of the cross and the practice of bloody sacrifice which some captives have imported from the wilds of Tartary. In the West, the first teachers of the Manichaean theology had been repulsed by the people or suppressed by the prince. The favor and success of the Paulicians in the 11th and 12th centuries must be imputed to the strong, though secret, discontent which armed the most pious Christians against the Church of Rome. Her avarice was oppressive, her despotism odious. Less degenerate, perhaps, than the Greeks in the worship of saints and images, her innovations were more rapid and scandalous. She had rigorously defined and imposed the doctrine of transubstantiation. The lives of the Latin clergy were more corrupt, and the Eastern bishops might pass for the successors of the apostles if they were compared with the lordly prelates who wielded by turns the crozier, the scepter, and the sword. Three different roads might introduce the Paulicians into the heart of Europe. After the conversion of Hungary, the pilgrims who visited Jerusalem might safely follow the course of the Danube. In their journey and return they passed through Philippopolis, and the sectaries, disguising their name and heresy, might accompany the French or German caravans to their respective countries. The trade and dominion of Venice pervaded the coast of the Adriatic, and the hospitable republic opened her bosom to foreigners of every climate and religion. Under the Byzantine standard, the Paulicians were often transported to the Greek provinces of Italy and Sicily. In peace and war they freely conversed with strangers and natives, and their opinions were silently propagated in Rome, Milan, and the kingdoms beyond the Alps. It was soon discovered that many thousand Catholics of every rank and of either sex had embraced the Manichaean heresy, and the flames which consumed twelve canons of Orléans was the first act and the signal of persecution. The Bulgarians, a name so innocent in its origin, so odious in its application, spread their branches over the face of Europe. United in common hatred of idolatry in Rome, they were connected by a form of Episcopal and Presbyterian government. Their various sects were discriminated by some fainter or darker shades of theology, but they generally agreed in the two principles, the contempt of the Old Testament and the denial of the body of Christ, either on the cross or in the Eucharist. A confession of simple worship and blameless manners is extorted from their enemies, and so high was their standard of perfection that the increasing congregations were divided into two classes of disciples, of those who practiced and of those who aspired. It was in the country of the Albigeois, in the southern provinces of France, that the Paulicians were most deeply implanted, and the same vicissitudes of martyrdom and revenge which had been displayed in the neighborhood of the Euphrates were repeated in the 13th century on the banks of the Rhone. The laws of the eastern emperors were revived by Frederick II. The insurgents of Tefrique were represented by the barons and cities of Languedoc. Pope Innocent III surpassed the sanguinary fame of Theodora, it was in cruelty alone that her soldiers could equal the heroes of the Crusades, 
and the cruelty of her priests was far excelled by the founders of the Inquisition, an office more adapted to confirm than to refute the belief of an evil principle. The visible assemblies of the Paulicians, or Albigeois, were extirpated by fire and sword, and the bleeding remnant escaped by flight, concealment, or Catholic conformity. But the invincible spirit which they had kindled still lived and breathed in the Western world. In the state, in the church, and even in the cloister, a latent succession was preserved of the disciples of St. Paul, who protested against the tyranny of Rome, embraced the Bible as the rule of faith, and purified their creed from all the visions of the Gnostic theology. The struggles of Wycliffe in England, of Hus in Bohemia, were premature and ineffectual, but the names of Zwinglius, Luther, and Calvin are pronounced with gratitude as the deliverers of nations. A philosopher who calculates the degree of their merit and the value of their reformation will prudently ask from what articles of faith above or against our reason, they have enfranchised the Christians. For such enfranchisement is doubtless a benefit so far as it may be compatible with truth and piety. After a fair discussion, we shall rather be surprised by the timidity than scandalized by the freedom of our first reformers. With the Jews they adopted the belief and defense of all the Hebrew scriptures. With all their prodigies, from the Garden of Eden to the visions of the prophet Daniel, and they were bound, like the Catholics, to justify against the Jews the abolition of a divine law. In the great mysteries of the Trinity and Incarnation, the Reformers were severely orthodox. They freely adopted the theology of the four or the six first councils, and with the Athanasian Creed they pronounced the eternal damnation of all who did not believe the Catholic faith. Transubstantiation, the invisible change of the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ, is a tenet that may defy the power of argument and pleasantry. But instead of consulting the evidence of their senses, of their sight, their feeling, and their taste, the first Protestants were entangled in their own scruples, and awed by the words of Jesus in the institution of the sacrament. Luther maintained their corporeal, and Calvin a real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, and the opinion of Zwinglius that it is no more than a spiritual communion, a simple memorial, has slowly prevailed in the Reformed churches. But the loss of one mystery was amply compensated by the stupendous doctrines of original sin, redemption, faith, grace, and predestination, which have been strained from the epistles of St. Paul. These subtle questions had most assuredly been prepared by the fathers and schoolmen, but the final improvement in popular use may be attributed to the first reformers, who enforced them as the absolute and essential terms of salvation. Hitherto the weight of supernatural belief inclines against the Protestants, and many a sober Christian would rather admit that a wafer is God than that God is a cruel and capricious tyrant. Yet the services of Luther and his rivals are solid and important, and the philosopher must own his obligations to these fearless enthusiasts. 1. By their hands the lofty fabric of superstition, from the abuse of indulgences to the intercession of the Virgin, has been leveled with the ground. Myriads of both sexes of the monastic profession were restored to the liberty and labors of social life. A hierarchy of saints and angels, of imperfect and subordinate deities, were stripped of their temporal power and reduced to the enjoyment of celestial happiness. Their images and relics were banished from the church, and the credulity of the people was no longer nourished with the daily repetition of miracles and visions. The imitation of paganism was supplied by pure and spiritual worship of prayer and thanksgiving, the most worthy of man, the least unworthy of the deity. It only remains to observe whether such sublime simplicity be consistent with popular devotion, whether the vulgar, in the absence of all visible objects, will not be inflamed by enthusiasm, or insensibly subside in languor and indifference. 2. 
the chain of authority was broken, which restrains the bigot from thinking as he pleases, and the slave from speaking as he thinks. The popes, fathers, and councils were no longer the supreme and infallible judges of the world, and each Christian was taught to acknowledge no law but the scriptures, no interpreter but his own conscience. This freedom, however, was the consequence rather than the design of the Reformation. The patriot reformers were ambitious of succeeding the tyrants whom they had dethroned. They imposed with equal rigor their creeds and confessions. They asserted the right of the magistrate to punish heretics with death. The pious or personal animosity of Calvin prescribed in Servetus the guilt of his own rebellion, and the flames of Smithfield, in which he was afterwards consumed, had been kindled for the Anabaptists by the zeal of Cranmer. The nature of the tiger was the same, but he was gradually deprived of his teeth and fangs. A spiritual and temporal kingdom was possessed by the Roman pontiff. The Protestant doctors were subjects of an humble rank, without revenue or jurisdiction. His degrees were consecrated by the antiquity of the Catholic Church. Their arguments and disputes were submitted to the people, and their appeal to private judgment was accepted beyond their wishes by curiosity and enthusiasm. Since the days of Luther and Calvin, a secret reformation has been silently working in the bosom of the Reformed churches. Many weeds of prejudice were eradicated, and the disciples of Erasmus diffused a spirit of freedom and moderation. The liberty of conscience has been claimed as a common benefit and an alienable right. The free governments of Holland and England introduced the practice of toleration, and the narrow allowance of the laws has been enlarged by the prudence and humanity of the times. In the exercise, the mind has understood the limits of its powers, and the words and shadows that might amuse the child can no longer satisfy his manly reason. The volumes of controversy are overspread with cobwebs. The doctrine of a Protestant church is far removed from the knowledge or belief of its private members, and the forms of orthodoxy, the articles of faith, are subscribed with a sigh or a smile by the modern clergy. Yet the friends of Christianity are alarmed at the boundless impulse of inquiry and skepticism. The predictions of the Catholics are accomplished. The web of mystery is unraveled by the Armenians, Arians, and Socinians, whose number must not be computed from their separate congregations, and the pillars of revelation are shaken by those men who preserve the name without the substance of religion, who indulge the license with the Bulgarians, origin, migrations, and settlement of the Hungarians, their inroads in the east and west, the monarchy of Russia, geography and trade, wars of the Russians against the Greek Empire, conversion of the barbarians. Under the reign of Constantine, the grandson of Heraclius, the ancient barrier of the Danube, so often violated and so often restored, was irretrievably swept away by the new deluge of barbarians. Their progress was favored by the caliphs, their unknown and accidental auxiliaries. The Roman legions were occupied in Asia, and after the loss of Syria, Egypt, and Africa, the Caesars were twice reduced to the danger and disgrace of defending their capital against the Saracens. If, in the account of this interesting people, I have deviated from the strict and original line of my undertaking, the merit of the subject will hide my transgression, or solicit my excuse. In the East, in the West, in war, in religion, in science, in their prosperity, and in their decay, the Arabians pressed themselves on our curiosity. The first overthrow of the Church and Empire of the Greeks may be imputed to their arms, and the disciples of Mahomet still hold the civil and religious scepter of the Oriental world. But the same labor would be unworthily bestowed on the swarms of savages who, between the 7th and the 12th century, descended from the plains of Scythia, in transient inroad or perpetual emigration. Their names are uncouth, their origins doubtful, their actions obscure, their superstition was blind, their valor brutal, and the uniformity of their public and private lives was neither softened by innocence nor refined by policy. 
the majesty of the Byzantine throne, repelled and survived their disorderly attacks. The greater part of these barbarians has disappeared without leaving any memorial of their existence, and the despicable remnant continues, and may long continue, to groan under the dominion of a foreign tyrant. From the antiquities of one, Bulgarians, two, Hungarians, and three, Russians, I shall content myself with selecting such facts as yet deserve to be remembered. The conquest of the four Normans and the monarchy of the five Turks will naturally terminate in the memorable crusades to the Holy Land and the double fall of the city and empire of Constantine. 1. In his march to Italy, Theodoric the Ostrogoth had trampled on the arms of the Bulgarians. After this defeat, the name and the nation are lost during a century and a half, and it may be suspected that the same or a similar appellation was revived by strange colonies from the Boristenes, the Tanais, or the Volga. A king of the ancient Bulgaria bequeathed to his five sons a last lesson of moderation and concord. It was received as youth has ever received the counsels of age and experience. The five princes buried their father, divided his subjects and cattle, forgot his advice, separated from each other, and wandered in quest of fortune, till we find the most adventurous in the heart of Italy, under the protection of the exarch of Ravenna. But the stream of emigration was directed or impelled towards the capital. In the modern Bulgaria, along the southern banks of the Danube, was stamped with the name and image which it has retained to the present hour. The new conquerors successively acquired, by war or treaty, the Roman provinces of Dardania, Thessaly, and the two Epirus. The ecclesiastical superiority was translated from the native city of Justinian, and, in their prosperous age, the obscure town of Lucnidus, or Acrida, was honored with the throne of a king and a patriarch. The unquestionable evidence of language attests the descent of the Bulgarians from the original stock of the Sclavonian, or more properly Slavonian race, and the kindred bands of Serbians, Mosnians, Raskians, Croatians, Wallachians, etc., followed either the standard or the example of the leading tribe. From the Euxine to the Adriatic, in the state of captives or subjects or allies or enemies of the Greek Empire, they overspread the land, and the national appellation of the slaves has been degraded by chance or malice from the signification of glory to that of servitude. Among these colonies, the Croatians or Croats, who now attend the motions of an Austrian army, are the descendants of a mighty people, the conquerors and sovereigns of Dalmatia, the maritime cities, and of these the infant republic of Ragusa, implored the aid and instruction of the Byzantine court. They were advised by the magnanimous Basil to reserve a small acknowledgment of their fidelity to the Roman Empire, and to appease, by an annual tribute, the wrath of these irresistible barbarians. The kingdom of Croatia was shared by eleven Tsupans, or feudatory lords, and their united forces were numbered at sixty thousand horse and one hundred thousand foot. A long sea coast, indented with capacious harbors, covered with a string of islands, and almost in the sight of the Italian shores, disposed both the natives and strangers to the practice of navigation. The boats, or brigantines of the Croats, were constructed after the fashion of the old Liburnians. One hundred and eighty vessels may excite the idea of a respectable navy, but our seamen will smile at the allowance of ten or twenty or forty men for each of these ships of war. They were gradually converted to the more honorable service of commerce. Yet the Sclavonian pirates were still frequent and dangerous, and it was not before the close of the tenth century that the freedom and sovereignty of the Gulf were effectually vindicated by the Venetian Republic. The ancestors of these Dalmatian kings were equally removed from the use and abuse of navigation. They dwelt in the white Croatia, in the inland regions of Silesia and Little Poland, thirty days' journey, according to the Greek computation, from the Sea of Darkness. The glory of the Bulgarians was confined to a narrow scope both of time and place. In the ninth and tenth centuries, they reigned to the south of the Danube, but the more powerful nations that had followed their emigration repelled all return to the north and all progress to the west. 
yet in the obscure catalogue of their exploits, they might boast an honour which had hitherto been appropriated to the Goths, that of slaying in battle one of the successors of Augustus and Constantine. The Emperor Nicephorus had lost his fame in the Arabian. He lost his life in the Sclavonian War. In his first operations he advanced with boldness and success into the centre of Bulgaria, and burnt the royal court, which was probably no more than an edifice and a village of timber. But while he searched the spoil and refused all offers of treaty, his enemies collected their spirits and their forces. The passes of retreat were insuperably barred, and the trembling Nicephorus was heard to exclaim, Alas, alas, unless we could assume the wings of birds, we cannot hope to escape. Two days he waited his fate in the inactivity of despair. But on the morning of the third, the Bulgarians surprised the camp, and the Roman prince, with the great officers of the empire, were slaughtered in their tents. The body of Valens had been saved from insult, but the head of Nicephorus was exposed on a spear, and his skull, enchased with gold, was often replenished in the feasts of victory. The Greeks bewailed the dishonor of the throne, but they acknowledged the just punishment of avarice and cruelty. This savage cup was deeply tinctured with the manners of the Scythian wilderness, but they were softened before the end of the same century by a peaceful intercourse with the Greeks, the possession of a cultivated region, and the introduction of a Christian worship. The nobles of Bulgaria were educated in the schools and palace of Constantinople, and Simeon, a youth of the royal line, was instructed in the rhetoric of Demosthenes and the logic of Aristotle. He relinquished the profession of a monk for that of a king and warrior, and in his reign of more than forty years, Bulgaria assumed a rank among the civilized powers of the earth. The Greeks, whom he repeatedly attacked, derived a faint consolation from indulging themselves in the reproaches of perfidy and sacrilege. They purchased the aid of the pagan Turks, but Simon, in a second battle, redeemed the loss of the first, at a time when it was esteemed a victory to elude the arms of that formidable nation. The Serbians were overthrown, made captive and dispersed, and those who visited the country before the restoration could discover no more than fifty vagrants, without women or children, who exhorted a precarious subsistence of the chase. On classic ground, on the banks of Achelous, the Greeks were defeated. The horn was broken by the strength of the barbaric Hercules. He formed the siege of Constantinople, and, in a personal conference with the emperor, Simeon imposed the conditions of peace. They met with the most jealous precautions. The royal gallery was drawn close to an artificial and well-fortified platform, and the majesty of the purple was emulated by the pomp of the Bulgarian. Are you a Christian? said the humble Romanus. It is your duty to abstain from the blood of your fellow Christians. Has the thirst of riches seduced you from the blessings of peace? Sheathe your sword, open your hand, and I will satiate the utmost measure of your desires. The reconciliation was sealed by a domestic alliance. The freedom of trade was granted or restored. The first honours of the court were secured to the friends of Bulgaria, above the ambassadors of enemies or strangers, and her princes were dignified with the high and invidious title of Basileus, or emperor. But this friendship was soon disturbed. After the death of Simeon, the nations were again in arms. His feeble successors were divided and distinguished, and, in the beginning of the eleventh century, the second Basil, who was born in the purple, deserved the appellation of conqueror of the Bulgarians. His avarice was in some measure gratified by a treasure of four hundred thousand pounds sterling, that is, ten thousand pounds weight of gold, which he found in the palace of Lucnidus. His cruelty inflicted a cool and exquisite vengeance on fifteen thousand captives who had been guilty in the defense of their country. They were deprived of sight, but to one of each hundred a single eye was left, that he may conduct his blind century to the presence of their king. The king is said to have expired of grief and horror. The nation was awed by this terrible example. The Bulgarians were swept away from their settlements, and circumscribed within a narrow province. The surviving chiefs bequeathed to their children the advice of patience and the duty of revenge. 2. When the black swarm of Hungarians first hung over Europe, 
above nine hundred years after the Christian era, they were mistaken by fear and superstition for the Gog and Magog of the scriptures, the signs and forerunners of the end of the world. Since the introduction of letters, they have explored their own antiquities with a strong and laudable impulse of patriotic curiosity. The rational criticism can no longer be amused with a vain pedigree of Attila and the Huns, but they complain that their primitive records have perished in the thought of war, that the truth or fiction of their rustic songs is long since forgotten, and that the fragments of a crude chronicle must be painfully reconciled with the contemporary, though foreign intelligence of the imperial geographer. Magyar is the national and oriental denomination of the Hungarians, but among the tribes of Scythia, they are distinguished by the Greeks under the proper and peculiar name of Turks, as the descendants of the mighty people who had conquered and reigned from China to the Volga. The Pannonian colony preserved the correspondence of trade and amity with the eastern Turks on the confines of Persia, and after a separation of 350 years, the missionaries of the king of Hungary discovered and visited their ancient country near the banks of the Volga. They were hospitably entertained by a people of pagans and savages, who still bore the name of Hungarians, conversed in their native tongue, recollected the tradition of long-lost brethren, and listened with amazement to the marvellous tale of their new kingdom and religion. The seal of conversion was animated by the interest of consanguinity, and one of the greatest of their princes had formed the generous, though fruitless, design of replenishing the solitude of Pannonia by this domestic colony from the heart of Tartary. From this primitive country they were driven to the west by the tide of war and emigration, by the weight of the more distant tribes, who at the same time were fugitives and conquerors. Reason or fortune directed their course towards the frontiers of the Roman Empire. They halted in the usual stations along the banks of the great rivers, and in the territories of Moscow, Kiev, and Moldavia, some vestiges have been discovered of their temporary residence. In this long and various peregrination, they could not always escape the dominion of the stronger, and the purity of their blood was improved or sullied by the mixture of a foreign race. From the motive of compulsion or choice, several tribes of the Khazars were associated to the standard of their ancient vassals, introduced the use of a second language, and obtained by their superior renown the most honorable place in the front of battle. The military force of the Turks and their allies marched in seven equal and artificial divisions. Each division was formed of 30,857 warriors, and the proportions of women, children, and servants supposes and requires at least a million of emigrants. The public councils were directed by seven vaivods, or hereditary chiefs, but the experience of discord and weakness recommended the more simple and vigorous administration of a single person. The scepter, which had been declined by the modest Libedias, was granted to the birth or merit of Almus and his son Arpad, and the authority of the supreme Khan of the Khazars confirmed the engagement of the prince and people, or the people to obey his commands, or the prince to consult their happiness and glory. With this narrative we might be reasonably content. If the penetration of modern learning had not opened a new and larger prospect of the antiquities of nations, the Hungarian language stands alone, and as it were insulated, among the Sclavonian dialects, but it bears a close and clear affinity to the idioms of the Fenic race, of an obsolete and savage race which formerly occupied the northern regions of Asia and Europe. The genuine applications of Ugri or Igurs is found on the western confines of China. Their migrations to the banks of the Irtish is attested by Tatar evidence. A similar name and language are detected in the southern parts of Siberia, and the remains of the Fenic tribes are widely, though thinly scattered from the sources of the Obi to the shores of Lapland. The consanguinity of the Hungarians and Laplanders would display the powerful energy of climate on the children of a common parent. The lively contrast between the bold adventurers who are intoxicated with the wines of the Danube, and the wretched fugitives who are immersed beneath the snows of the polar circle. Arms and freedom have ever been the ruling, though too often the unsuccessful passions of the Hungarians, who are endowed by nature with a vigorous constitution of soul and body. 
extreme cold has diminished the stature and congealed the faculties of the Laplanders, and the Arctic tribes, alone among the sons of men, are ignorant of war and unconscious of human blood. A happy ignorance, if reason and virtue were the guardians of their peace. It is the observation of the imperial author of the tactics that all the Scythian hordes resemble each other in their pastoral and military life, that they all practice the same means of subsistence, and employed the same instruments of destruction. But he adds that the two nations of Bulgarians and Hungarians were superior to their brethren, and similar to each other in the improvements, however rude, of their discipline and government. Their visible likeness determines Leo to confound his friends and enemies in one common description, and the picture may be heightened by some strokes from their contemporaries in the 10th century. Except the merit and fame of military prowess, all that is valued by mankind appeared vile and contemptible to these barbarians, whose native fierceness was stimulated by the consciousness of numbers and freedom. The tents of the Hungarians were of leather, the garments of fur, they shaved their hair, and scarified their faces. In speech they were slow, in action prompt, in treaty perfidious, and they shared the common reproach of barbarians, too ignorant to conceive the importance of truth, too proud to deny or palliate the breach of the most solemn engagements. Their simplicity has been praised, yet they abstained only from the luxury that they had never known. Whatever they saw they coveted, their desires were insatiate, and their sole industry was the hand of violence and rapine. By the definition of a pastoral nation, I have recalled a long description of the economy, the warfare, and the government that prevail in that state of society. I may add that to fishing, as well as to the chase, the Hungarians were indebted for a part of their subsistence, and since they seldom cultivated the ground, they must, at least in their new settlements, have sometimes practiced a slight and unskillful husbandry. In their emigrations, perhaps in their expeditions, the host was accompanied by thousands of sheep and oxen, which increased the cloud of formidable dust, and afforded a constant and wholesale supply of milk and animal food. A plentiful command of forage was the first care of the general, and if the flocks and herds were secure of their pastures, the hardy warrior was alike insensible of danger and fatigue. The confusion of men and cattle that overspread the country exposed their camp to a nocturnal surprise had not the still wider circuit been occupied by their light cavalry, perpetually in motion to discover and delay the approach of the enemy. After some experience of the Roman tactics, they adopted the use of the sword and spear, the helmet of the soldier, and the iron breastplate of his steed. But their native and deadly weapon was the Tartar bow. From the earliest infancy their children and servants were exercised in the double science of archery and horsemanship. Their arm was strong, their aim was sure, and in the most rapid career they were taught to throw themselves backward and to shoot a volley of arrows into the air. In open combat, in secret ambush, in flight, in pursuit, they were equally formidable. An appearance of order was maintained in the foremost ranks, but their charge was driven forwards by the impatient pressure of succeeding crowds. They pursued, headlong and rash, with loosened reins and horrific outcries, but if they fled with real or dissembled fear, the ardor of a pursuing foe was checked and chastised by the same habits of irregular speed and sudden evolution. In the abuse of victory, they astonished Europe, yet smarting from the wounds of the Saracen and the Dane, mercy they rarely asked, and more rarely bestowed. Both sexes were accused is equally inaccessible to pity, and their appetite for raw flesh might countenance the popular tale that they drank the blood and feast on the hearts of the slain. Yet the Hungarians were not devoid of those principles of justice and humanity which nature has implanted in every bosom. The license of public and private injuries was restrained by laws and punishments, and in security of an open camp, theft is the most tempting and most dangerous offence. Among the barbarians there were many, whose spontaneous virtue supplied their laws and corrected their manners, who performed the duties and sympathized with the affections of social life. After a long pilgrimage of flight or victory, the Turkish hordes approached the common limits of the French and Byzantine empires. 
the first conquest and final settlement extended on either side of the Danube above Vienna, below Belgrade, and beyond the measure of the Roman province of Pannonia, or the modern kingdom of Hungary. That ample and fertile land was loosely occupied by the Moravians, a Sclavonian name and tribe, which were driven by the invaders into the compass of a narrow province. Charlemagne had stretched a vague and nominal empire as far as the edge of Transylvania, but, after the failure of his legitimate line, the dukes of Moravia forgot their obedience and tribute to the monarchs of Oriental France. The bastard Arnulf was provoked to invite the arms of the Turks. They rushed through the real or figurative wall, which his indiscretion had thrown open, and the king of Germany has been justly reproached as a traitor to the civil and ecclesiastical society of the Christians. During the life of Arnulf, the Hungarians were checked by gratitude of fear, but in the infancy of his son Louis, they discovered and invaded Bavaria, and such was their Scythian speed, that in a single day a circuit of fifty miles was stripped and consumed. In the Battle of Augsburg, the Christians maintained their advantage till the seventh hour of the day. They were deceived and vanquished by the flying stratagems of the Turkish cavalry. The conflagration spread over the provinces of Bavaria, Swabia, and Franconia, and the Hungarians promoted the reigns of anarchy by forcing the stoutest barons to discipline their vassals and fortify their castles. The origin of walled towns is ascribed to this calamitous period, nor could any distance be secure against an enemy who, almost at the same instance, laid in ashes the Helvetian monastery of St. Gaul and the city of Bremen on the shores of the northern ocean. Above thirty years the Germanic Empire, or kingdom, was subject to the ignominy of tribute, and resistance was disarmed by the menace, the serious and effectual menace of dragging the women and children into captivity, and of slaughtering the males above the age of ten years. I have neither power nor inclination to follow the Hungarians beyond the Rhine, but I must observe with surprise that the southern provinces of France were blasted by the tempest, and that Spain, behind her Pyrenees, was astonished at the approach of these formidable strangers. The vicinity of Italy had tempted their easy inroads, but from their camp on the Brenta they beheld with some terror the apparent strength and populousness of the new discovered country. They requested leave to retire, the request was proudly rejected by the Italian king, and the lives of twenty thousand Christians paid the forfeit of his obstinacy and rashness. Among the cities of the West, the royal Pavia was conspicuous in fame and splendor, and the pre-eminence of Rome itself was only derived from the relics of the apostles. The Hungarians appeared, Pavia was in flames, forty-three churches were consumed, and, after the massacre of the people, they spared about two hundred wretches who had gathered some bushels of gold and silver, a vague exaggeration, from the smoking ruins of their country. In these annual excursions from the Alps, to the neighborhood of Rome and Capua, the churches that yet escaped resounded with a fearful litany, O oh, save and deliver us from the arrows of the Hungarians. But the saints were deaf or inexorable, and the torrent rolled forwards, till it was stopped by the extreme lands of Calabria. A composition was offered and accepted for the head of each Italian subject, and ten bushels of silver were poured forth in the Turkish camp. But falsehood is a natural antagonist of violence, and the robbers were defrauded both in the numbers of the assessment and the standard of the metal. On the side of the east, the Hungarians were opposed in doubtful conflict by the equal arms of the Bulgarians, whose fate forbade an alliance with the pagans, and whose situation formed the barrier of the Byzantine Empire. The barrier was overturned. The emperor of Constantinople beheld the waving banners of the Turks, and one of their boldest warriors presumed to strike a battle-axe into the Golden Gate. The arts and treasures of the Greeks diverted their assault, but the Hungarians might boast, in their retreat, that they had imposed tribute on the spirit of Bulgaria and the majesty of the Caesars. The remote and rapid operations of the same campaign appear to magnify the power and numbers of the Turks, but their courage is most deserving of praise, since a light troop of three or four hundred horse would often attempt and execute the most daring inroads to the gates of Thessalonica and Constantinople. After this disastrous era of the ninth and tenth centuries, Europe was afflicted by a triple scourge from the north, the east, and the south. 
the Norman, the Hungarian, and the Saracen, sometimes trod the same ground of desolation, and these savage foes might have been compared by Homer to the two lions growling over the carcass of a mangled stag. The deliverance of Germany and Christendom was achieved by the Saxon princes, Henry the Fowler and Otto the Great, who, in two memorable battles, forever broke the power of the Hungarians. The valiant Henry was roused from a bed of sickness by the invasion of his country, but his mind was vigorous and his prudence successful. My companions, said he, on the morning of the combat, maintain your ranks, receive on your bucklers the first arrows of the pagans, and prevent their second discharge by the equal and rapid career of your lances. They obeyed and conquered, and the historical picture of the castle of Merseburg expressed the features, or at least the character of Henry, who, in an age of ignorance, entrusted to the finer arts the perpetuity of his name. At the end of twenty years, the children of the Turks, who had fallen by his sword, invaded the empire of his son, and their forces defined, in the lowest estimate, at one hundred thousand horse. They were invited by domestic faction, the gates of Germany were treacherously unlocked, and they spread, far beyond the Rhine and the Meuse, into the heart of Flanders. But the vigor and prudence of Otto dispelled the conspiracy. The princes were made sensible that unless they were true to each other, their religion and country were irrevocably lost, and the national powers were revived in the plains of Augsburg. They marched and fought in eight legions, according to the division of provinces and tribes, the first, second, and third were composed of Bavarians, the fourth of Franconians, the fifth of Saxons, under the immediate command of the monarch, the sixth and seventh consisted of Swabians, and the eighth legion, of a thousand Bohemians, closed the rear of the host. The resources of discipline and valor were fortified by the arts of superstition, which, on this occasion, may deserve the epithets of generous and salutary. The soldiers were purified with the fast, the camp was blessed with the relics of saints and martyrs, and the Christian hero, girded on his side the sword of Constantine, grasped the invincible spear of Charlemagne, and waved the banner of St. Morris, the prefect of the Tibian legion. But his firmest confidence was placed in the holy lance, whose point was fastened of the nails of the cross, and which his father had extorted from the king of Burgundy by the threats of war and the gift of a province. The Hungarians were expected in the front. They secretly passed the Lek, a river of Bavaria that falls into the Danube, turned the rear of the Christian army, plundered the baggage, and disordered the legion of Bohemia and Swabia. The battle was restored by the Franconians, whose duke, the valiant Conrad, was pierced with an arrow as he rested from his fatigues. The Saxons fought under the eyes of their king, and his victory surpassed, in merit and importance, the triumphs of the last two hundred years. The loss of the Hungarians was still greater in the flight than in the action. They were encompassed by the rivers of Bavaria, and their past cruelties excluded them from the hope of mercy. Three captive princes were hanged at Ratisbon, the multitude of prisoners was slain or mutilated, and the fugitives, who presumed to appear in the face of their country, were condemned to everlasting poverty and disgrace. Yet the spirit of the nation was humbled, and the most accessible passes of Hungary were fortified with a ditch and a rampart. Adversity suggested the counsels of moderation and peace. The robbers of the West acquiesced in a sedentary life, and the next generation was taught by a discerning prince that far more might be gained by multiplying and exchanging the produce of a fruitful soil. The native race, the Turkish or Fenic blood, was mingled with new colonies of Scythian or Sclavonian origin, Many thousands of robust and industrious captives had been imported from all countries of Europe, and after the marriage of Geisa with the Bavarian princes, he bestowed honors and estates on the nobles of Germany. The son of Geisa was invested with the regal title, and the house of Arpad reigned three hundred years in the kingdom of Hungary. But the freeborn barbarians were not dazzled by the luster of the diadem, and the people asserted their indefeasible right of choosing, deposing, and punishing the hereditary servant of the state. 3. The name of Russians was first divulged in the ninth century by an embassy of Theophilus, emperor of the east, to the emperor of the west, Louis, the son of Charlemagne. The Greeks were accompanied by the envoys of the great duke, or Chagon, 
or the Tsar, or the Russians. In their journey to Constantinople, they had traversed many hostile nations, and they hoped to escape the dangers of their return by requesting the French monarch to transport them by sea to their native country. A closer examination detected their origin. They were the brethren of the Swedes and Normans, whose name was already odious and formidable in France, and it might justly be apprehended that these Russian strangers were not the messengers of peace, but the emissaries of war. They were detained while the Greeks were dismissed, and Louis expected a more satisfactory account, that he might obey the law of hospitality or prudence, according to the interest of both empires. This Scandinavian origin of the people, or at least the princes, of Russia, may be confirmed and illustrated by the national annals and general history of the North. The Normans, who had so long been concealed by a veil of impenetrable darkness, suddenly burst forth in the spirit of naval and military enterprise. The vast, and, as it is said, the populous regions of Denmark, Sweden, and Norway, were crowded with independent chieftains and desperate adventurers, who sighed in the laziness of peace, and smiled in the agonies of death. Piracy was the exercise, the trade, the glory, and the virtue of the Scandinavian youth. Impatient of a bleak climate and narrow limits, they started from the banquet, grasped their arms, sounded their horn, ascended their vessels, and explored every coast that promised either spoil or settlement. The Baltic was the first scene of their naval achievements. They visited the eastern shores, the silent residents of Fenic and Sclavonic tribes, and the primitive Russians of the lake Ladoga paid a tribute, the skins of white squirrels, to these strangers, whom they saluted with the title of Varangians or Corsairs. Their superiority in arms, discipline and renown, commanded the fear and reverence of the natives. In their wars against the more inland savages, the Varangians condescended to serve as friends and auxiliaries, and gradually, by choice or conquest, obtained the dominion of a people whom they were qualified to protect. Their tyranny was expelled, their valor was again recalled, till at length Rurik, a Scandinavian chief, became the father of a dynasty, which reigned above seven hundred years. His brothers extended his influence. The example of service and usurpation was imitated by his companions in the southern provinces of Russia and their establishments, by the usual methods of war and assassination, were cemented into the fabric of a powerful monarchy. As long as the descendants of Rurik were considered as aliens and conquerors, they ruled by the sword of the Varangians, distributed estates and subjects to their faithful captains, and supplied their numbers with fresh streams of adventurers on the Baltic coast. But when the Scandinavian chiefs had struck a deep and permanent route into the soil, they mingled with the Russians in blood, religion, and language, and the first Vladimir had merit of delivering his country from these foreign mercenaries. They had seated him on the throne, his riches were insufficient to gratify their demands, but they listened to his pleasing advice that they should seek not a more grateful, but a more wealthy master, that they should embark for Greece, where, instead of skins of squirrels, silk and gold would be the recompense of their service. At the same time, the Russian prince admonished his Byzantine ally to disperse and employ, to recompense and restrain, these impetuous children of the north. Contemporary writers have recorded the introduction, name, and character of the Varangians. Each day they rose in confidence and esteem. The whole body was assembled at Constantinople to perform the duty of guards, and their strength was recruited by a numerous band of their countrymen from the island of Thule. On this occasion, the vague appellation of Thule is applied to England, and the new Varangians were a colony of English and Danes who had fled from the yoke of the Norman conqueror. The habits of pilgrimage and piracy had approximated the countries of the earth. These exiles were entertained in the Byzantine court, and they preserved, to the last stage of the empire, the inheritance of spotless loyalty and the use of the Danish or English tongue. With their broad, double-edged battle axes on their shoulders, they attended the Greek emperor to the temple, the senate, and the hippodrome. He slept and feasted under their trusty guard, and the keys of the palace, the treasury, and the capital were held by the firm and faithful hands of the Varangians. In the 10th century, the geography of Scythia was extended far beyond the limits of ancient knowledge, and the monarchy of the Russians obtained a vast and conspicuous place in the map of Constantine. 
the sons of Rurik were masters of the spacious province of Volodomir or Moscow, and, if they were confined on that side by the hordes of the east, their western frontier in those early days was enlarged to the Baltic Sea and the country of the Prussians. Their northern reign ascended above the sixtieth degree of latitude over the Hyperborean regions, which fancy had peopled with monsters or clouded with eternal darkness. To the south they followed the course of the Boristenes, and approached with that river the neighborhood of the Euxine Sea. The tribes that dwelt or wandered in this ample circuit were obedient to the same conqueror and insensibly blended into the same nation. The language of Russia is a dialect of the Sclavonian, but in the 10th century these two modes of speech were different from each other, and, as the Sclavonian prevailed in the south, it may be presumed that the original Russians of the north, the primitive subjects of the Varangian chiefs, were a portion of the Fenic race. With the emigration, union, or dissolution of the wandering tribes, the loose and indefinite picture of the Scythian desert has continually shifted. But the most ancient map of Russia affords some places which still retain their name and position, and the two capitals, Novgorod and Kiev, are coeval with the first age of the monarchy. Novgorod had not yet deserved the epithet of Great, nor the alliance of the Hanseatic League, which diffused the stream of opulence and the principles of freedom. Kiev could not yet boast of three hundred churches, an innumerable people, and a degree of greatness and splendor which was compared with Constantinople by those who had never seen the residence of the Caesars. In their religion, the two cities were no more than camps or fairs, the most convenient stations in which the barbarians might assemble for the occasional business of war or trade. Yet even these assemblies announced some progress in the art of society. A new breed of cattle was imported from the southern provinces, and the spirit of commercial enterprise pervaded the sea and land, from the Baltic to the Euxine, from the mouth of the Oder to the ports of Constantinople. In the days of idolatry and barbarism, the Sclavonic city of Julin was frequented and enriched by the Normans, who had prudently secured a free mart of purchase and exchange. From this harbour, at the entrance of the Oder, the corsair or merchant, sailed in forty-three days to the eastern shores of the Baltic. The most distant nations were intermingled, and the holy groves of Kurland is said to have been decorated with Grecian and Spanish gold. Between the sea and Novgorod, an easy intercourse was discovered, in the summer through a gulf, a lake, and a navigable river, in the winter season over the hard and level surface of boundless snows. From the neighborhood of that city, the Russians descended the streams that fall into the Boristenes. Their canoes, of a single tree, were laden with slaves of every age, furs of every species, the spoil of the beehives, and the hides of their cattle, and the whole produce of the north was collected and discharged into the magazines of Kiev. The month of June was the ordinary season of the departure of the fleet. The timber of the canoes was framed into the oars and benches of more solid and capacious boats, and they proceeded without obstacle down the Boristenes, as far as the seven or thirteen ridges of rocks which traverse the bed and precipitate the waters of the river. At the more shallow falls it was sufficient to lighten the vessels, but the deeper cataracts were impassable, and the mariners, who dragged their vessels and their slaves six miles over land, were exposed in this toilsome journey to the robbers of the desert. At the first island below the falls, the Russians celebrated the festival of their escape, at the second, near the mouth of the river, they repaired their shattered vessels for the longer and more perilous voyage of the Black Sea. If they steered along the coast, the Danube was accessible. With a fair wind, they could reach in thirty-six or forty hours the opposite shores of Anatolia, and Constantinople admitted the annual visit of the strangers of the north. They returned at the stated season with a rich cargo of corn, wine, and oil, the manufactures of Greece, and the spices of India. Some of their countrymen resided in the capital and provinces, and the national treaties protected the persons, effects, and privileges. But the same communication which had been opened for the benefit was soon abused for the injury of mankind. In a period of 190 years, the Russians made four attempts to plunder the treasures of Constantinople. The event was various, but the motive, the means, and the object were the same in these naval expeditions. The Russian traders had seen the magnificence and tasted the luxury of the city of the Caesars. A marvellous tale, 
and a scanty supply, excited the desires of their savage countrymen. They envied the gifts of nature which their climate denied. They coveted the works of art, which they were too lazy to imitate and too indigent to purchase. The Varangian princes unfurled the banners of piratical adventure, and their bravest soldiers were drawn from the nations that dwelt in the northern isles of the ocean. The image of their naval armaments was revived in the last century, in the fleets of the Cossacks, which issued from the Boristenes to navigate the same seas for a similar purpose. The Greek appellation of monoxyla, or single canoes, might justly be applied to the bottom of their vessels. It was scooped out of the long stem of a beech or willow, but the slight and narrow foundation was raised and continued on either side with planks, till it attained the length of sixty, and the height of about twelve feet. These boats were built without a deck, but with two rudders and a mast, to move with sails and oars, and to contain from forty to seventy men, with their arms, and provisions of fresh water and salt fish. The first trial of the Russians was made with two hundred boats, but when the national force was exerted, they might arm against Constantinople a thousand or twelve hundred vessels. Their fleet was not much inferior to the royal navy of Agamemnon, but it was magnified in the eyes of fear to ten or fifteen times the real proportion of its strength and numbers. Had the Greek emperors been endowed with foresight to discern and vigor to prevent, perhaps they might have sealed with a maritime force the mouth of the Boristenes. Their indolence abandoned the coast of Anatolia to the calamities of a piratical war, which, after an interval of six hundred years, again infested the Euxin, but as long as the capital was respected, the sufferings of a distant province escaped the notice both of the prince and the historian. The storm which had swept along from the Phasis and Trebizond at length burst on the Bosphorus of Thrace, a strait of fifteen miles, in which the rude vessels of the Russians might have been stopped and destroyed by a more skilful adversary. In their first enterprise, under the princes of Kiev, and occupied the port of Constantinople in the absence of the Emperor Michael, the son of Theophilus. Through a crowd of perils, he landed at the palace stairs, and immediately repaired to the church of the Virgin Mary. By the advice of the patriarch, her garment, a precious relic, was drawn from the sanctuary and dipped into the sea, and the seasonable tempest, which determined the retreat of the Russians, was devoutly ascribed to the Mother of God. The silence of the Greeks may inspire some doubt of the truth, or at least of the importance of the second attempt by Oleg, the guardian of the sons of Rurik. A strong barrier of arms and fortifications defended the Bosphorus. They were eluded by the usual expedient of drawing the boats over the isthmus, and this simple operation is described in the national chronicles, as if the Russian fleet had sailed over dry land with a brisk and favorable gale. The leader of the third armament, Igor, the son of Rurik, had chosen a moment of weakness and decay when the naval powers of the empire were employed against the Saracens. But if courage be not wanting, the instruments of defense are seldom deficient. Fifteen broken and decayed galleys were boldly launched against the enemy, but instead of the single tube of Greek fire, usually planted under prow, the sides and stern of each vessel were abundantly supplied with that liquid combustible. The engineers were dexterous, the weather was propitious. Many thousand Russians, who chose rather to be drowned than burnt, leaped into the sea, and those who escaped to the Thracian shore were inhumanly slaughtered by the peasants and soldiers. Yet one third of the canoes escaped into shallow water, and the next spring, Igor was again prepared to retrieve his disgrace and claim his revenge. After a long peace, Yaroslaus, the great grandson of Igor, resumed the same project of a naval invasion. A fleet under the command of his son was repulsed at the entrance of the Bosphorus by the same artificial flames. But in the rashness of pursuit, the vanguard of the Greeks was encompassed by an irresistible multitude of boats and men. Their provision of fire was probably exhausted, and twenty-four galleys were either taken, sunk, or destroyed. Yet the threats or calamities of Russian war were more frequently diverted by treaty than by arms. In these naval hostilities, every disadvantage was on the side of the Greeks. Their savage enemy afforded no mercy, 
his poverty promised no spoil, his impenetrable retreat deprived the conqueror of the hopes of revenge, and the pride or weakness of empire indulged in an opinion that no honor could be gained or lost in the intercourse with barbarians. At first their demands were high and inadmissible, three pounds of gold for each soldier or mariner of the fleet. The Russian youth adhered to the design of conquest and glory. But the counsels of moderation were recommended by the hoary sages. Be content, they said, with the liberal offers of Caesar. Is it not far better to obtain without a combat the possession of gold, silver, silks, and all the objects of our desires? Are we sure of victory? Can we conclude a treaty with the sea? We do not tread on the land. We float on the abyss of water, and a common death hangs over our heads. The memory of these arctic fleets that seemed to descend from the polar circle left a deep impression of terror on the imperial city. By the vulgar of angry rank, it was asserted and believed that an equestrian statue in the square of Taurus was secretly inscribed with the prophecy how the Russians, in the last days, should become masters of Constantinople. In our own time, a Russian armament, instead of sailing from the Boristenes, has circumnavigated the continent of Europe, and the Turkish capital has been threatened by a squadron of strong and lofty ships of war, each of which, with its naval signs and thundering artillery, could have sunk or scattered a hundred canoes, such as those of their ancestors. Perhaps the present generation may yet behold the accomplishment of the prediction, of a rare prediction, of which the style is unambiguous, and a date unquestionable. By land the Russians were less formidable than by sea, and as they fought for the most part on foot, their irregular legions must often have been broken and overthrown by the cavalry of the Scythian hordes. Yet their growing towns, however slight and imperfect, presented a shelter to the subject and a barrier to the enemy. The monarchy of Kiev, till a fatal partition, assumed the dominion of the north, and the nations from the Volga to the Danube were subdued or repelled by the arms of Svatoslaus, the son of Igor, the son of Oleg, the son of Rurik. The vigor of his mind and body was fortified by the hardships of a military and savage life. Wrapped in a bearskin, Svatoslaus usually slept on the ground, his head reclining on a saddle, his diet was coarse and frugal, and, like the heroes of Homer, his meat, it was often horse flesh, was broiled or roasted on the coals. The exercise of war gave stability and discipline to his army, and it may be presumed that no soldier was permitted to transcend the luxury of his chief. By an embassy from Nikephorus, the Greek emperor, he was moved to undertake the conquest of Bulgaria, and a gift of 1,500 pounds of gold was laid at his feet to defray the expense or reward the toils of the expedition. An army of 60,000 men was assembled and embarked, they sailed from the Boristenes to the Danube, the landing was effected on the Messian shore, and, after a sharp encounter, the swords of the Russians prevailed against the arrows of the Bulgarian horse. The vanquished king sunk into his grave, his children were made captive, and his dominions, as far as Mount Hamus, were subdued or ravaged by the northern invaders. But instead of relinquishing his prey, and performing his engagements, the Varangian prince was more disposed to advance than to retire, and, had his ambition been crowned with success, the seat of empire in that early period might have been transferred to a more temperate and fruitful climate. Svatoslaus enjoyed and acknowledged the advantages of his new position, in which he could unite, by exchange or rapine, the various productions of the earth. By an easy navigation he might draw from Russia the native commodities of furs, wax, and hydromel. Hungary supplied him with a breed of horses and the spoils of the West, and Greece abounded with gold, silver, and foreign luxuries, which his poverty had affected to disdain. The bands of Patsnazites, Khosars, and Turks repaired to the standard of victory, and the ambassador of Nikephorus betrayed his trust, assumed the purple, and promised to share with his new allies the treasures of the Eastern world. From the banks of the Danube the Russian prince pursued his march as far as Adrianople. A formal summons to evacuate the Roman province was dismissed with contempt, and Svatoslaus fiercely replied that Constantinople might soon expect the presence of an enemy and a master. 
Nicephorus could no longer expel the mischief which he had introduced, but his throne and wife were inherited by John Semiscus, who, in a diminutive body, possessed the spirit and abilities of a hero. The first victory of his lieutenants deprived the Russians of their foreign allies, twenty thousand of whom were either destroyed by the sword, or provoked the revolt, or tempted to desert. Thrace was delivered, but seventy thousand barbarians were still in arms, and the legions that had been recalled from the new conquest of Syria prepared, with the return of spring, to march under the banners of a warlike prince, who declared himself the friend and avenger of the injured Bulgarian. The passes of Mount Hamus had been left unguarded. They were instantly occupied. The Roman vanguard was formed of the immortals, a proud imitation of the Persian style. The emperor led the main body of ten thousand five hundred foot, and the rest of his forces followed in slow and cautious array, with the baggage and military engines. The first exploit of Tsimiskes was the reduction of Marcianopolis, or Peristlava, in two days. The trumpet sounded, the walls were scaled, eight thousand five hundred Russians were put to the sword, and the sons of the Bulgarian king were rescued from an ignominious prison and invested with the nominal diadem. After these repeated losses, Svatoslaus retired to the strong post of Drista on the banks of the Danube, and was pursued by an enemy who alternately employed the arms of celerity and delay. The Byzantine galleys ascended the river, the legions completed a line of circumvallation, and the Russian prince was encompassed, assaulted, and famished in the fortifications of the camp and city. Many deeds of valor were performed, Several desperate sallies were attempted, nor was it till after a siege of sixty-five days that Svatoslaus yielded to his adverse fortune. The liberal terms which he obtained announced the prudence of the victor, who respected the valor and apprehended the despair of an unconquered mind. The great Duke of Russia bound himself, by solemn imprecations, to relinquish all hostile designs. A safe passage was open for his return. The liberty of trade and navigation was restored. A measure of corn was distributed to each of his soldiers, and the allowance of 22,000 measures attests the loss and the remnant of the barbarians. After a painful voyage, they again reached the mount of the Boristenes, but their provisions were exhausted. The season was unfavorable. They passed the winter on the ice, and, before they could prosecute their march, Svatoslaus was surprised and oppressed by the neighboring tribes, with whom the Greeks entertained a perpetual and useful correspondence. Far different was the return of Tsimiskis, who was received in his capital like Camillus or Marius, the saviors of ancient Rome. But the merit of the victory was attributed by the pious emperor to the mother of God, and the image of the Virgin Mary, with the divine infant in her arms, was placed in a triumphal car, adorned with the spoils of war and the ensigns of Bulgarian royalty. Simiskes made his public entry on horseback, the diadem in his head, a crown of laurel in his hand, and Constantinople was astonished to applaud the martial virtues of her sovereign. Fortius of Constantinople, a patriarch, whose ambition was equal to his curiosity, congratulates himself and the Greek church on the conversion of the Russians. Those fierce and bloody barbarians had been persuaded, by the voice of reason and religion, to acknowledge Jesus for their God, the Christian missionaries for their teachers, and the Romans for their friends and brethren. His triumph was transient and premature. In the various fortune of their piratical adventures, some Russian chiefs might allow themselves to be sprinkled with the waters of baptism, and a Greek bishop, with the name of Metropolitan, might administer the sacraments in the church of Kiev to a congregation of slaves and natives. But the seed of the gospel was sown on a barren soil. Many were the apostates, the converts were few, and the baptism of Olga may be fixed as the era of Russian Christianity. A female, perhaps of the basest origin, who could revenge the death and assume the sceptre of her husband Igor, must have been endowed with those active virtues which command fear and obedience of barbarians. In a moment of foreign and domestic peace, she sailed from Kiev to Constantinople, and the Emperor Constantine Porphyrogenitus has described, with minute diligence, the ceremonial of her reception in his capital and palace. 
the steps, the titles, the salutations, the banquet, the presents, were exquisitely adjusted to gratify the vanity of the stranger, with due reverence to the superior majesty of the purple. In the sacrament of baptism, she received the venerable name of the Empress Helena, and her conversion might be preceded or followed by her uncle, two interpreters, sixteen damsels of a higher and eighteen of a lower rank, twenty-two domestics or ministers, and forty-four Russian merchants, who composed the retinue of the great Princess Olga. After her return to Kiev and Novgorod, she firmly persisted in her new religion, but her labors in the propagation of the gospel were not crowned with success, and both her family and nation adhered with obstinacy or indifference to the gods of their fathers. Her son Svatuslaus was apprehensive of the scorn and ridicule of his companions, and her grandson Volodymyr devoted his youthful zeal to multiply and decorate the monuments of ancient worship. The savage deities of the north were still propitiated with human sacrifices. In the choice of the victim, a citizen was preferred to a stranger, a Christian to an idolater, and the father, who defended his son from the sacerdotal knife, was involved in the same doom by the rage of a fanatic tumult. Yet the lessons and example of the pious Olga had made a deep, though secret, impression in the minds of the prince and people. The Greek missionaries continued to preach, to dispute, and to baptize, and the ambassadors or merchants of Russia compared the idolatry of the woods with the elegant superstition of Constantinople. They had gazed with admiration on the dome of St. Sophia, the lively pictures of saints and martyrs, the riches of the altar, the number and vestments of the priests, the pomp and order of the ceremonies. They were edified by the alternate succession of devout silence and harmonious song. Nor was it difficult to persuade them that a choir of angels descended each day from heaven to join in the devotion of the Christians. But the conversion of Volodymyr was determined, or hastened, by his desire of a Roman bride, at the same time, and in the city of Kherson, the rites of baptism and marriage were celebrated by the Christian pontiff. The city he restored to the emperor Basil, the brother of his spouse, but the brazen gates were transported, as it is said, to Novgorod, and erected before the first church as a trophy of his victory and faith. This despotic command, Peroned, the god of thunder, whom he had so long adored, was dragged through the streets of Kiev and twelve sturdy barbarians battered with clubs the misshapen image, which was indignantly cast into the waters of the Boristanes. The edict of Volodymyr had proclaimed that all who should refuse the rites of baptism would be treated as the enemies of God and their prince, and the rivers were instantly filled with many thousands of obedient Russians, who acquiesced in the truth and excellence of a doctrine which had been embraced by the great duke and his boyars. In the next generation, the relics of paganism were finally extirpated, but as the two brothers of Volodymyr had died without baptism, their bones were taken from the grave and sanctified by an irregular and posthumous sacrament. In the ninth, tenth, and eleventh centuries of the Christian era, the reign of the gospel and of the church was extended over Bulgaria, Hungary, Bohemia, Saxony, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Poland, and Russia. The triumphs of apostolic zeal were repeated in the Iron Age of Christianity, and the northern and eastern regions of Europe submitted to a religion more different in theory than in practice from the worship of their native idols. A laudable ambition excited the monks both of Germany and Greece to visit the tents and huts of the barbarians. Poverty, hardships, and dangers were the lot of the first missionaries. Their courage was active and patient, their motive pure and meritorious, their present reward consisted in the testimony of their conscience and the respect of a grateful people, but the fruitful harvest of their toils was inherited and enjoyed by the proud and wealthy prelates of the succeeding times. The first conversions were free and spontaneous, a holy life and an elegant tongue were the only arms of the missionaries, but the domestic fables of the pagans were silenced by the miracles and visions of the strangers and the favorable temper of the chiefs was accelerated by the dictates of vanity and interest. The leaders of the nations, who were saluted with the titles of kings and saints, 
held it lawful and pious to impose the Catholic faith on their subjects and neighbors. The coast of the Baltic, from Holstein to the Gulf of Finland, was invaded under the standard of the cross, and the reign of idolatry was closed by the conversion of Lithuania in the 14th century. Yet truth and candor must acknowledge that the conversion of the North imparted many temporal benefits, both to the old and the new Christians. The rage of war, inherent to the human species, could not be healed by the evangelic precepts of charity and peace, and the ambition of Catholic princes has renewed in every age the calamities of hostile contention. But the admission of the barbarians into the pale of civil and ecclesiastical society delivered Europe from the depredations, by sea and land, of the Normans, the Hungarians, and the Russians, who learned to spare their brethren and cultivate their positions. The establishment of law and order was promoted by the influence of the clergy, and the rudiments of art and science were introduced into the savage countries of the globe. The liberal piety of the Russian princes engaged in their service the most skilful of the Greeks to decorate the cities and instruct the inhabitants. The dome and the paintings of St. Sophia were rudely copied in the churches of Kiev and Novgorod. The writings of the fathers were translated into the Sclavonic idiom, and three hundred noble youths were invited or compelled to attend the lessons of the College of Jaroslaus. It should appear that Russia might have derived an easy and rapid improvement from her peculiar connection with the church and state of Constantinople, which at that age so justly despised the ignorance of the Latins. But the Byzantine nation was servile, solitary, and verging to a hasty decline. After the fall of Kiev, the navigation of the Boristenes was forgotten, the great princes of Volodymyr and Moscow were separated from the sea and Christendom, and the divided monarchy was oppressed by the ignominy and blindness of Tartar servitude. The Sclavonic and Scandinavian kingdoms, which had been converted by the Latin missionaries, were exposed, it is true, to the spiritual jurisdiction and temporal claims of the popes, but they were united in language and religious worship, with each other and with Rome, they imbibed the free and generous spirit of the European Republic, and gradually shared the light of knowledge which arose on the western The Saracens, Franks, and Greeks in Italy, First Adventures and Settlement of the Normans, Character and Conquest of Robert Giscard, Duke of Apulia, Deliverance of Sicily by his brother Roger, Victories of Robert over the Emperors of the East and West, Roger, King of Sicily, invades Africa and Greece. The Emperor Manuel Comnenus. Wars of the Greeks and Normans. Extinction of the Normans. The three great nations of the world, the Greeks, the Saracens and the Franks, encountered each other on the theatre of Italy. The southern provinces, which now compose the Kingdom of Naples, were subject for the most part to the Lombard dukes and princes of Beneventum, so powerful in war that they checked for a moment the genius of Charlemagne, so liberal in peace that they maintained in their capital an academy of thirty-two philosophers and grammarians. The division of this flourishing state produced the rival principalities of Benevento, Salerno and Capua, and the thoughtless ambition or revenge of the competitors invited the Saracens to the ruin of their common inheritance. During a calamitous period of two hundred years, Italy was exposed to a repetition of wounds which the invaders were not capable of healing by the union and tranquillity of a perfect conquest. Their frequent and almost annual squadrons issued from the port of Palermo, and were entertained with too much indulgence by the Christians of Naples, the more formidable fleets were prepared on the African coast, and even the Arabs of Andalusia were sometimes tempted to assist or oppose the Muslims of an adverse sect. In the revolution of human events, a new ambuscade was concealed in the Cordine Forks, the fields of Cannae were bedewed a second time with the blood of the Africans, and the sovereign of Rome again attacked or defended the walls of Capua and Tarentum. A colony of Saracens had been planted at Bari, which commands the entrance of the Adriatic Gulf, and their impartial depredations provoked the resentment and conciliated the union of the two emperors. 
an offensive alliance was concluded between Basil the Macedonian, the first of his race, and Louis, the great-grandson of Charlemagne, and each party supplied the deficiencies of his associate. It would have been imprudent in the Byzantine monarch to transport his stationary troops of Asia to an Italian campaign, and the Latin arms would have been insufficient if his superior navy had not occupied the mouth of the Gulf. The fortress of Bari was invested by the infantry of the Franks and by the cavalry of galleys of the Greeks, and after a defence of four years the Arabian emir submitted to the clemency of Louis, who commanded in person the operations of the siege. This important conquest had been achieved by the concord of the East and West, but their recent amity was soon embittered by the mutual complaints of jealousy and pride. The Greeks assumed as their own the merit of the conquest and the pomp of the triumph, extolled the greatness of their powers, and affected to deride the intemperance and sloth of the handful of barbarians who appeared under the banners of the Carlovingian prince. His replies expressed with the eloquence of indignation and truth. "'We confess the magnitude of your preparation,' says the great-grandson of Charlemagne. "'Your armies were indeed as numerous as a cloud of summer locusts who darken the day, flap their wings, and after a short flight tumble, weary and breathless, to the ground. Like them ye sunk after a feeble effort, ye were vanquished by your own cowardice, and withdrew from the scene of action to injure and despoil our Christian subjects of the Slavonian coast. We were few in number. And why were we few? Because, after a tedious expectation of your arrival, I had dismissed my host, and retained only a chosen band of warriors to continue the blockade of the city. If they indulged their hospitable feasts in the face of danger and death, did these feasts abate the vigour of their enterprise? Is it by your fasting that the walls of Bari have been overturned? Did not these valiant Franks, diminished as they were by languor and fatigue, intercept and vanish the three most powerful emirs of the Saracens? And did not their defeat precipitate the fall of the city? Bari is now fallen, Tarentum trembles, Calabria will be delivered, and if we command the sea, the island of Sicily may be rescued from the hands of the infidels. My brother, accelerate, a name most offensive to the vanity of the Greek, accelerate your naval succours, respect your allies, and distrust your flatterers. These lofty hopes were soon extinguished by the death of Lewis and the decay of the Carlovingian house, and whoever might deserve the honour, the Greek emperors Basil and his son Leo secured the advantage of the reduction of Bari. The Italians of Apulia and Calabria were persuaded or compelled to acknowledge their supremacy, and an ideal line from Mount Garganus to the Bay of Salerno leaves the far greater part of the Kingdom of Naples under the dominion of the Eastern Empire. Beyond that line, the dukes or republics of Amalfi and Naples, who had never forfeited their voluntary allegiance, rejoiced in the neighbourhood of their lawful sovereign, and Amalfi was enriched by supplying Europe with the produce and manufactures of Asia. But the Lombard princes of Benevento, Salerno, and Capua were reluctantly torn from the communion of the Latin world, and too often violated their oaths of servitude and tribute. The city of Bari rose to dignity and wealth, as the metropolis of the new theme or province of Lombardy the title of patrician, and afterwards the singular name of catapan, was assigned to the supreme governor, and the policy both of the church and state was modelled in exact subordination to the throne of Constantinople. As long as the sceptre was disputed by the princes of Italy, their efforts were feeble and adverse, and the Greeks resisted or eluded the forces of Germany, which descended from the Alps under the imperial standard of the Ottos. The first and greatest of those Saxon princes was compelled to relinquish the siege of Bari. The second, after the loss of his stoutest bishops and barons, escaped with honour from the bloody field of Crotona. On that day the scale of war was turned against the Franks by the valour of the Saracens. These corsairs had indeed been driven by the Byzantine fleets from the fortresses and coasts of Italy, but a sense of interest was more prevalent than superstition or resentment. 
and the caliph of Egypt had transported 40,000 Muslims to the aid of his Christian ally. The successors of Basil amused themselves with the belief that the conquest of Lombardy had been achieved, and was still preserved by the justice of their laws, the virtues of their ministers, and the gratitude of a people whom they had rescued from anarchy and oppression. A series of rebellions might dart a ray of truth into the palace of Constantinople, and the illusions of flattery were dispelled by the easy and rapid success of the Norman adventurers. The revolution of human affairs had produced in Apulia and Calabria a melancholy contrast between the age of Pythagoras and the tenth century of the Christian era. At the former period, the coast of Great Greece, as it was then styled, was planted with free and opulent cities. These cities were peopled with soldiers, artists and philosophers, and the military strength of Tarentum, Sybaris or Crotona was not inferior to that of a powerful kingdom. At the second era, these once flourishing provinces were clouded with ignorance, impoverished by tyranny, and depopulated by barbarian war, nor can we severely accuse the exaggeration of a contemporary that a fair and ample district was reduced to the same desolation which had covered the earth after the general deluge. Among the hostilities of the Arabs, the Franks, and the Greeks in the southern Italy, I shall select two or three anecdotes expressive of their national manners. 1. It was the amusement of the Saracens to profane as well as to pillage the monasteries and churches. At the siege of Salerno, a Mussulman chief spread his couch on the communion table, and on that altar sacrificed each night the virginity of a Christian nun. As he wrestled with a reluctant maid, a beam in the roof was accidentally or dexterously thrown down on his head, and the death of the lustful emir was imputed to the wrath of Christ, which was at length awakened to the defence of his faithful spouse. 2. The Saracens besieged the cities of Beneventum and Capua. After a vain appeal to the successors of Charlemagne, the Lombards implored the clemency and aid of the Greek emperor. A fearless citizen dropped from the walls, passed the entrenchments, accomplished his commission, and fell into the hands of the barbarians as he was returning with the welcome news. They commanded him to assist their enterprise and deceive his countrymen, with the assurance that wealth and honours should be the reward of his falsehood, and that his sincerity would be punished with immediate death. He affected to yield, but as soon as he was conducted within hearing of the Christians on the rampart, "'Friends and brethren,' he cried with a loud voice, "'be bold and patient. Maintain the city. Your sovereign is informed of your distress, and your deliverers are at hand. I know my doom, and commit my wife and children to your gratitude.' The rage of the Arabs confirmed his evidence, and the self-devoted patriot was transpierced with a hundred spears." He deserves to live in the memory of the virtuous, but the repetition of the same story in ancient and modern times may sprinkle some doubts on the reality of this generous deed. 3. The recital of a third incident may provoke a smile amidst the horrors of war. Theobald, Marquis of Camerino and Spoleto, supported the rebels of Beneventum, and his wanton cruelty was not incompatible in that age with the character of a hero. His captives of the Greek nation or party were castrated without mercy, and the outrage was aggravated by a cruel jest that he wished to present the emperor with a supply of eunuchs, the most precious ornaments of the Byzantine court. The garrison of a castle had been defeated in a sally, and the prisoners were sentenced to the customary operation— but the sacrifice was disturbed by the intrusion of a frantic female who, with bleeding cheeks, dishevelled hair, and importunate clamours, compelled the Marquis to listen to her complaint. "'Is it thus,' she cried, "'ye magnanimous heroes, that ye wage war against women, against women who have never injured ye, and whose only arms are the distaff and the loom?' Theobald denied the charge, and protested that, since the Amazons, he had never heard of a female war." "'And how,' she furiously exclaimed, "'can you attack us more directly? "'How can you wound us in a more vital part "'than by robbing our husbands of what we most dearly cherish, 
the source of our joys and the hope of our posterity. The plunder of our flocks and herds I have endured without a murmur, but this fatal injury, this irreparable loss, subdues my patience and calls aloud on the justice of heaven and earth. A general laugh applauded her eloquence. The savage Franks, inaccessible to pity, were moved by her ridiculous yet rational despair, and with the deliverance of the captives she obtained the restitution of her effects. As she returned in triumph to the castle, she was overtaken by a messenger to inquire, in the name of Theobald, what punishment should be inflicted on her husband were he again taken in arms. "'Should such,' she answered without hesitation, "'be his guilt and his misfortune? "'He has eyes and a nose and hands and feet. "'These are his own, and these he may deserve to forfeit by his personal offences. "'But let my lord be pleased to spare what his little handmaid "'presumes to claim as her peculiar and lawful property.' The establishment of the Normans in the kingdoms of Naples and Sicily is an event most romantic in its origin, and in its consequences most important, both to Italy and the Eastern Empire. The broken provinces of the Greeks, Lombards and Saracens were exposed to every invader, and every sea and land were invaded by the adventurous spirit of the Scandinavian pirates. After a long indulgence of rapine and slaughter, a fair and ample territory was accepted, occupied, and named by the Normans of France. They renounced their gods for the god of the Christians, and the dukes of Normandy acknowledged themselves the vassals of the successors of Charlemagne and Capet. The savage fierceness which they had brought from the snowy mountains of Norway was refined without being corrupted in a warmer climate. The companions of Rollo insensibly mingled with the natives, they imbibed the manners, language, and gallantry of the French nation, and in a martial age the Normans might claim the palm of valour and glorious achievements. Of the fashionable superstitions they embraced with ardour the pilgrimages of Rome, Italy, and the Holy Land. In this active devotion the minds and bodies were invigorated by exercise. Danger was the incentive, novelty the recompense and the prospect of the world was decorated by wonder, credulity, and ambitious hope. They confederated for their mutual defence, and the robbers of the Alps, who had been allured by the garb of a pilgrim, were often chastised by the arm of a warrior. In one of these pious visits to the cavern of Mount Garganus in Apulia, which had been sanctified by the apparition of the archangel Michael, they were accosted by a stranger in the Greek habit, but who soon revealed himself as a rebel, a fugitive, and a mortal foe of the Greek Empire. His name was Melo, a noble citizen of Bari, who, after an unsuccessful revolt, was compelled to seek new allies and avengers of his country. The bold appearance of the Normans revived his hopes and solicited his confidence. They listened to the complaints, and still more to the promises, of the patriot. The assurance of wealth demonstrated the justice of his cause, and they viewed as the inheritance of the brave the fruitful land which was oppressed by effeminate tyrants. On their return to Normandy they kindled a spark of enterprise, and a small but intrepid band was freely associated for the deliverance of Apulia. They passed the Alps by separate roads, and in the disguise of pilgrims, but in the neighbourhood of Rome they were saluted by the chief of Bari, who supplied the more indigent with arms and horses, and instantly led them to the field of action. In the first conflict their valour prevailed, but in the second engagement they were overwhelmed by the numbers and military engines of the Greeks, and indignantly retreated with their faces to the enemy. The unfortunate Melo ended his life a suppliant at the court of Germany, his Norman followers, excluded from their native and their promised land, wandered among the hills and valleys of Italy, and earned their daily substance by the sword. To that formidable sword the princes of Capua, Beneventum, Salerno, and Naples alternately appealed in their domestic quarrels. The superior spirit and discipline of the Normans gave victory to the side which they espoused, and their cautious policy observed the balance of power, lest the preponderance of any rival state should render their aid less important, and their service less profitable. Their first asylum was a strong camp in the depths of the marshes of Campania, 
but they were soon endowed by the liberality of the Duke of Naples, with a more plentiful and permanent seat. Eight miles from his residence, as a bulwark against Capua, the town of Aversa was built and fortified for their use, and they enjoyed as their own the corn and fruits, the meadows and groves of that fertile district. The report of their success attracted every year new swarms of pilgrims and soldiers. The poor were urged by necessity, the rich were excited by hope, and the brave and active spirits of Normandy were impatient of ease and ambitious of renown. The independent standard of Aversa afforded shelter and encouragement to the outlaws of the province, to every fugitive who had escaped from the injustice or justice of his superiors, and these foreign associates were quickly assimilated in manners and language to the Gallic colony. The first leader of the Normans was Count Reynolf, and, in the origin of society, pre-eminence of rank is the reward and the proof of superior merit. Since the conquest of Sicily by the Arabs, the Grecian emperors had been anxious to regain that valuable possession, but their efforts, however strenuous, had been opposed by the distance and the sea. Their costly armaments, after a gleam of success, added new pages of calamity and disgrace to the Byzantine annals. Twenty thousand of their best troops were lost in a single expedition, and the victorious Muslims derided the policy of a nation which entrusted eunuchs not only with the custody of their women, but with the command of their men. After a reign of two hundred years, the Saracens were ruined by their divisions. The emir disclaimed the authority of the king of Tunis, the people rose against the emir, the cities were usurped by the chiefs. Each meaner rebel was independent in his village or castle, and the weaker of two rival brothers implored the friendship of the Christians. In every service of danger the Normans were prompt and useful, and five hundred knights, or warriors on horseback, were enrolled by Arduin, the agent and interpreter of the Greeks, under the standard of Maniaces, governor of Lombardy. Before their landing the brothers were reconciled, the union of Sicily and Africa was restored, and the island was guarded to the water's edge. The Normans led the van, and the Arabs of Messina felt the valour of an untried foe. In a second action, the emir of Syracuse was unhorsed and transpierced by the iron arm of William of Hauteville. In a third engagement, his intrepid companions discomfited the host of sixty thousand Saracens, and left the Greeks no more than the labour of the pursuit. A splendid victory! but of which the pen of the historian may divide the merit with the lance of the Normans. It is, however, true that they essentially promoted the success of Maniaces, who reduced thirteen cities and the greater part of Sicily under the obedience of the emperor. But his military fame was sullied by ingratitude and tyranny. In the division of the spoils, the deserts of his brave auxiliaries were forgotten, and neither their avarice nor their pride could brook this injurious treatment. They complained by the mouth of their interpreter. Their complaint was disregarded, their interpreter was scourged. The sufferings were his, the insult and resentment belonged to those whose sentiments he had delivered. Yet they dissembled till they had obtained, or stolen, a safe passage to the Italian continent. Their brethren of Aversa sympathised in their indignation, and the province of Apulia was invaded as the forfeit of the debt. Above twenty years after the first emigration, the Normans took the field, with no more than seven hundred horse and five hundred foot, and after the recall of the Byzantine legions from the Sicilian war, their numbers are magnified to the amount of threescore thousand men. Their herald proposed the option of battle or retreat. Of battle, was the unanimous cry of the Normans, and one of their stoutest warriors, with a stroke of his fist, fell to the ground at the horse of the Greek messenger. He was dismissed with a fresh horse. The insult was concealed from the imperial troops, but in two successive battles they were more fatally instructed of the prowess of their adversaries. In the plains of Cannae, the Asiatics fled before the adventurers of France. The Duke of Lombardy was made prisoner, the Apulians acquiesced in a new dominion, and the four places of Bari, Otranto, Brundisium, and Tarentum 
were alone saved in the shipwreck of the Grecian fortunes. From this era we may date the establishment of the Norman power, which soon eclipsed the infant colony of Aversa. Twelve counts were chosen by the popular suffrage, and age, birth, and merit were the motives of their choice. The tributes of their peculiar districts were appropriated to their use, and each count erected a fortress in the midst of his lands, and at the head of his vassals. In the centre of the province the common habitation of Melfi was reserved as the metropolis and citadel of the Republic, a house and separate quarter was allotted to each of the twelve counts, and the national concerns were regulated by this military senate. The first of his peers, their president and general, was entitled Count of Apulia, and this dignity was conferred on William of the Iron Arm, who, in the language of the age, is styled a lion in battle, a lamb in society, and an angel in council. The manners of his countrymen are fairly delineated by a contemporary and national historian. The Normans, says Malaterra, are a cunning and revengeful people. Eloquence and dissimulation appear to be their hereditary qualities. They can stoop to flatter, but unless they are curbed by the restraint of law, they indulge the licentiousness of nature and passion. Their princes affect the praises of popular munificence, the people observe the medium, or rather blond the extremes, of avarice and prodigality, and in their eager thirst of wealth and dominion they despise whatever they possess, and hope whatever they desire. Arms and horses, the luxury of dress, the exercises of hunting and hawking, are the delight of the Normans. But on pressing occasions they can endure with incredible patience the inclemency of every climate, and the The Normans of Apulia were seated on the verge of the two empires, and, according to the policy of the hour, they accepted the investiture of their lands from the sovereigns of Germany or Constantinople. But the firmest title of these adventurers was the right of conquest. They neither loved nor trusted, they were neither trusted nor beloved. The contempt of the princes was mixed with fear, and the fear of the natives was mingled with hatred and resentment. Every object of desire a horse, a woman, a garden, tempted and gratified the rapaciousness of the strangers, and the avarice of their chiefs was only coloured by the more specious names of ambition and glory. The twelve counts were sometimes joined in the League of Injustice. In their domestic quarrels they disputed the spoils of the people, the virtues of William were buried in his grave, and Drogo, his brother and successor, was better qualified to lead the valour than to restrain the violence of his peers. Under the reign of Constantine Monomachus, the policy, rather than benevolence, of the Byzantine court attempted to relieve Italy from this adherent mischief, more grievous than a flight of barbarians, and Argyrus, the son of Melo, was invested for this purpose with the most lofty titles and the most ample commission. The memory of his father might recommend him to the Normans, and he had already engaged their voluntary service to quell the revolt of Maniaces, and to avenge their own and the public injury. It was the design of Constantine to transplant the warlike colony from the Italian provinces to the Persian war, and the son of Melo distributed among the chiefs the gold and manufactures of Greece as the first fruits of the imperial bounty. But his arts were baffled by the sense and spirit of the conquerors of Apulia, his gifts, or at least his proposals, were rejected, and they unanimously refused to relinquish their possessions and their hopes for the distant prospect of Asiatic fortune. After the means of persuasion had failed, Argyrus resolved to compel or to destroy. The Latin powers were solicited against the common enemy, and an offensive alliance was formed of the Pope and the two emperors of the East and West. The throne of St. Peter was occupied by Leo the Ninth a simple saint, of a temper most apt to deceive himself and the world, and whose venerable character would consecrate with the name of piety the measures least compatible with the practice of religion. His humanity was affected by the complaints, perhaps the calumnies, of an injured people. The impious Normans had interrupted the payment of tithes, and the temporal sword might be lawfully unsheathed against the sacrilegious robbers who were deaf to the censures of the church. 
As a German of noble birth and royal kindred, Leo had free access to the court and confidence of the Emperor Henry the Third, and in search of arms and allies, his ardent zeal transported him from Apulia to Saxony, from the Elbe to the Tiber. During these hostile preparations, Argyrus indulged himself in the use of secret and guilty weapons. A crowd of Normans became the victims of public or private revenge, and the valiant Drogo was murdered in a church. But his spirit survived in his brother Humphrey, the third Count of Apulia. The assassins were chastised, and the son of Melo, overthrown and wounded, was driven from the field to hide his shame behind the walls of Bari, and to await the tardy succour of his allies. But the power of Constantine was distracted by a Turkish war, the mind of Henry was feeble and irresolute, and the Pope, instead of repassing the Alps with a German army, was accompanied only by a guard of seven hundred Swabians and some volunteers of Lorraine. In his long progress from Mantua to Beneventum, a vile and promiscuous multitude of Italians was enlisted under the holy standard, the priest and the robber slept in the same tent, the pikes and crosses were intermingled in the front, and the martial saint repeated the lessons of his youth in the order of march, of encampment, and of combat. The Normans of Apulia could muster in the field no more than three thousand horse, with a handful of infantry. The defection of the natives intercepted their provisions and retreat, and their spirit, incapable of fear, was chilled for a moment by superstitious awe. On the hostile approach of Leo, they knelt without disgrace or reluctance before their spiritual father. But the Pope was inexorable. His lofty Germans affected to deride the diminutive stature of their adversaries, and the Normans were informed that death or exile was their only alternative. Flight they disdained, and, as many of them had been three days without tasting food, they embraced the assurance of a more easy and honourable death. They climbed the hill of Civitella, descended into the plain, and charged in three divisions the army of the Pope. On the left and in the centre, Richard, Count of Aversa, and Robert, the famous Giscard, attacked, broke, routed, and pursued the Italian multitudes, who fought without discipline and fled without shame. A harder trial was reserved for the valour of Count Humphrey, who led the cavalry of the right wing. The Germans have been described as unskilful in the management of the horse and the lance, but on foot they formed a strong and impenetrable phalanx, and neither man nor steed nor armour could resist the weight of their long and two-handed swords. After a severe conflict they were encompassed by the squadrons returning from the pursuit, and died in the ranks with the esteem of their foes and the satisfaction of revenge. The gates of Civitella were shut against the flying Pope, and he was overtaken by the pious conquerors, who kissed his feet to implore his blessing and the absolution of their sinful victory. The soldiers beheld in their enemy and captive the Vicar of Christ, and, though we may suppose the policy of the chiefs, it is probable that they were infected by the popular superstition. In the calm of retirement the well-meaning Pope deplored the effusion of Christian blood which must be imputed to his account. He felt that he had been the author of sin and scandal, and as his undertaking had failed, the indecency of his military character was universally condemned. With these dispositions he listened to the offers of a beneficial treaty, deserted an alliance which he had preached as the cause of God, and ratified the past and future conquests of the Normans. By whatever hands they had been usurped, the provinces of Apulia and Calabria were a part of the donation of Constantine and the patrimony of St. Peter. The grant and the acceptance confirmed the mutual claims of the pontiff and the adventurers, they promised to support each other with spiritual and temporal arms. A tribute or quit-rent of twelve pence was afterwards stipulated for every ploughland, and since this memorable transaction, the kingdom of Naples has remained above seven hundred years a fief of the Holy See. The pedigree of Robert of Giscard is variously deduced from the peasants and the dukes of Normandy, from the peasants by the pride and ignorance of a Grecian princess, from the dukes by the ignorance and flattery of the Italian subjects. His genuine descent may be ascribed to the second or middle order of private nobility. He sprang from a race of valvasors or bannerets, 
of the diocese of Coutances in the Lower Normandy. The castle of Hauteville was their honourable seat. His father, Tancred, was conspicuous in the court and army of the duke, and his military service was furnished by ten soldiers or knights. Two marriages, of a rank not unworthy of his own, made him the father of twelve sons, who were educated at home by the impartial tenderness of his second wife. But a narrow patrimony was insufficient for this numerous and daring progeny. They saw around the neighbourhood the mischiefs of poverty and discord, and resolved to seek in foreign wars a more glorious inheritance. Two only remained to perpetuate the race and cherish their father's age. Their ten brothers, as they successfully attained the vigour of manhood, departed from the castle, passed the Alps, and joined the Apulian camp of the Normans. The elder were prompted by native spirit. Their success encouraged their younger brethren, and the three first in seniority, William, Drogo, and Humphrey, deserved to be the chiefs of their nation and the founders of the new republic. Robert was the eldest of the seven sons of the second marriage, and even the reluctant praise of his foes has endowed him with the heroic qualities of a soldier and a statesman. His lofty stature surpassed the tallest of his army. His limbs were cast in the true proportion of strength and gracefulness, and to the decline of life he maintained the patient vigour of health and the commanding dignity of his form. His complexion was ruddy, his shoulders were broad, his hair and beard were long and of a flaxen colour, his eyes sparkled with fire, and his voice, like that of Achilles, could impress obedience and terror amidst the tumult of battle. In the ruder ages of chivalry such qualifications are not below the notice of the poet or historians, they may observe that Robert, at once and with equal dexterity, could wield in the right hand his sword, his lance in the left, that in the battle of Civitella he was thrice unhorsed, and that in the close of that memorable day he was adjudged to have borne away the prize of valour from the warriors of the two armies. His boundless ambition was founded on the consciousness of superior worth. In the pursuit of greatness he was never arrested by the scruples of justice, and seldom moved by the feelings of humanity. Though not insensible of fame, the choice of open or clandestine means was determined only by his present advantage. The surname of Giscard was applied to this master of political wisdom, which is too often confounded with the practice of dissimulation and deceit, and Robert is praised by the Apulian poet for excelling the cunning of Ulysses and the eloquence of Cicero. Yet these arts were disguised by an appearance of military frankness. In his highest fortune he was accessible and courteous to his fellow soldiers, and while he indulged the prejudices of his new subjects, he affected in his dress and manners to maintain the ancient fashion of his country. He grasped with a rapacious that he might distribute with a liberal hand. His primitive indigence had taught the habits of frugality. The gain of a merchant was not below his attention, and his prisoners were tortured with slow and unfeeling cruelty to force a discovery of their secret treasure. According to the Greeks, he departed from Normandy with only five followers on horseback and thirty on foot, yet even this allowance appears too bountiful. The sixth son of Tancred of Hauteville passed the Alps as a pilgrim, and his first military band was levied among the adventurers of Italy. His brothers and countrymen had divided the fertile lands of Apulia, but they guarded their shares with the jealousy of avarice. The aspiring youth was driven forwards to the mountains of Calabria, and in his first exploits against the Greeks and the natives, it is not easy to discriminate the hero from the robber. To surprise a castle or a convent, to ensnare a wealthy citizen, to plunder the adjacent villages for necessary food— were the obscure labours which formed and exercised the powers of his mind and body. The volunteers of Normandy adhered to his standard, and under his command the peasants of Calabria assumed the name and character of Normans. As the genius of Robert expanded with his fortune, he awakened the jealousy of his elder brother, by whom, in a transient quarrel, his life was threatened and his liberty restrained. After the death of Humphrey, the tender age of his sons excluded them from the command. They were reduced to a private estate by the ambition of their guardian and uncle, and Giscard was exalted on a buckler and saluted Count of Apulia and General of the Republic. 
With an increase of authority and of force, he resumed the conquest of Calabria, and soon aspired to a rank that should raise him for ever above the heads of his equals. By some acts of rapine or sacrilege, he had incurred a papal excommunication. But Nicholas II was easily persuaded that the divisions of friends could terminate only in their mutual prejudice, that the Normans were the faithful champions of the Holy See, and it was safer to trust the alliance of a prince than the caprice of an aristocracy. A synod of one hundred bishops was convened at Melfi, and the Count interrupted an important enterprise to guard the person and execute the decrees of the Roman pontiff. His gratitude and policy conferred on Robert and his posterity the ducal title, with the investiture of Apulia, Calabria, and all the lands both in Italy and Sicily which his sword could rescue from the schismatic Greeks and the unbelieving Saracens. This apostolic sanction might justify his arms, but the obedience of a free and victorious people could not be transferred without their consent, and Giscard dissembled his elevation till the ensuing campaign had been illustrated by the conquest of Consenza and Reggio. In the hour of triumph he assembled his troops, and solicited the Normans to confirm by their suffrage the judgment of the Vicar of Christ. The soldiers hailed with joyful acclamations their valiant duke, and the counts, his former equals, pronounced the oath of fidelity with hollow smiles and secret indignation. After this inauguration, Robert styled himself, by the grace of God and St. Peter, Duke of Apulia, Calabria, and hereafter of Sicily. And it was the labour of twenty years to deserve and realise these lofty appellations. Such tardy progress in a narrow space may seem unworthy of the abilities of the chief and the spirit of the nation. But the Normans were few in number, their resources were scanty, their service was voluntary and precarious. The bravest designs of the Duke were sometimes opposed by the free voice of his Parliament of Barons. The twelve counts of popular election conspired against his authority, and against their perfidious uncle the sons of Humphrey demanded justice and revenge. By his policy and vigour Giscard discovered their plots, suppressed their rebellions, and punished the guilty with death or exile. But in these domestic feuds his years and the national strength were unprofitably consumed. After the defeat of his foreign enemies, the Greeks, Lombards, and Saracens, their broken forces retreated to the strong and populous cities of the sea coast. They excelled in the arts of fortification and defence. The Normans were accustomed to serve on horseback in the field, and their rude attempts could only succeed by the efforts of persevering courage. The resistance of Salerno was maintained above eight months, the siege or blockade of Bari lasted nearly four years. In these actions the Norman duke was the foremost in every danger, in every fatigue the last and most patient. As he pressed the citadel of Salerno, a huge stone from the rampart shattered one of his military engines, and by a splinter he was wounded in the breast. Before the gates of Bari he lodged in a miserable hut or barrack, composed of dry branches and thatched with straw, a perilous station, on all sides open to the inclemency of the weather and the spears of the enemy. The Italian conquests of Robert correspond with the limits of the present kingdom of Naples, and the countries united by his arms have not been dissevered by the revolutions of seven hundred years. The monarchy has been composed of the Greek provinces of Calabria and Apulia, of the Lombard principality of Salerno, the Republic of Amalfi, and the inland dependencies of the large and ancient Duchy of Beneventum. Three districts only were exempted from the common law of subjection, the first forever, the two last till the middle of the succeeding century. The city and immediate territory of Benevento had been transferred by gift or exchange from the German emperor to the Roman pontiff, and although this holy land was sometimes invaded, the name of St. Peter was finally more potent than the sword of the Normans. Their first colony of Aversa subdued and held the state of Capua, and her princes were reduced to beg their bread before the palace of their fathers. The dukes of Naples, the present metropolis, maintained the popular freedom under the shadow of the Byzantine Empire. Among the new acquisitions of Giscard, the science of Salerno and the trade of Amalfi may detain for a moment the curiosity of the reader. 1. 
Of the learned faculties, jurisprudence implies the previous establishment of laws and property, and theology may perhaps be superseded by the full light of religion and reason. But the savage and the sage must alike implore the assistance of physic, and if our diseases are inflamed by luxury, the mischiefs of blows and wounds would be more frequent in the ruder ages of society. The treasures of Grecian medicine had been communicated to the Arabian colonies of Africa, Spain, and Sicily, and in the intercourse of peace and war, a spark of knowledge had been kindled and cherished at Salerno, an industrious city in which the men were honest and the women beautiful. A school, the first that arose in the darkness of Europe, was consecrated to the healing art. The conscience of monks and bishops was reconciled to that salutary and lucrative profession, and a crowd of patients of the most eminent rank and most distant climates invited or visited the physicians of Salerno. They were protected by the Norman conquerors, and Giscard, though bred in arms, could discern the merit and value of a philosopher. After a pilgrimage of thirty-nine years, Constantine, an African Christian, returned from Baghdad, a master of the language and learning of the Arabians, and Salerno was enriched by the practice, the lessons, and the writings of the pupil of Avicenna. The school of medicine has long slept in the name of a university, but her precepts are abridged in a string of aphorisms bound together in the Leonine verses, or Latin rhymes, of the twelfth century. 2. Seven miles to the west of Salerno, and thirty to the south of Naples, the obscure town of Amalfi displayed the power and rewards of industry. The land, however fertile, was of narrow extent, but the sea was accessible and open. The inhabitants first assumed the office of supplying the western world with the manufactures and productions of the east, and this useful traffic was the source of their opulence and freedom. The government was popular, under the administration of a duke and the supremacy of the Greek emperor. Fifty thousand citizens were numbered in the walls of Amalfi, nor was any city more abundantly provided with gold, silver, and the objects of precious luxury. The mariners who swarmed in her port excelled in the theory and practice of navigation and astronomy, and the discovery of the compass which has opened the globe is owing to their ingenuity or good fortune. Their trade was extended to the coasts, or at least to the commodities, of Africa, Arabia, and India, and their settlements in Constantinople, Antioch, Jerusalem, and Alexandria acquired the privileges of independent colonies. After three hundred years of prosperity, Amalfi was oppressed by the arms of the Normans and sacked by the jealousy of Pisa, but the poverty of one thousand fishermen is yet dignified by the remains of an arsenal, a cathedral, and the palaces of royal. Roger, the twelfth and last of the sons of Tancred, had been long detained in Normandy by his own his age. He accepted the welcome summons to the camp, and deserved at the first esteem, and afterwards the envy, of his elder brother. Their valor and ambition were equal, but the youth, the beauty, the elegant manners of Roger engaged the disinterested love of the soldiers and people. So scanty was his allowance for himself and forty followers, that he descended from conquest to robbery, and from robbery to domestic theft. And so loose were the notions of property, that, by his own historian, at his special command, he is accused of stealing horses from a stable at Melfi, his spirit emerged from poverty and disgrace. From these base practices he rose to the merit and glory of a holy war, and the invasion of Sicily was seconded by the zeal and policy of his brother Guiscard. After the retreat of the Greeks, the idolaters, a most audacious reproach of the Catholics, had retrieved their losses and possessions. But the deliverance of the island, so vainly undertaken by the forces of the Eastern Empire, was achieved by a small and private band of adventurers. In the first attempt, Roger braved, in an open boat, the real and fabulous dangers of Scylla and Charybdis, landed with only sixty soldiers on a hostile shore, drove the Saracens to the gates of Messina, and safely returned with the spoils of the adjacent country. In the fortress of Trani, his active and patient courage 
were equally conspicuous. In his old age he related with pleasure that, by the distress of the siege, himself and the countess, his wife, had been reduced to a single cloak or mantle, which they wore alternately, that in a sally his horse had been slain, and he was dragged away by the Saracens, but that he owed his rescue to his good sword, and had retreated with his saddle on his back, lest the meanest trophy might be left in the hands of the miscreants. In the siege of Trani, three hundred Normans withstood and repulsed the forces of the island. In the field of Ceramio, fifty thousand horse and foot were overthrown by one hundred and thirty-six Christian soldiers, without reckoning St. George, who fought on horseback in the foremost ranks. The captive banners, with four camels, were reserved for the successor of St. Peter, and had these barbaric spoils been exposed, not in the Vatican, but in the capital, they might have revived the memory of the Punic triumphs. These insufficient numbers of the Normans most probably denote their knights, the soldiers of honorable and equestrian rank, each of whom was attended by five or six followers in the field. Yet, with the aid of this interpretation, and after every fair allowance on the side of valor, arms, and reputation, the discomfiture of so many myriads will reduce the prudent reader to the alternative of a miracle or a fable. The Arabs of Sicily derived a frequent and powerful succor from their countrymen of Africa. In the siege of Palermo, the Norman cavalry was assisted by the galleys of Pisa, and in the hour of action, the envy of the two brothers was sublimed to a generous and invincible emulation. After a war of thirty years, Roger, with the title of great count, obtained the sovereignty of the largest and most fruitful island of the Mediterranean, and his administration displays a liberal and enlightened mind above the limits of his age and education. The Muslims were maintained in the free enjoyment of their religion and property. A philosopher and physician of Mazara, of the race of Mahomet, harangued the conqueror, and was invited to court. His geography of the seven climates was translated into Latin, and Roger, after a diligent perusal, preferred the work of the Arabian to the writings of the Grecian Ptolemy. A remnant of Christian natives had promoted the success of the Normans. They were rewarded by the triumph of the cross. The island was restored to the jurisdiction of the Roman pontiff. New bishops were planted in the principal cities, and the clergy was satisfied by a liberal endowment of churches and monasteries. Yet the Catholic hero asserted the rights of the civil magistrate. Instead of resigning the investiture of benefices, he dexterously applied to his own profit the papal claims. The supremacy of the crown was secured and enlarged by the singular bull which declares the princes of Sicily hereditary and perpetual legates of the Holy See. To Robert Guiscard, the conquest of Sicily was more glorious than beneficial. The possession of Apulia and Calabria was inadequate to his ambition, and he resolved to embrace or create the first occasion of invading, perhaps of subduing, the Roman Empire of the East. From his first wife, the partner of his humble fortune, he had been divorced under the pretense of consanguinity, and her son, Bohemond, was destined to imitate, rather than to succeed, his illustrious father. The second wife of Guiscard was the daughter of the princes of Salerno. The Lombards acquiesced in the lineal succession of their son, Roger. Their five daughters were given in honorable nuptials, and one of them was betrothed in a tender age to Constantine, a beautiful youth, the son and heir of the Emperor Michael. But the throne of Constantinople was shaken by a revolution. The imperial family of Ducas was confined to the palace or the cloister, and Robert deplored and resented the disgrace of his daughter and the expulsion of his ally. A Greek who styled himself the father of Constantine soon appeared at Salerno and related the adventures of his fall and flight that unfortunate friend was acknowledged by the duke and adorned with the pomp and titles of imperial dignity. In his triumphal progress through Apulia and Calabria, Michael was saluted with tears and acclamations of the people, and Pope Gregory the Seventh exhorted the bishops to preach and the Catholics to fight 
in the pious work of his restoration. His conversations with Robert were frequent and familiar, and their mutual promises were justified by the valor of the Normans and the treasures of the East. Yet this Michael, by the confession of the Greeks and Latins, was a pageant and an impostor, a monk who had fled from his convent, or a domestic who had served in the palace. The fraud had been contrived by the subtle Guiscard, and he trusted that after this pretender had given a decent color to his arms, he would sink at the knot of the conqueror into his primitive obscurity. But victory was the only argument that could determine the belief of the Greeks, and the ardor of the Latins was much inferior to their credulity. The Norman veterans wished to enjoy the harvest of their toils, and the unwarlike Italians trembled at the known and unknown dangers of a transmarine expedition. In his new levies, Robert exerted the influence of gifts and promises, the terrors of civil and ecclesiastical authority, and some acts of violence might justify the reproach that age and infancy were pressed without distinction into the service of their unrelenting prince. After two years' incessant preparations, the land and naval forces were assembled at Otranto, at the heel or extreme promontory of Italy, and Robert was accompanied by his wife, who fought by his side, his son Bohemond, and the representative of the Emperor Michael. Thirteen hundred knights of Norman race or discipline formed the sinews of the army, which might be swelled to thirty thousand followers of every denomination. The men, the horses, the arms, the engines, the wooden towers, covered with raw hides, or embarked on board one hundred and fifty vessels. The transports had been built in the ports of Italy, and the galleys were supplied by the alliance of the Republic of Ragusa. At the mouth of the Adriatic Gulf, the shores of Italy and Epirus inclined towards each other. The space between Brundusium and Durazzo, the Roman passage, is no more than one hundred miles. At the last station of Otranto, it is contracted to fifty, and this narrow distance had suggested to Pyrrhus and Pompey the sublime or extravagant idea of a bridge. Before the general embarkation, the Norman duke dispatched Bohemond with fifteen galleys to seize or threaten the Isle of Corfu, to survey the opposite coast, and to secure a harbor in the neighborhood of Valona for the landing of the troops. They passed and landed without perceiving an enemy, and this successful experiment displayed the neglect and decay of the naval power of the Greeks. The islands of Epirus and the maritime towns were subdued by the arms or the name of Robert, who led his fleet and army from Corfu, I use the modern appellation, to the siege of Durazzo. That city, the western key of the empire, was guarded by ancient renown and recent fortifications by George Paleogis, a patrician victorious in the Oriental Wars, and a numerous garrison of Albanians and Macedonians, who in every age have maintained the character of soldiers. In the prosecution of his enterprise, the courage of Guiscard was assailed by every form of danger and mischance. In the most propitious season of the year, as his fleet passed along the coast, a storm of wind and snow unexpectedly arose. The Adriatic was swelled by the raging blast of the south, and a new shipwreck confirmed the old infamy of the Acroceraunian rocks. The sails, the masts, and the oars were shattered or torn away. The sea and shore were covered with the fragments of vessels, with arms and dead bodies, and the greatest part of the provisions were either drowned or damaged. The ducal galley was laboriously rescued from the waves, and Robert halted seven days on the adjacent cape to collect the relics of his loss and to revive the drooping spirits of his soldiers. The Normans were no longer the bold and experienced mariners who had explored the ocean from Greenland to Mount Atlas, and who smiled at the petty dangers of the Mediterranean. They had wept during the tempest. They were alarmed by the hostile approach of the Venetians, who had been solicited by the prayers and promises of the Byzantine court. The first day's action was not disadvantageous to Bohemond, a beardless youth who led the naval powers of his father. All night the galleys of the Republic lay on their anchors in the form of a crescent, and the victory of the second day was decided by the dexterity of their evolutions. 
the station of their archers, the weight of their javelins, and the borrowed aid of the Greek fire. The Apulian and Ragusian vessels fled to the shore. Several were cut from their cables and dragged away by the conqueror, and a sally from the town carried slaughter and dismay to the tents of the Norman duke. A seasonable relief was poured into Durazzo, and as soon as the besiegers had lost the command of the sea, the islands and maritime towns withdrew from the camp the supply of tribute and provision. That camp was soon afflicted with a pestilential disease. Five hundred knights perished by an inglorious death, and the list of burials, if all could obtain a decent burial, amounted to ten thousand persons. Under these calamities, the mind of Guiscard alone was firm and invincible, and while he collected new forces from Apulia and Sicily, he battered or scarred or sapped the walls of Durazzo. But his industry and valor were encountered by equal valor and more perfect industry. A movable turret of a size and capacity to contain five hundred soldiers had been rolled forwards to the foot of the rampart, but the descent of the door or drawbridge was checked by an enormous beam, and the wooden structure was constantly consumed by artificial flames. While the Roman Empire was attacked by the Turks in the east and the Normans in the west, the aged successor of Michael surrendered the scepter to the hands of Alexius, an illustrious captain and the founder of the Comnenian dynasty. The princess Anne, his daughter and historian, observes in her affected style that even Hercules was an equal to a double combat, and on this principle she approves a hasty peace with the Turks, which allowed her father to undertake in person the relief of Durazzo. On his accession, Alexius found the camp without soldiers and the treasury without money, yet such were the vigor and activity of his measures that in six months he assembled an army of seventy thousand men and performed a march of five hundred miles. His troops were levied in Europe and Asia, from Peloponnesus to the Black Sea. His majesty was displayed in the silver arms and rich trappings of the companies of horse guards, and the emperor was attended by a train of nobles and princes, some of whom, in rapid succession, had been clothed with the purple, and were indulged by the lenity of the times, in a life of affluence and dignity. Their youthful ardor might animate the multitude, but their love of pleasure and contempt of subordination were pregnant with disorder and mischief, and their importunate clamors for speedy and decisive action soon disconcerted the prudence of Alexius, who might have surrounded and starved the besieging army. The enumeration of provinces recalls a sad comparison of the past and present limits of the Roman world. The raw levies were drawn together in haste and terror, and the garrisons of Anatolia or Asia Minor had been purchased by the evacuation of the cities, which were immediately occupied by the Turks. The strength of the Greek army consisted in the Varangians, the Scandinavian guards, whose numbers were recently augmented by a colony of exiles and volunteers from the British island of Thule. Under the yoke of the Norman conqueror, the Danes and English were oppressed and united. A band of adventurous youths resolved to desert a land of slavery. The sea was open to their escape, and in their love of pilgrimage they visited every coast that afforded any hope of liberty and revenge. They were entertained in the service of the Greek emperor, and their first station was in a new city on the Asiatic shore. But Alexius soon recalled them to the defense of his person and palace, and bequeathed to his successors the inheritance of their faith and valor. The name of a Norman invader revived the memory of their wrongs. They marched with alacrity against the national foe, and panted to regain in Epirus the glory which they had lost in the Battle of Hastings. The Varangians were supported by some companies of Franks or Latins, and the rebels, who had fled to Constantinople from the tyranny of Guiscard, were eager to signalize their zeal and gratify their revenge. In this emergency, the emperor had not disdained the impure aid of the Paulicians or Manichaeans of Thrace and Bulgaria, and these heretics, united with the patience of martyrdom and the spirit and discipline of active valor, the treaty with the sultan had procured a supply of some thousand Turks, 
and the arrows of the Scythian horse were oppressed to the lances of the Norman cavalry. On the report and distant prospect of these formidable numbers, Robert assembled a council of his principal officers. You behold, said he, your danger, it is urgent and inevitable. The hills are covered with arms and standards, and the emperor of the Greeks is accustomed to wars and triumphs. Obedience and union are our only safety, and I am ready to yield the command to a more worthy leader. The vote and acclamation, even of his secret enemies, assured him, in that perilous moment, of their esteem and confidence, and the duke thus continued, Let us trust in the rewards of victory, and deprive cowardice as the means of escape. Let us burn our vessels and our baggage, and give battle on this spot, as if it were the place of our nativity and our burial. The resolution was unanimously approved, and without confining himself to his lines, Guiscard awaited in battle array the nearer approach of the enemy. His rear was covered by a small river, his right wing extended to the sea, his left to the hills, nor was he conscious, perhaps, that on the same ground Caesar and Pompey had formerly disputed the empire of the world. Against the advice of his wisest captains, Alexius resolved to risk the event of a general action, and exhorted the garrison of Durazzo to assist their own deliverance by a well-timed sally from the town. He marched in two columns to surprise the Normans before daybreak on two different sides. His light cavalry was scattered over the plain, the archers formed the second line, and the Varangians claimed the honors of the vanguard. In the first onset, the battle-axes of the strangers made a deep and bloody impression on the army of Guiscard, which was now reduced to fifteen thousand men. The Lombards and Calabrians ignominiously turned their backs. They fled towards the river and the sea, but the bridge had been broken down to check the sally of the garrison, and the coast was lined with the Venetian galleys, who played their engines among the disorderly throng. On the verge of ruin, they were saved by the spirit and conduct of their chiefs. Gaeta, the wife of Robert, is painted by the Greeks as a warlike Amazon, a second Pallas, less skillful in arts, but not less terrible in arms. And the Athenian goddess, though wounded by an arrow, she stood her ground, and strove, by her exhortation and example, to rally the flying troops. Her female voice was seconded by the more powerful voice and arms of the Norman duke, as calm in action as he was magnanimous in counsel. Whither, he cried aloud, whither do ye fly? Your enemy is implacable, and death is less grievous than servitude. The moment was decisive. As the Varangians advanced before the battle line, they discovered the nakedness of their flanks. The main battle of the duke, of eight hundred knights, stood firm and entire. They couched their lances, and the Greeks deplored the furious and irresistible shock of the French cavalry. Alexius was not deficient in the duties of a soldier or a general, but he no sooner beheld the slaughter of the Varangians and the flight of the Turks than he despised his subjects and despaired of his fortune. The Princess Anne, who drops a tear on this melancholy event, is reduced to praise the strength and swiftness of her father's horse, and his vigorous struggle when he was almost overthrown by the stroke of a lance which had shivered the imperial helmet. His desperate valor broke through a squadron of Franks who opposed his flight, and after wandering two days and as many nights in the mountains, he found some repose of body, though not of mind, in the walls of Lychnidus. The victorious Robert reproached the tardy and feeble pursuit which had suffered the escape of so illustrious a prize, but he consoled his disappointment by the trophies and standards of the field, the wealth and luxury of the Byzantine camp, and the glory of defeating an army five times more numerous than his own. A multitude of Italians had been the victims of their own fears, but only thirty of his knights were slain in this memorable day. In the Roman host the loss of Greeks, Turks, and English amounted to five or six thousand, the plain of Durazzo was stained with noble and royal blood, and the end of the impostor Michael was more honorable than his life. It is more probable that Guiscard was not affected by the loss of a costly pageant, which had only merited the contempt and derision of the Greeks. 
After their defeat, they still preserved in the defense of Durazzo, and a Venetian commander supplied the place of George Paleogis, who had been imprudently called away from his station. The tents of the besiegers were converted into barracks to sustain the inclemency of the winter, and in answer to the defiance of the garrison, Robert insinuated that his patience was at least equal to their obstinacy. Perhaps he already trusted to his secret correspondence with the Venetian noble, who sold the city for a rich and honorable marriage. At the dead of night, several rope ladders were dropped from the walls, the light Calabrians ascended in silence, and the Greeks were awakened by the name and trumpets of the conqueror. Yet they defended their streets three days against an enemy already master of the rampart, and near seven months elapsed between the first investment and the final surrender of the place. From Durazzo, the Norman duke advanced into the heart of Epirus, or Albania, traversed the first mountains of Thessaly, surprised three hundred English in the city of Castoria, approached Thessalonica, and made Constantinople tremble. A more pressing duty suspended the prosecution of his ambitious designs. By shipwreck, pestilence, and the sword, his army was reduced to a third of their original numbers, and instead of being recruited from Italy, he was informed by plaintive epistles of the mischiefs and dangers which had been produced by his absence, the revolt of the cities and barons of Apulia, the distress of the Pope, and the approach or invasion of Henry, King of Germany. Highly presuming that his person was sufficient for the public safety, he repassed the sea in a single brigantine, and left the remains of the army under the command of his son and the Norman counts, exhorting Bohemond to respect the freedom of his peers, and the counts to obey the authority of their leader. The son of Guiscard trod in the footsteps of his father, and the two destroyers are compared by the Greeks to the caterpillar and the locust the last of whom devours whatever has escaped the teeth of the former. After winning two battles against the emperor, he descended into the plain of Thessaly, and besieged Larissa, the fabulous realm of Achilles, which contained the treasure and magazines of the Byzantine camp. Yet a just praise must not be refused to the fortitude and prudence of Alexius, who bravely struggled with the calamities of the times. In the poverty of the state, he presumed to borrow the superfluous ornaments of the churches. The desertion of the Manichaeans was supplied by some tribes of Moldavia. A reinforcement of seven thousand Turks replaced and revenged the loss of their brethren, and the Greek soldiers were exercised to ride, to draw the bow, and to the daily practice of ambuscades and evolutions. Alexius had been taught by experience that the formidable cavalry of the Franks on foot was unfit for action, and almost incapable of motion. His archers were directed to aim their arrows at the horse rather than the man, and a variety of spikes and snares were scattered over the ground on which he might expect an attack. In the neighborhood of Larissa, the events of war were protracted and balanced. The courage of Bohemond was always conspicuous and often successful, but his camp was pillaged by a stratagem of the Greeks, the city was impregnable, and the venal or discontented counts deserted his standard, betrayed their trusts, and enlisted in the service of the emperor. Alexius returned to Constantinople with the advantage rather than the honor of victory. After evacuating the conquests, which he could no longer defend, the son of Guiscard embarked for Italy, and was embraced by a father who esteemed his merit and sympathized in his misfortune. Of the Latin princes, the allies of Alexius and enemies of Robert, the most prompt and powerful was Henry the Third or Fourth, King of Germany and Italy, and future Emperor of the West. The epistle of the Greek monarch to his brother is filled with the warmest professions of friendship, and the most lively desire of strengthening their alliance by every public and private tie. He congratulates Henry on his success in a just and pious war, and complains that the prosperity of his own empire is disturbed by the audacious enterprises of the Norman Robert. The lists of his presence expresses the manners of the age, a radiated crown of gold, a cross set with pearls to hang on the breast, a case of relics, 
with the names and titles of the saints, a vase of crystal, a vase of sardonyx, some balm, most probably of Mecca, and one hundred pieces of purple. To these he added a more solid present, of one hundred and forty-four thousand Byzantines of gold, with a further assurance of two hundred and sixteen thousand, so soon as Henry should have entered in arms the Apulian territories, and confirmed by an oath the league against the common enemy. The German, who was already in Lombardy, at the head of an army and a faction, accepted these liberal offers, and marched towards the south. His speed was checked by the sound of the Battle of Durazzo, but the influence of his arms or name in the hasty return of Robert was a full equivalent for the Grecian bribe. Henry was the severe adversary of the Normans, the allies and vassals of Gregory the Seventh, his implacable foe. The long quarrel of the throne and Mitri had been recently kindled by the zeal and ambition of that haughty priest. The king and the pope had degraded each other, and each had seated a rival on the temporal or spiritual throne of his antagonist. After the defeat and death of his Swabian rebel, Henry descended into Italy to assume the imperial crown and to drive from the Vatican the tyrant of the church. But the Roman people adhered to the cause of Gregory. Their resolution was fortified by supplies of men and money from Apulia, and the city was thrice ineffectually besieged by the king of Germany. In the fourth year he corrupted, as it is said, with Byzantine gold the nobles of Rome, whose estates and castles had been ruined by the war. The gates, the bridges, fifty hostages were delivered into his hands. The anti-pope, Clement III, was consecrated in the Lateran. The grateful pontiff crowned his protector in the Vatican, and the emperor Henry fixed his residence in the capital as the lawful successor of Augustus and Charlemagne. The ruins of the Septizonium were still defended by the nephew of Gregory. The pope himself was invested in the castle of St. Angelo, and his last hope was in the courage and fidelity of his Norman vassal. Their friendship had been interrupted by some reciprocal injuries and complaints, but on this pressing occasion Guiscard was urged by the obligation of his oath, by his interest, more potent than oaths, by the love of fame, and his enmity of the two emperors. Unfurling the holy banner, he resolved to fly to the relief of the prince of the apostles. The most numerous of his armies, six thousand horse and thirty thousand foot, was instantly assembled, and his march from Salerno to Rome was animated by the public applause and the promise of the divine favor. Henry, invincible in sixty-six battles, trembled at his approach, recollected some indispensable affairs that required his presence in Lombardy, exhorted the Romans to preserve in their allegiance, and hastily retreated three days before the entrance of the Normans. In less than three years the son of Tancray of Hauteville enjoyed the glory of delivering the Pope and of compelling the two emperors of the East and West to fly before his victorious arms but the triumph of Robert was clouded by the calamities of Rome. By the aid of the friends of Gregory, the walls had been perforated or scaled, but the imperial faction was still powerful and active. On the third day the people rose in a furious tumult, and a hasty word of the conqueror, in his defense or revenge, was the signal of fire and pillage. The Saracens of Sicily, the subjects of Roger and auxiliaries of his brother, embraced this fair occasion of rifling and profaning the holy city of the Christians. Many thousands of the citizens, in the sight and by the allies of their spiritual father, were exposed to violation, captivity, or death, and a spacious quarter of the city, from the Lateran to the Colosseum, was consumed by the flames and devoted to perpetual solitude. From a city where he was now hated, and might be no longer feared, Gregory retired to end his days in the palace of Salerno. The artful pontiff might flatter the vanity of Guiscard with the hope of a Roman or imperial crown, but this dangerous measure, which would have inflamed the ambition of the Norman, must forever have alienated the most faithful princes of Germany. The deliverer and scourge of Rome might have indulged himself in a season of repose, 
but in the same year the flight of the German emperor, the indefatigable Robert resumed the design of his eastern conquests. The zeal or gratitude of Gregory had promised to his valor the kingdoms of Greece and Asia. His troops were assembled in arms, flushed with success and eager for action. Their numbers, in the language of Homer, are compared by Anna to a swarm of bees. Yet the utmost and moderate limits of the powers of Guiscard have been already defined. They were contained on the second occasion in one hundred and twenty vessels, and as the season was far advanced, the harbor of Brundusium was preferred to the open road of Otranto. Alexius, apprehensive of a second attack, had assiduously labored to restore the naval forces of the empire, and obtained from the Republic of Venice an important succor of thirty-six transports, fourteen galleys, and nine galliots, or ships of extraordinary strength and magnitude. Their services were liberally paid by the license or monopoly of trade, a profitable gift of many shops and houses in the port of Constantinople, and a tribute to St. Mark, the more acceptable, as it was the produce of attacks on their rivals at Amalfi. By the union of the Greeks and Venetians, the Adriatic was covered with a hostile fleet, but their own neglect, or the vigilance of Robert, the change of a wind, or the shelter of a mist, opened a free passage, and the Norman troops were safely disembarked on the coast of Epirus. With twenty strong and well-appointed galleys, their intrepid duke immediately sought the enemy, and though more accustomed to fight on horseback, he trusted his own life, and the lives of his brother and two sons, to the event of a naval combat. The dominion of the sea was disputed in three engagements, in sight of the Isle of Corfu. In the two former, the skill and numbers of the allies were superior, but in the third, the Normans obtained a final and complete victory. The light brigantines of the Greeks were scattered in ignominious flight. The nine castles of the Venetians maintained a more obstinate conflict. Seven were sunk, two were taken, two thousand five hundred captives implored in vain the mercy of the victor, and the daughter of Alexius deplores the loss of thirteen thousand of his subjects or allies. The want of experience had been supplied by the genius of Guiscard, and each evening, when he had sounded a retreat, he calmly explored the causes of his repulse, and invented new methods how to remedy his own defects and to baffle the advantages of the enemy. The winter season suspended his progress. With the return of spring, he again aspired to the conquest of Constantinople. But instead of traversing the hills of Epirus, he turned his arms against Greece and the islands, where the spoils would repay the labor, and where the land and sea forces might pursue their joint operations with vigor and effect. But in the isle of Cephalonia, his projects were fatally blasted by an epidemical disease. Robert himself, in the seventieth year of his age, expired in his tent, and a suspicion of poison was imputed by public rumor to his wife or to the Greek emperor. This premature death might allow a boundless scope for the imagination of his future exploits, and the event sufficiently declared that the Norman greatness was founded on his life Without the appearance of an enemy, a victorious army dispersed or retreated in disorder and consternation, and Alexius, who had trembled for his empire, rejoiced in his deliverance. The galley which transported the remains of Guiscard was shipwrecked on the Italian shore, but the duke's body was recovered from the sea and deposited in the sepulchre of Venusia, a place more illustrious for the birth of Horus than for the burial of the Norman heroes. Roger, his second son and successor, immediately sunk to the humble station of a duke of Apulia. The esteem or partiality of his father left the valiant Bohemond to the inheritance of his sword. The national tranquillity was disturbed by his claims, till the first crusade against the infidels of the East opened a more splendid field of glory and conquest. Of human life, the most glorious or humble prospects are alike and soon bounded by the sepulchre. 
the male line of Robert Guiscard was extinguished, both in Apulia and at Antioch, in the second generation, but his younger brother became the father of a line of kings, and the son of the great count was endowed with the name, the conquests, and the spirit of the first Roger. The heir of that Norman adventurer was born in Sicily, and, at the age of only four years, he succeeded to the sovereignty of the island, a lot which reason might envy, could she indulge for a moment the visionary, though virtuous wish, of dominion. Had Roger been content with his fruitful patrimony, a happy and grateful people might have blessed their benefactor, and if a wise administration could have restored the prosperous times of the Greek colonies, the opulence and power of Sicily might have equaled the widest scope that could be acquired and desolated by the sword of war. But the ambition of the great count was ignorant of these noble pursuits. It was gratified by the vulgar means of violence and artifice. He sought to obtain the undivided possession of Palermo, of which when moiety had been ceded to the elder branch, struggled to enlarge his Calabrian limits beyond the measure of former treaties, and impatiently watched the declining health of his cousin William of Apulia, the grandson of Robert. On the first intelligence of his premature death, Roger sailed from Palermo with seven galleys, cast anchor in the Bay of Salerno, received after ten days' negotiation an oath of fidelity from the Norman capital, commanded the submission of the barons, and extorted a legal investiture from the reluctant popes, who could not long endure either the friendship or enmity of a powerful vassal. The sacred spot of Benevento was respectfully spared as the patrimony of St. Peter, but the reduction of Capua and Naples completed the design of his uncle Guiscard, and the sole inheritance of the Norman conquests was possessed by the victorious Roger. A conscious superiority of power and merit prompted him to disdain the titles of Duke and of Count, and the Isle of Sicily, with a third, perhaps, of the continent of Italy, might form the basis of a kingdom which would only yield to the monarchies of France and England. The chiefs of the nation who attended his coronation at Palermo might doubtless pronounce under what name he should reign over them, but the example of a Greek tyrant or a Saracen emir was insufficient to justify his regal character, and the nine kings of the Latin world might disclaim their new associate unless he were consecrated by the authority of the supreme pontiff. The pride of Anacletus was pleased to confer a title, which the pride of the Norman had stooped to solicit, but his own legitimacy was attacked by the adverse election of Innocent the Second, and while Anacletus sat in the Vatican, the successful fugitive was acknowledged by the nations of Europe. The infant monarchy of Roger was shaken, and almost overthrown, by the unlucky choice of an ecclesiastical patron, and the sword of Lothair the Second of Germany, the excommunications of Innocent, the fleets of Pisa, and the zeal of St. Bernard, were united for the ruin of the Sicilian robber. After a gallant resistance, the Norman prince was driven from the continent of Italy. A new duke of Apulia was invested by the pope and the emperor, each of whom held one end of the gonfanon, or flagstaff, as a token that they asserted their right and suspended their quarrel. But such jealous friendship was of short and precarious duration, the German armies soon vanquished in disease and desertion. The Apulian duke, with all his adherents, was exterminated by a conqueror who seldom forgave either the dead or the living. Like his predecessor Leo the Ninth, the feeble though haughty pontiff became the captive and friend of the Normans, and their reconciliation was celebrated by the eloquence of Bernard, who now revered the title and virtues of the king of Sicily. As a penance for his impious war against the successor of St. Peter, that monarch might have promised to display the banner of the cross, and he accomplished with ardor a vow so propitious to his interest and revenge. The recent injuries of Sicily might provoke a just retaliation on the heads of the Saracens. 
the Normans, whose blood had been mingled with so many subject streams, were encouraged to remember and emulate the naval trophies of their fathers, and in the maturity of their strength they contended with the decline of an African power. When the Fatime Caliph departed for the conquest of Egypt, he rewarded the real merit and apparent fidelity of his servant Joseph with the gift of his royal mantle and forty Arabian horses, his palace with its sumptuous furniture, and the government of the kingdoms of Tunis and Algiers. The Zirides, the descendants of Joseph, forgot their allegiance and gratitude to a distant benefactor, grasped and abused the fruits of prosperity, and after running the little course of an oriental dynasty, were now fainting in their own weakness. On the side of the land they were pressed by the Almohades, the fanatic princes of Morocco, while the sea-coast was open to the enterprises of the Greeks and Franks, who, before the close of the eleventh century, had extorted a ransom of two hundred thousand pieces of gold. By the first arms of Roger, the island or rock of Malta, which has been since ennobled by a military and religious colony, was inseparably annexed to the crown of Sicily. Tripoli, a strong and maritime city, was the next object of his attack, and the slaughter of the males, the captivity of the females, might be justified by the frequent practice of the Moslems themselves. The capital of the Zirides was named Africa from the country, and Mahadia from the Arabian founder. It is strongly built on a neck of land, but the imperfection of the harbor is not compensated by the fertility of the adjacent plain. Mahadia was besieged by George the Sicilian admiral, with a fleet of one hundred and fifty galleys, amply provided with men and the instruments of mischief. The sovereign had fled, the Moorish governor refused to capitulate, declined the last and irresistible assault, and secretly escaping with the Moslem inhabitants, abandoned the place and its treasures to the rapacious Franks. In successive expeditions, the king of Sicily or his lieutenants reduced the cities of Tunis, Safax, Caspia, Bona, and a long tract of the sea-coast. The fortresses were garrisoned, the country was tributary, and a boast that it held Africa in subjection might be inscribed with some flattery on the sword of Roger. After his death, that sword was broken, and these transmarine possessions were neglected, evacuated or lost, under the troubled reign of his successor. The triumphs of Scipio and Belisarius have proved that the African continent is neither inaccessible nor invincible, yet the great princes and powers of Christendom have repeatedly failed in their armaments against the Moors, who may still glory in the easy conquest and long servitude of Spain. Since the decease of Robert Guiscard, the Normans had relinquished above sixty years their hostile designs against the empire of the East. The policy of Roger solicited a public and private union with the Greek princes, whose alliance would dignify his regal character. He demanded in marriage a daughter of the Comnenian family, and the first steps of the treaty seemed to promise a favorable event. But the contemptuous treatment of his ambassadors exasperated the vanity of the new monarch, and the insolence of the Byzantine court was expiated, according to the laws of nations, by the sufferings of a guiltless people. With the fleet of seventy galleys, George, the admiral of Sicily, appeared before Corfu, and both the island and city were delivered into his hands by the disaffected inhabitants, who had yet to learn that a siege is still more calamitous than a tribute. In this invasion, of some moment in the annals of commerce, the Normans spread themselves by sea and over the provinces of Greece, and the venerable age of Athens, Thebes, and Corinth was violated by rapine and cruelty. Of the wrongs of Athens, no memorial remains. The ancient walls, which encompassed without guarding the opulence of Thebes, were scaled by the Latin Christians. But their sole use of the gospel was to sanctify an oath that the lawful owners had not secreted any relic of their inheritance or industry. On the approach of the Normans, the lower town of Corinth was evacuated. The Greeks retired to the citadel, which was seated on a lofty eminence 
abundantly watered by the classic fountain of Pyrene, an impregnable fortress, if the want of courage could be balanced by any advantages of art or nature, as soon as the besiegers had surmounted the labor, their sole labor, of climbing the hill, their general, from the commanding eminence, admired his own victory, and testified his gratitude to heaven by tearing from the altar the precious image of Theodore, the tutelary saint. The silk weavers of both sexes, whom George transported to Sicily, composed the most valuable part of the spoil, and in comparing the skillful industry of the mechanic with the sloth and cowardice of the soldier, he was heard to exclaim that the distaff and loom were the only weapons which the Greeks were capable of using. The progress of this naval armament was marked by two conspicuous events, the rescue of the king of France and the insult of the Byzantine capital. In his return by sea from an unfortunate crusade, Louis the Seventh was intercepted by the Greeks, who basely violated the laws of honor and religion. The fortunate encounter of the Norman fleet delivered the royal captive, and after a free and honorable entertainment in the court of Sicily, Louis continued his journey to Rome and Paris. In the absence of the emperor, Constantinople and the Hellespont were left without defense and without the suspicion of danger. The clergy and people, for the soldiers had followed the standard of Manuel, were astonished and dismayed at the hostile appearance of a line of galleys, which boldly cast anchor in the front of the imperial city. The forces of the Sicilian admiral were inadequate to the siege or assault of an immense and populous metropolis, but George enjoyed the glory of humbling the Greek arrogance, and of marking the path of conquest to the navies of the west. He landed some soldiers to rifle the fruits of the gardens, and pointed with silver, or most probably with fire, the arrows which he discharged against the palace of the Caesars. This playful outrage of the pirates of Sicily, who had surprised an unguarded moment, Manuel affected to despise, while his martial spirit and the forces of the empire were awakened to revenge. The archipelago and Ionian Sea were covered with his squadrons and those of Venice, but I know not by what favorable allowance of transports, victuallers, and pinnaces, our reason or even our fancy can be reconciled to the stupendous account of fifteen hundred vessels which is proposed by a Byzantine historian. These operations were directed with prudence and energy. In his homeward voyage, George lost nineteen of his galleys, which were separated and taken. After an obstinate defense, Corfu implored the clemency of her lawful sovereign, nor could a ship, a soldier of the Norman prince, be found unless as a captive within the limits of the eastern empire. The prosperity and the health of Roger were already in a declining state, while he listened in his palace of Palermo to the messengers of victory or defeat, the invincible Manuel, the foremost in every assault, was celebrated by the Greeks and Latins. A prince of such a temper could not be satisfied with having repelled the insolence of a barbarian. It was the right and duty, it might be the interest and glory, of Manuel to restore the ancient majesty of the empire, to recover the provinces of Italy and Sicily, and to chastise this pretended king, the grandson of a Norman vassal. The natives of Calabria were still attached to the Greek language and worship, which had been inexorably proscribed by the Latin clergy. After the loss of her dukes, Apulia was chained as a servile appendage to the crown of Sicily. The founder of the monarchy had ruled by the sword, and the death had abated the fear, without healing the discontent of his subjects. The feudal government was always pregnant with the seeds of rebellion, and a nephew of Roger himself invited the enemies of his family and nation. The majesty of the purple, and a series of Hungarian and Turkish wars, prevented Manuel from embarking his person in the Italian expedition. To the brave and noble Paleogis, his lieutenant, the Greek monarch entrusted a fleet and army. 
the siege of Bari was his first exploit, and in every operation gold as well as steel was the instrument of victory. Salerno, and some places along the western coast, maintained their fidelity to the Norman king, but he lost in two campaigns the greater part of his continental possessions, and the modest emperor, disdaining all flattery and falsehood, was content with the reduction of three hundred cities or villages of Apulia and Calabria, whose names and titles were inscribed on all the walls of the palace. The prejudices of the Latins were gratified by a genuine or fictitious donation under the seal of the German Caesars, but the successor of Constantine soon renounced this ignominious pretense, claimed the indefeasible dominion of Italy, and professed his design of chasing the barbarians beyond the Alps. By the artful speeches, liberal gifts, and unbounded promises of their eastern ally, the free cities were encouraged to preserve in their generous struggle against the despotism of Frederick Barbarossa. The walls of Milan were rebuilt by the contributions of Manuel, and he poured, says the historian, a river of gold into the bosom of Ancona, whose attachment to the Greeks was fortified by the jealous enmity of the Venetians. The situation and trade of Ancona rendered it an important garrison in the heart of Italy. It was twice besieged by the arms of Frederick. The imperial forces were twice repulsed by the spirit of freedom. That spirit was animated by the ambassador of Constantinople, and the most intrepid patriots, the most faithful servants, were rewarded by the wealth and honors of the Byzantine court. The pride of Manuel disdained and rejected a barbarian colleague. His ambition was excited by the hope of stripping the purple from the German usurpers, and of establishing, in the west as in the east, his lawful title of sole emperor of the Romans. With this view, he solicited the alliance of the people and the bishop of Rome. Several of the nobles embraced the cause of the Greek monarch. The splendid nuptials of his niece with Odo Frangipani secured the support of that powerful family, and his royal standard, or the image, was entertained with due reverence in the ancient metropolis. During the quarrel between Frederick and Alexander the Third, the Pope twice received in the Vatican the ambassadors of Constantinople. They flattered his piety by the long-promised union of the two churches, tempted the avarice of his venal court, and extorted the Roman pontiff to seize the just provocation, the favorable moment, to humble the savage insolence of the Alemanni, and to acknowledge the true representative of Constantine and Augustus. But these Italian conquests, this universal reign, soon escaped from the hand of the Greek emperor. His first demands were eluded by the prudence of Alexander the Third, who paused on this deep and momentous revolution, nor could the Pope be seduced by a personal dispute to renounce the perpetual inheritance of the Latin name. After the reunion with Frederick, he spoke a more peremptory language, confirmed the acts of his predecessors, excommunicated the adherents of Manuel, and pronounced the final separation of the churches, or at least the empires of Constantinople and Rome. The free cities of Lombardy no longer remembered their foreign benefactor, and without preserving the friendship of Ancona, he soon incurred the enmity of Venice. By his own avarice, or the complaints of his subjects, the Greek emperor was provoked to arrest the persons and confiscate the effects of the Venetian merchants. This violation of the public faith exasperated a free and commercial people. One hundred galleys were launched and armed in as many days. They swept the coasts of Dalmatia and Greece, but after some mutual wounds, the war was terminated by an agreement inglorious to the empire, insufficient for the republic, and a complete vengeance of these and of fresh injuries was reserved for the succeeding generation. The lieutenant of Manuel had informed his sovereign that he was strong enough to quell any domestic revolt of Apulia and Calabria, but that his forces were inadequate to resist the impending attack of the king of Sicily. 
His prophecy was soon verified. The death of Paleogis devolved the military command on several chiefs, alike eminent in rank, alike defective in military talents. The Greeks were oppressed by land and sea, and a captive remnant that escaped the swords of the Normans and Saracens abjured all future hostility against the person or dominions of their conqueror. Yet the king of Sicily esteemed the courage and constancy of Manuel, who had landed a second army on the Italian shore. He respectfully addressed the new Justinian, solicited a peace or truce of thirty years, accepted as a gift the regal title, and acknowledged himself the military vassal of the Roman Empire. The Byzantine Caesars acquiesced in this shadow of dominion, without expecting, perhaps without desiring, the service of a Norman army, and the truce of thirty years was not disturbed by any hostilities between Sicily and Constantinople. About the end of that period, the throne of Manuel was usurped by an inhuman tyrant who had deserved the abhorrence of his country and mankind. The sword of William the Second, the grandson of Roger, was drawn by a fugitive of the Comnenian race, and the subjects of Andronicus might salute the strangers as friends, since they detested their sovereign as the worst of enemies. The Latin historians expatiate on the rapid progress of the four counts who invaded Romania with a fleet and army, and reduced many castles and cities to the obedience of the king of Sicily, the Greeks accuse and magnify the wanton and sacrilegious cruelties that were perpetrated in the sack of Thessalonica, the second city of the empire. The former deplore the fate of those invincible but unsuspecting warriors who were destroyed by the arts of a vanquished foe. The latter applaud in songs of triumph the repeated victories of their countrymen on the sea of Marmosa or Propontis, on the banks of the Strymon, and under the walls of Durazzo. A revolution which punished the crimes of Andronicus had united against the Franks the zeal and courage of the successful insurgents. Ten thousand were slain in battle, and Isaac Angelus, the new emperor, might indulge his vanity or vengeance in the treatment of four thousand captives. Such was the extent of the last contest between the Greeks and Normans, before the expiration of twenty years, the rival nations were lost or degraded in foreign servitude, and the successors of Constantine did not long survive to insult the fall of the Sicilian monarchy. The scepter of Roger successfully devolved to his son and grandson. They might be confounded under the name of William. They are strongly discriminated by the epithets of the bad and the good, but these epithets which appear to describe the perfection of vice and virtue, cannot strictly be applied to either of the Norman princes. When he was roused to arms by the danger and shame, the first William did not degenerate from the valor of his race, but his temper was slothful, his manners were dissolute, his passions headstrong and mischievous, and the monarch is responsible not only for his personal vices, but for those of Majo, the great admiral, who abused the confidence and conspired against the life of his benefactor. From the Arabian conquest, Sicily had imbibed a deep tincture of oriental manners, the despotism, the pomp, and even the harem of a sultan, and a Christian people was oppressed and insulted by the ascendant of the eunuchs, who openly professed or secretly cherished the religion of Mahomet. An eloquent historian of the times has delineated the misfortunes of his country, the ambition and fall of the ungrateful Majo, the revolt and punishment of his assassins, the imprisonment and deliverance of the king himself, the private feuds that arose from the public confusion, and the various forms of calamity and discord which afflicted Palermo, the island, and the continent during the reign of William I and the minority of his son. The youth, innocence, and beauty of William the Second endeared him to the nation. The factions were reconciled, the laws were revived, and from the manhood to the premature death of that amiable prince, 
Sicily enjoyed a short season of peace, justice, and happiness, whose value was enhanced by the remembrance of the past and the dread of futurity. The legitimate male posterity of Tancray of Hauteville was extinct in the person of the second William, but his aunt, the daughter of Roger, had married the most powerful prince of the age, and Henry the Sixth, the son of Frederick Barbarossa, descended from the Alps to claim the imperial crown and the inheritance of his wife. Against the unanimous wish of a free people, this inheritance could only be acquired by arms, and I am pleased to transcribe the style and sense of the historian Falcandus, who writes at the moment and on the spot with the feelings of a patriot and the prophetic eye of a statesman. Constantia, the daughter of Sicily, nursed from her cradle in the pleasures and plenty, and educated in the arts and manners of this fortunate isle, departed long since to enrich the barbarians with our treasures, and now returns with her savage allies to contaminate the beauties of her venerable parent. Already I behold the swarms of angry barbarians, our opulent cities, the places flourishing in a long peace, are shaken with fear, desolated by slaughter, consumed by rapine, and polluted by intemperance and lust. I see the massacre or captivity of our citizens, the rapes of our virgins and matrons. In this extremity, he interrogates a friend, how must the Sicilians act? By the unanimous election of a king of valor and experience, Sicily and Calabria might yet be preserved, for in the levity of the Apulians, ever eager for new revolutions, I can repose neither confidence nor hope. Should Calabria be lost, the lofty towers, the numerous youth, and the naval strength of Messina might guard the passage against a foreign invader. If the savage Germans coalesce with the pirates of Messina, if they destroy with fire the fruitful region so often wasted by the fires of Mount Etna, what resource will be left for the interior parts of the island? These noble cities, which should never be violated by the hostile footsteps of a barbarian? Katana has again been overwhelmed by an earthquake. The ancient virtue of Syracuse expires in poverty and solitude, but Palermo is still crowned with a diadem, and her triple walls enclose the active multitudes of Christians and Saracens. If the two nations, under one king, can unite for their common safety, they may rush on the barbarians with invincible arms. But if the Saracens, fatigued by a repetition of injuries, should now retire and rebel, if they should occupy the castles of the mountains and seacoast, the unfortunate Christians, exposed to a double attack, and placed, as it were, between the hammer and the anvil, must resign themselves to a hopeless and inevitable servitude. We must not forget that a priest here prefers his country to his religion, and that the Moslems, whose alliance he seeks, were still numerous and powerful in the state of Sicily. The hopes, or at least the wishes, of Falcandus were at first gratified by the free and unanimous election of Tancray, the grandson of the first king, whose birth was illegitimate, but whose civil and military virtues shone without a blemish. During four years, the term of his life and reign, he stood in arms on the farthest verge of the Apulian frontier, against the powers of Germany, and the restitution of a royal captive, of Constantia herself, without injury or ransom, may appear to surpass the most liberal measure of policy or reason. After his decease, the kingdom of his widow and infant son fell without a struggle, and Henry pursued his victorious march from Capua to Palermo. The political balance of Italy was destroyed by his success, and if the Pope and the free cities had consulted their obvious and real interest, they would have combined the powers of earth and heaven to prevent the dangerous union of the German Empire with the kingdom of Sicily. But the subtle policy, for which the Vatican has so often been praised or arraigned, was on this occasion blind and inactive, and if it were true 
that Celestine the Third had kicked away the imperial crown from the head of the prostrate Henry, such an act of impotent pride could serve only to cancel an obligation and provoke an enemy. The Genoese, who enjoyed a beneficial trade and establishment in Sicily, listened to the promise of his boundless gratitude and speedy departure. Their fleet commanded the Straits of Messina and opened the harbor of Palermo, and the first act of his government was to abolish the privileges and to seize the property of these imprudent allies. The last hope of Falcandus was defeated by the discord of the Christians and Mahometans. They fought in the capital. Several thousands of the latter were slain, but their surviving brethren fortified the mountains and disturbed above thirty years the peace of the island. By the policy of Frederick the Second, sixty thousand Saracens were transplanted to Nocera in Apulia. In their wars against the Roman Church, the emperor and his son Mainfroy were strengthened and disgraced by the service of the enemies of Christ, and this national colony maintained their religion and manners in the heart of Italy, till they were extirpated at the end of the thirteenth century by the zeal and revenge of the house of Anjou. All the calamities which the prophetic order had deplored were surpassed by the cruelty and avarice of the German conqueror. He violated the royal sepulchres and explored the secret treasures of the palace, Palermo, and the whole kingdom. The pearls and jewels, however precious, might be easily removed, but one hundred and sixty horses were laden with the gold and silver of Sicily. The young king, his mother and sisters, and the nobles of both sexes were separately confined in the fortresses of the Alps, and, on the slightest rumor of rebellion, the captives were deprived of life, of their eyes, or of the hope of posterity. Constantia herself was touched with sympathy for the miseries of her country, and the heiress of the Norman line might struggle to check her despotic husband, and to save the patrimony of her newborn son, of an emperor so famous in the next age under the name of Frederick the Second. Ten years after this revolution, the French monarchs annexed to their crown the Duchy of Normandy. The scepter of her ancient dukes had been transmitted by a granddaughter of William the Conqueror to the house of Plantagenet, and the adventurous Normans, who had raised so many trophies in France, England, and Ireland, in Apulia, Sicily, and the East, were lost, either in victory or servitude, among the Turks of the House of Seljuk, their revolt against Mahmud, conqueror of Hindostan, Tagrus subdues Persia and protects the caliphs, defeat and captivity of the emperor Romanus Diogenes by Alp Ursulin, power and magnificence of Malik Shah, Conquest of Asia Minor and Syria, State and Oppression of Jerusalem, Pilgrimages to the Holy Sepulchre. From the Isle of Sicily, the reader must transport himself beyond the Caspian Sea to the original seat of the Turks or Turkmans, against whom the First Crusade was principally directed. Their Scythian Empire of the sixth century was long since dissolved, but the name was still famous among the Greeks and Orientals and the fragments of the nation, each a powerful and independent people, were scattered over the desert from China to the Oxus and the Danube. The colony of Hungarians was admitted into the Republic of Europe, and the thrones of Asia were occupied by slaves and soldiers of Turkish extraction. While Apulia and Sicily were subdued by the Norman lance, a swarm of these northern shepherds overspread the kingdoms of Persia, their princes of the race of Seljuk erected a splendid and solid empire from Samarkand to the confines of Greece and Egypt, and the Turks have maintained their dominion in Asia Minor till the victorious crescent has been planted on the dome of St. Sophia. One of the greatest of the Turkish princes was Mahmud, or Mahmud, the Ghaznavide, who reigned in the eastern provinces of Persia one thousand years after the birth of Christ. His father, Sebekteji, was the slave of the slave of the slave of the commander of the faithful. But in this descent of servitude, the first degree was merely titular, since it was filled by the sovereign of Transoxiana and Khorasan, 
who still paid a nominal allegiance to the Caliph of Baghdad. The second rank was that of a minister of state, a lieutenant of the Samanides, who broke by his revolt the bonds of political slavery. But the third step was a state of real and domestic servitude in the family of that rebel, from which Sebektaji, by his courage and dexterity, ascended to the supreme command of the city and provinces of Ghazna, as the son-in-law and successor of his grateful master. The falling dynasty of the Samanides was at first protected, and at last overthrown by their servants, and in the public disorders the fortune of Mahmud continually increased. From him the title of sultan was first invented, and his kingdom was enlarged from Traxania to the neighborhood of Isiphan, from the shores of the Caspian to the mouth of the Indus. But the principal source of his fame and riches was the holy war which he waged against the Gentus of Hindustan. In this foreign narrative I may not consume a page, and a volume would scarcely suffice to recapitulate the battles and sieges of his twelve expeditions. Never was the Mussulman hero dismayed by the inclemency of the seasons, the height of the mountains, the breadth of the rivers, the barrenness of the desert, the multitudes of the enemy, or the formidable array of their elephants at war. The Sultan of Ghazna surpassed the limits of the conquests of Alexander. After a march of three months, over the hills of Kashmir and Tibet, he reached the famous city of Kinog, on the upper Ganges, and in a naval combat on one of the branches of the Indus, he fought and vanquished four thousand boats of the natives. Delhi, Lahore, and Multan were compelled to open their gates. The fertile kingdom of Gazarat attracted his ambition and tempted his stay, and his avarice indulged the fruitless project of discovering the golden and aromatic isles of the southern ocean. On payment of a tribute, the rajas preserved their dominions, the people their lives and fortunes, but to the religion of Hindustan, the zealous Mussulman was cruel and inexorable. Many hundred temples or pagodas were leveled to the ground, many thousand idols were demolished, and the servants of the Prophet were stimulated and rewarded by the precious materials of which they were composed. The pagoda of Sumnat was situate on the promontory of Guzarat, in the neighborhood of Diu, one of the last remaining possessions of the Portuguese. It was endowed with the revenue of two thousand villages. Two thousand Brahmins were consecrated to the service of the deity, whom they washed each morning and evening in water from the distant Ganges. The subordinate ministers consisted of three hundred musicians, three hundred barbers, and five hundred dancing girls, conspicuous for their birth or beauty. Three sides of the temple were protected by the ocean, the narrow isthmus was fortified by a natural or artificial precipice, and the city and adjacent country were peopled by a nation of fanatics. They confessed the sins and the punishment of Kinog and Delhi, but if the impious stranger should presume to approach their holy precincts, he would surely be overwhelmed by a blast of the divine vengeance. By this challenge the faith of Mahmud was animated to a personal trial of the strength of this Indian deity. Fifty thousand of his worshippers were pierced by the spear of the Muslims. The walls were scaled, the sanctuary was profaned, and the conqueror aimed a blow of his iron mace at the head of the idol. The trembling Brahmins are said to have offered ten million sterling for his ransom, and it was urged by the wisest counsellors that the destruction of a stone image would not change the hearts of the Gentus, and that such a sum might be dedicated to the relief of the true believers. Your reasons, replied the Sultan, are specious and strong, but never in the eyes of posterity shall Mahmud appear as a merchant of idols. He repeated his blows, and a treasure of pearls and rubies, concealed in the belly of the statue, explained in some degree the devout prodigality of the Brahmins. The fragments of the idol were distributed to Ghazna, Mecca, and Medina. Baghdad listened to the edifying tale, and Mahmud was saluted by the Caliph with the title of guardian of the fortune and faith of Mahomet. From the paths of blood, and such is the history of nations, I cannot refuse to turn aside to gather some flowers of science or virtue. The name of Mahmud the Ghaznavide is still venerable in the East. His subjects enjoyed the blessings of prosperity and peace, his vices were concealed by the veil of religion, and two familiar examples will testify his justice and magnanimity. 1. As he sat in the divan, an unhappy subject bowed before the throne, to accuse the insolence of a Turkish soldier who had driven him from his house and bed. Suspend your clamors, said Mahmud, inform me of his next visit, and ourself in person will judge and punish the offender. 
The Sultan followed his guide, invested the house with his guards, and extinguished the torches, pronounced the death of the criminal, who had been seized in the act of rapine and adultery. After the execution of his sentence, the lights were rekindled, Mahmud fell prostrate in prayer, and rising from the ground, demanded some homely fare, which he devoured with the voraciousness of hunger. The poor man, whose injury he had avenged, was unable to suppress his astonishment and curiosity, and the courteous monarch condescended to explain the motives of this singular behavior. I had reason to suspect that none, except one of my sons, could dare to perpetrate such an outrage, and I extinguished the lights that my justice might be blind and inexorable. My prayer was a thanksgiving on the discovery of the offender, and so painful was my anxiety that I had passed three days without food since the first moment of your complaint. 2. The Sultan of Ghazna had declared war against the dynasty of the Boides, the sovereigns of the western Persia. He was disarmed by an epistle of the Sultana mother, and delayed his invasion till the manhood of her son. During the life of my husband, said the artful regent, I was ever apprehensive of your ambition. He was a prince and a soldier worthy of your arms. He is now no more. His scepter has passed to a woman and a child, and you dare not attack their infancy and weakness. How inglorious would be your conquest, how shameful your defeat! And yet the event of war is in the hand of the Almighty. Avarice was the only defect that tarnished the illustrious character of Mahmud, and never has that passion been more richly satiated. The Orientals exceeded the measure of credibility in the account of millions of gold and silver, such as the avidity of man has never accumulated. In the magnitude of pearls, diamonds, and rubies, such as have never been produced by the workmanship of nature. Yet the soil of Hindustan is impregnated with precious minerals. Her trade in every age has attracted the gold and silver of the world, and her virgin spoils were rifled by the first of the Mohammedan conquerors. His behavior in the last days of his life evinces the vanity of these possessions, so laboriously won, so dangerously held, and so inevitably lost. He surveyed the vast and various chambers of the treasury of Ghazna, burst into tears, and again closed the doors, without bestowing any portion of the wealth which he could no longer hope to preserve. The following day he reviewed the state of his military force one hundred thousand foot, fifty five thousand horse, and thirteen hundred elephants of battle. He again wept the instability of human greatness, and his grief was embittered by the hostile progress of the Turkmans, whom he had introduced into the heart of his Persian kingdom. In the modern depopulation of Asia, the regular operation of government and agriculture is confined to the neighborhood of cities. And the distant country is abandoned to the pastoral tribes of Arabs, Kurds, and Turkmans. Of the last mentioned people, two considerable branches extend on either side of the Caspian Sea. The western colony can muster forty thousand soldiers, the eastern, less obvious to the traveler, but more strong and populous, has increased to the number of one hundred thousand families. In the midst of civilized nations, they preserve the manners of the Scythian desert. Remove their encampments with a change of seasons, and feed their cattle among the ruins of palaces and temples. Their flocks and herds are their only riches. Their tents, either black or white, according to the color of the banner, are covered with felt, and of a circular form. Their winter apparel is a sheepskin, a robe of cloth or cotton, their summer garment. The features of the men are harsh and ferocious, the countenance of their women is soft and pleasing. Their wandering life maintains the spirit and exercise of arms. They fight on horseback, and their courage is displayed in frequent contests with each other and with their neighbors. For the license of pasture, they pay a slight tribute to the sovereign of the land, but the domestic jurisdiction is in the hands of the chiefs and elders. The first emigration of the eastern Turkmans, the most ancient of the race, may be ascribed to the tenth century of the Christian era. In the decline of the caliphs and the weakness of their lieutenants, the barrier of the Yaxerxes was often violated. In each invasion, after the victory or retreat of their countrymen, some wandering tribe, embracing the Mohammedan faith, obtained a free encampment on the spacious plains and pleasant climate of Transoxania and Karizma. The Turkish slaves who aspired to the throne encouraged these emigrations which recruited their armies, awed their subjects and rivals, And protected the frontier against the wilder natives of Turkestan, and this policy was abused by Mahmud the Ghaznavid beyond the example of former times.
He was admonished of his error by the chief of the race of Seljuk, who dwelt in the territory of Bukhara. The Sultan had inquired what supply of men he could furnish for military service. If you send, replied Ishmael, one of these arrows into our camp, fifty thousand of your servants will mount on horseback. And if that number, continued Mahmud, should not be sufficient, send this second arrow to the horde of Balik, and you will find fifty thousand more. But, said the Ghaznavide, dissembling his anxiety, if I should stand in need of the whole force of your kindred tribes, dispatch my bow, was the last reply of Ishmael, and as it is circulated around, the summons will be obeyed by two hundred thousand horse. The apprehension of such formidable friendship induced Mahmud to transport the most obnoxious tribes into the heart of Khorasan, where they would be separated from their brethren of the river Oxus, and enclosed on all sides by the walls of obedient cities. But the face of the country was an object of temptation rather than terror, and the vigor of government was relaxed by the absence and death of the Sultan of Ghazna. The shepherds were converted into robbers, the bands of robbers were collected into an army of conquerors. As far as Isiphon and the Tigris, Persia was afflicted by their predatory inroads, and the Turkmans were not ashamed or afraid to measure their courage and numbers with the proudest sovereigns of Asia. Masud, the son and successor of Mahmud, had too long neglected the advice of his wisest Omras. Your enemies, they repeatedly urged, were in their origin a swarm of ants. They are now little snakes, and unless they be instantly crushed, they will acquire the venom and magnitude of serpents. After some alternatives of truce and hostility, after the repulse or partial success of his lieutenants, the Sultan marched in person against the Turkmans, who attacked him on all sides with barbarous shouts and irregular onset. Masud, says the Persian historian, plunged singly to oppose the torrent of gleaming arms, exhibiting such acts of gigantic force and valor as never a king had before displayed. A few of his friends, roused by his words and actions, and that innate horror which inspires the brave, seconded their lord so well that wheresoever he turned his fatal sword, the enemies were mowed down or retreated before him. But now, when victory seemed to blow on his standard, misfortune was active behind it. For when he looked round, he beheld almost his whole army, excepting that body he commanded in person, devouring the paths of flight. The Ghaznavide was abandoned by the cowardice or treachery of some generals of Turkish race, and this memorable day of Zendikan founded in Persia the dynasty of the shepherd kings. The victorious Turkmans immediately proceeded to the election of a king, and if the probable tale of a Latin historian deserves any credit, they determined by lot the choice of their new master. A number of arrows were successively inscribed with the name of a tribe, a family, and a candidate. They were drawn from the bundle by the hand of a child, and the important prize was obtained by Togro Beg, the son of Michael, the son of Seljuk, whose surname was immortalized in the greatness of his posterity. The Sultan Mahmud, who valued himself in his skill in national genealogy, professed his ignorance of the family of Seljuk, yet the father of that race appears to have been a chief of power and renown. For a daring intrusion into the harem of his prince, Seljuk was banished from Turkestan. With a numerous tribe of his friends and vassals, he passed the Yaxarxes, encamped in the neighborhood of Samarkand, embraced the religion of Mohammed, and acquired the crown of martyrdom in a war against the infidels. His age of a hundred and seven years surpassed the life of his son, and Seljuk adopted the care of his two grandsons, Togrul and Jafar, the eldest of whom, at the age of forty five, was invested with the title of Sultan in the royal city of Nishabur. The blind determination of chance was justified by the virtues of the successful candidate. It would be superfluous to praise the valor of a Turk, and the ambition of Togrul was equal to his valor. By his arms, the Ghaznavides were expelled from the eastern kingdoms of Persia, and gradually driven to the banks of the Indus in search of a softer and more wealthy conquest. In the west, he annihilated the dynasty of the Boides, and the scepter of Iraq passed from the Persian to the Turkish nation. The princes who had felt, or who feared, the Seljukian arrows bowed their heads in the dust. By the conquest of Azerbaijan, or Medea, he approached the Roman confines, and the shepherd presumed to dispatch an ambassador, or herald, to demand the tribute and obedience of the emperor of Constantinople. 
In his own dominions, Togrul was the father of his soldiers and people. By a firm and equal administration, Persia was relieved from the evils of anarchy, and the same hands which had been imbrued in blood became the guardians of justice and the public peace. The more rustic, perhaps the wisest, portion of the Turkmans continued to dwell in the tents of their ancestors, and from the Oxus to the Euphrates, these military colonies were protected and propagated by their native princes. But the Turks of the court and the city were refined by business and softened by pleasure. They imitated the dress, the language, and manners of Persia, and the royal palaces of Nishabur and Rey displayed the order and magnificence of a great monarchy. The most deserving of the Arabians and Persians were promoted to the honors of the state, and the whole body of the Turkish nation embraced, with fervor and sincerity, the religion of Mohammed. The northern swarms of barbarians, who overspread both Europe and Asia, have been irreconcilably separated by the consequences of a similar conduct. Among the Muslims, as among the Christians, their vague and local traditions have yielded to the reason and authority of the prevailing system, to the fame of antiquity, and the consent of nations. But the triumph of the Koran is more pure and meritorious, as it was not assisted by any visible splendor of worship which might allure the pagans by some resemblance of idolatry. The first of the Seljukian sultans was conspicuous by his zeal and faith. Each day he repeated the five prayers which are enjoined to the true believers. Of each week, the first two days were consecrated by an extraordinary fast, and in every city a mosque was completed before Togro presumed to lay the foundations of a palace. With the belief of the Koran, the son of Seljuk imbibed a lively reverence for the successor of the Prophet. But that sublime character was still disputed by the caliphs of Baghdad and Egypt, and each of the rivals was solicitous to prove his title in the judgment of the strong, though illiterate barbarians. Mahmud the Geznavide had declared himself in favor of the line of Abbas, and had treated with indignity the robe of honor which was presented by the Fatimite ambassador. Yet the ungrateful Hashemite had changed with the change of fortune. He applauded the victory of Zendikan, and named the Seljukian sultan his temporal vice-regent over the Muslim world. As Togrul executed and enlarged this important trust, he was called to the deliverance of the Caliph Kayem, and obeyed the holy summons, which gave a new kingdom to his arms. In the palace of Baghdad, the commander of the faithful still slumbered, a venerable phantom. His servant or master, the prince of the Boides, could no longer protect him from the insolence of meaner tyrants, and the Euphrates and Tigris were oppressed by the revolt of the Turkish and Arabian emirs. The presence of a conqueror was implored as a blessing, and the transient mischiefs of fire and sword were excused as the sharp but salutary remedies which alone could restore the health of the republic. At the head of an irresistible force, the Sultan of Persia marched from Hamadan. The proud were crushed, the prostrate were spared, the prince of the Boides disappeared, the heads of the most obstinate rebels were laid at the feet of Togrul, and he inflicted a lesson of obedience on the people of Mosul and Baghdad. After the chastisement of the guilty and the restoration of peace, the royal shepherd accepted the reward of his labors, and a solemn comedy represented the triumph of religious prejudice over barbarian power. The Turkish sultan embarked on the Tigris, landed at the gate of Raqqa, and made his public entry on horseback. At the palace gate he respectfully dismounted and walked on foot, preceded by his emirs without arms. The caliph was seated behind his black veil, the black garment of the Abbasides was cast over his shoulders, and he held in his hand the staff of the Apostle of God. The conqueror of the East kissed the ground, stood some time in a modest posture, and was led towards the throne by the vizier and interpreter. After Togrul had seated himself on another throne, his commission was publicly read, which declared him the temporal lieutenant of the vicar of the prophet. He was successively invested with seven robes of honor, and presented with seven slaves, the natives of the seven climates of the Arabian Empire. His mystic veil was perfumed with musk, two crowns were placed on his head, two scimitars were girded to his side as the symbols of a double reign over the east and west. After this inauguration, the sultan was prevented from prostrating himself a second time, but he twice kissed the hand of the commander of the faithful, and his titles were proclaimed by the voice of the heralds and the applause of the Muslims. In a second visit to Baghdad, the Seljukian prince again rescued the caliph from his enemies, and devoutly, on foot, led the bridle of his mule from the prison to the palace.
Their alliance was cemented by the marriage of Togrul's sister with the successor of the Prophet. Without reluctance, he had introduced a Turkish virgin into his harem, but Kayyem proudly refused his daughter to the Sultan, disdained to mingle the blood of the Hashemites with the blood of a Scythian shepherd, and protracted the negotiation many months, till the gradual diminution of his revenue admonished him that he was still in the hands of a master. The royal nuptials were followed by the death of Trogrul himself, As he left no children, his nephew Alp Arsan succeeded to the title and prerogatives of Sultan, and his name, after that of the Caliph, was pronounced in the public prayers of the Muslims. Yet in this revolution, the Abbasides acquired a larger measure of liberty and power. On the throne of Asia, the Turkish monarchs were less jealous of the domestic administration of Baghdad, and the commanders of the faithful were relieved from the ignominious vexations to which they had been. Since the fall of the caliphs, the discord and degeneracy of the Saracens respected the Asiatic provinces of Rome, which, by the victories of Nisiphorus, Zemeskes, and Basil, had been extended as far as Antioch and the eastern boundaries of Armenia. Twenty-five years after the death of Basil, his successors were suddenly assaulted by an unknown race of barbarians, who united the Scythian valor with the fanaticism of new proselytes and the art and riches of a powerful monarchy. The myriads of Turkish horse overspread a frontier of six hundred miles from Taurus to Azram, and the blood of one hundred and thirty thousand Christians was a grateful sacrifice to the Arabian prophet. Yet the arms of Togrul did not make any deep or lasting impression on the Greek empire. The torrent rolled away from the open country, the sultan retired without glory or success from the siege of an Armenian city, the obscure hostilities were continued or suspended with the vicissitude of events, and the bravery of the Macedonian legions renewed the fame of the conqueror of Asia. The name of Alp Arslan, the valiant lion, is expressive of the popular idea of the perfection of a man, and the successor of Tulgrul displayed the fierceness and generosity of the royal animal. He passed the Euphrates at the head of the Turkish cavalry, and entered Caesarea, the metropolis of Cappadocia, to which he had been attracted by the fame and wealth of the temple of St. Basil. The solid structure resisted the destroyer, but he carried away the doors of the shrine encrusted with gold and pearls, and profaned the relics of the totaler saint, whose mortal frailties were now covered by the venerable rust of antiquity. The final conquest of Armenia and Georgia was achieved by Alp Arslan. In Armenia, the title of a kingdom and the spirit of a nation were annihilated. The artificial fortifications were yielded by the mercenaries of Constantinople, by strangers without faith, veterans without pay or arms, and recruits without experience or discipline. The loss of this important frontier was the news of a day, and the Catholics were neither surprised nor displeased that a people so deeply infected with the Nestorian and Eutychian errors had been delivered by Christ and his mother into the hands of the infidels. The woods and valleys of Mount Caucasus were more strenuously defended by the native Georgians or Iberians, but the Turkish Sultan and his son Malik were indefatigable in this holy war. Their captives were compelled to promise a spiritual as well as temporal obedience, and instead of their collars and bracelets, an iron horseshoe, a badge of ignominy, was imposed on the infidels who still adhered to the worship of their fathers. The change, however, was not sincere or universal, and through ages of servitude, the Georgians have maintained the succession of their princes and bishops. But a race of men, whom nature has cast in her most perfect mold, is degraded by poverty, ignorance, and vice. Their profession, and still more their practice, of Christianity is an empty name, and if they have emerged from heresy, it is only because they are too illiterate to remember a metaphysical creed. The false or genuine magnanimity of Mahmud the Ghaznavide was not imitated by Alp Arslan, and he attacked without scruple the Greek Empress Eudocia and her children. His alarming progress compelled her to give herself and her scepter to the hand of a soldier, and Romanus Diogenes was invested with the imperial purple. His patriotism, and perhaps his pride, urged him from Constantinople within two months after his accession, and the next campaign he most scandalously took the field during the holy festival of Easter. In the palace, Diogenes was no more than the husband of Eudocia. 
In the camp he was the emperor of the Romans, and he sustained that character with feeble resources and invincible courage. By his spirit and success the soldiers were taught to act, the subjects to hope, and the enemies to fear. The Turks had penetrated into the heart of Phrygia, but the Sultan himself had resigned to his emirs the prosecution of the war, and their numerous detachments were scattered over Asia in the security of conquest. Laden with spoil and careless of discipline, they were separately surprised and defeated by the Greeks. The activity of the emperor seemed to multiply his presence, and while they heard of his expedition to Antioch, the enemy felt his sword on the hills of Trebizond. In three laborious campaigns the Turks were driven beyond the Euphrates. In the fourth and last, Romanus undertook the deliverance of Armenia. The desolation of the land obliged him to transport a supply of two months' provisions, and he marched forwards to the siege of Malazkurd, an important fortress midway between the modern cities of Azurum and Van. His army amounted, at the least, to one hundred thousand men. The troops of Constantinople were reinforced by the disorderly multitudes of Phrygia and Cappadocia, but the real strength was composed of the subjects and allies of Europe, the legions of Macedonia, and the squadrons of Bulgaria. The Uzi, a Moldavian horde, who were themselves of the Turkish race, and above all, the mercenary and adventurous bands of French and Normans. Their lances were commanded by the valiant Ursul of Balliol, the kinsman or father of the Scottish kings. And were allowed to excel in the exercise of arms, or according to the Greek style, in the practice of the Phyric dance. On the report of this bold invasion, which threatened his hereditary dominions, Alp Arslan flew to the scene of action at the head of forty thousand horse. His rapid and skilful evolutions distressed and dismayed the superior numbers of the Greeks, and in the defeat of Basiliasius, one of their principal generals, he displayed the first example of his valor and clemency. The imprudence of the emperor had separated his forces after the reduction of Malazkurd. It was in vain that he attempted to recall the mercenary Franks, they refused to obey his summons, he disdained to await their return. The desertion of the Uzi filled his mind with anxiety and suspicion, and against the most salutary advice he rushed forwards to speedy and decisive action. Had he listened to the fair proposals of the Sultan, Romanus might have secured a retreat. Perhaps a peace, but in these overtures he suppressed the fear or weakness of the enemy, and his answer was conceived in the tone of insult and defiance. If the barbarian wishes for peace, let him evacuate the ground which he occupies for the encampment of the Romans, and surrender his city and palace of Ray as a pledge of his sincerity. Alp Arslan smiled at the vanity of the demand, but he wept the death of so many faithful Muslims. And after a devout prayer, proclaimed a free permission to all who were desirous of retiring from the field. With his own hands, he tied up his horse's tail, exchanged his bow and arrows for a mace and scimitar, clothed himself in a white garment, perfumed his body with musk, and declared that if he were vanquished, that spot should be the place of his burial. The Sultan himself had affected to cast away his missile weapons, but his hopes of victory were placed in the arrows of the Turkish cavalry. Whose squadrons were loosely distributed in the form of a crescent. Instead of the successive lines and reserves of the Grecian tactics, Romulus led his army in a single and solid phalanx, and pressed with vigor and impatience the artful and yielding resistance of the barbarians. In this desultory and fruitless combat, he spent the greater part of a summer's day, till prudence and fatigue compelled him to return to his camp. But a retreat is always perilous in the face of an active foe. And no sooner had the standard been turned to the rear than the phalanx was broken by the base cowardice, or the baser jealousy, of Andronicus, a rival prince who disgraced his birth and the purple of the Caesars. The Turkish squadrons poured a cloud of arrows on this moment of confusion and lassitude, and the horns of their formidable crescent were closed in the rear of the Greeks. In the destruction of the army and pillage of the camp, it would be needless to mention the number of the slain or captives. The Byzantine writers deplore the loss of an inestimable pearl. They forgot to mention that in this fatal day the Asiatic provinces of Rome were irretrievably sacrificed. As long as a hope survived, Romanus attempted to rally and save the relics of his army. When the centre, the imperial station, was left naked on all sides and encompassed by the victorious Turks, he still, with desperate courage, maintained the fight till the close of day. 
at the head of the brave and faithful subjects who adhered to his standard. They fell around him, his horse was slain, the emperor was wounded, yet he stood alone and intrepid till he was oppressed and bound by the strength of multitudes. The glory of this illustrious prize was disputed by a slave and a soldier, a slave who had seen him on the throne of Constantinople, and a soldier whose extreme deformity had been excused on the promise of some signal service. Despoiled of his arms, his jewels, and his purple, Romanus spent a dreary and perilous night on the field of battle, amidst a disorderly crowd of the meaner barbarians. In the morning the royal captive was presented to Alp Arslan, who doubted of his fortune till the identity of the person was ascertained by the report of his ambassadors, and by the more pathetic evidence of Balsalasius, who embraced with tears the feet of his unhappy sovereign. The successor of Constantine, in a plebeian habit, was led into the Turkish divan, and commanded to kiss the ground before the lord of Asia. He reluctantly obeyed, and Alp Arslan, starting from his throne, is said to have planted his foot on the neck of the Roman emperor. But the fact is doubtful, and if, in this moment of insolence, the sultan complied with the national custom, the rest of his conduct has extorted the praise of his bigoted foes, and may afford a lesson to the most civilized ages. He instantly raised the royal captive from the ground, and thrice clasping his hand with tender sympathy, assured him that his life and dignity should be inviolate in the hands of a prince who had learned to respect the majesty of his equals and the vicissitudes of fortune. From the divan, Romanus was conducted to an adjacent tent, where he was served with pomp and reverence by the officers of the sultan, who twice each day seated him in the place of honor at his own table. In a free and familiar conversion of eight days, not a word, not a look of insult escaped from the conqueror, but he severely censured the unworthy subjects who had deserted their valiant prince in the hour of danger, and gently admonished his antagonist of some errors which he had committed in the management of the war. In the preliminaries of negotiation, Alp Arslan asked him what treatment he expected to receive, and the calm indifference of the emperor displayed the freedom of his mind. If you are cruel, said he, you will take my life. If you listen to pride, you will drag me at your chariot wheels. If you consult your interest, you will accept a ransom and restore me to my country. And what, continued the sultan, would have been your own behavior had fortune smiled on your arms? The reply of the Greek betrays a sentiment which prudence and even gratitude should have taught him to suppress. Had I vanquished, he fiercely said, I would have inflicted on thy body many a stripe. The Turkish conqueror smiled at the insolence of his captive, observed that the Christian law inculcated the love of enemies and forgiveness of injuries, and nobly declared that he would not imitate an example which he condemned. After mature deliberation, Alp Arslan dictated the terms of liberty and peace, a ransom of a million, an annual tribute of three hundred and sixty thousand pieces of gold, the marriage of the royal children, and the deliverance of all the Muslims who were in the power of the Greeks. Romanus, with a sigh, subscribed this treaty, so disgraceful to the majesty of the empire. He was immediately invested with a Turkish robe of honor, his nobles and patricians were restored to their sovereign, and the sultan, after a courteous embrace, dismissed him with rich presents and a military guard. No sooner did he reach the confines of the empire than he was informed that the palace and provinces had disclaimed their allegiance to a captive. A sum of two hundred thousand pieces was painfully collected, and the fallen monarch transmitted this part of his ransom, with a sad confession of his impotence and disgrace. The generosity, or perhaps the ambition, of the sultan prepared to espouse the cause of his ally, but his designs were prevented by the defeat, imprisonment, and death of Romanus Diogenes. In the treaty of peace, it does not appear that Alp Arslan extorted any province or city from the captive emperor. And his revenge was satisfied with the trophies of his victory and the spoils of Anatolia from Antioch to the Black Sea. The fairest part of Asia was subject to his laws. Twelve hundred princes, or the sons of princes, stood before his throne, and two hundred thousand soldiers marched under his banners. The sultan disdained to pursue the fugitive Greeks, but he meditated the more glorious conquest of Turkestan, the original seat of the House of Seljuk. He moved from Baghdad to the banks of the Oxus, a bridge was thrown over the river, and twenty days were consumed in the passage of his troops. But the progress of the great king was retarded by the governor of Berzem, and Joseph, the Charismian, presumed to defend his fortress, 
against the powers of the East. When he was produced a captive in the royal tent, the Sultan, instead of praising his valor, severely reproached his obstinate folly, and the insolent replies of the rebel provoked a sentence that he should be fastened to four stakes and left to expire in that painful situation. At this command, the desperate k a r a z m i a n drawing a dagger, rushed headlong towards the throne. The guards raised their battle axes. Their zeal was checked by Alp Arslan, the most skilful archer of the age. He drew his bow, but his foot slipped. The arrow glanced aside, and he received in his breast the dagger of Joseph, who was instantly cut in pieces. The wound was mortal, and the Turkish prince bequeathed a dying admonition to the pride of kings. In my youth, said Alp Arslan, I was advised by a sage to humble myself before God, to distrust my own strength, and never to despise the most contemptible foe. I have neglected these lessons, and my neglect has been deservedly punished. Yesterday, as from an eminence I beheld the numbers, the discipline, and the spirit of my armies, the earth seemed to tremble under my feet, and I said in my heart, Surely thou art the king of the world, the greatest and most invincible of warriors. These armies are no longer mine, and in the confidence of my personal strength I now fall by the hand of an assassin. Alp Arslan possessed the virtues of a Turk and a Mussulman. His voice and stature commanded the reverence of mankind. His face was shaded with long whiskers, and his ample turban was fashioned in the shape of a crown. The remains of the Sultan were deposited in the tomb of the Seljukian dynasty, and the passenger might read and meditate this useful inscription. O ye who have seen the glory of Alp Arslan exalted to the heavens, repair to Maru, and you will behold it buried in the dust. The annihilation of the inscription and the tomb itself more forcibly proclaims the instability of human greatness. During the life of Alp Arslan, his eldest son had been acknowledged as the future Sultan of the Turks. On his father's death, the inheritance was disputed by an uncle, a cousin, and a brother. They drew their scimitars and assembled their followers, and the triple victory of Malik Shah established his own reputation and the right of primogeniture. In every age, and more especially in Asia, the thirst of power has inspired the same passions and occasioned the same disorders. But from the long series of civil war, it would not be easy to extract a sentiment more pure and magnanimous than is contained in the saying of the Turkish prince. On the eve of battle, he performed his devotions at Thos, before the tomb of the Imam Riza. As the Sultan rose from the ground, he asked his vizier Nizam, who had knelt beside him, what had been the object of his secret petition. That your arms may be crowned with victory, was the prudent and most probably the sincere answer of the minister. For my part, replied the generous Malik, I implored the Lord of Hosts that he would take from me my life and crown, if my brother be more worthy than myself to reign over the Muslims. The favorable judgment of heaven was ratified by the Caliph, and for the first time the sacred title of commander of the faithful was communicated to a barbarian. But this barbarian, by his personal merit and the extent of his empire, was the greatest prince of his age. After the settlement of Persia and Syria, he marched at the head of innumerable armies to achieve the conquest of Turkestan, which had been undertaken by his father. In his passage of the Oxus, the boatman, who had been employed in transporting some troops, complained that their payment was assigned on the revenues of Antioch. The Sultan frowned at this preposterous choice, but he smiled at the artful flattery of his vizier. It was not to postpone their reward that I selected those remote places, but to leave a memorial to posterity that under your reign Antioch and the Oxus were subject to the same sovereign. But this description of his limits was unjust and parsimonious. Beyond the Oxus, he reduced to his obedience the cities of Bokhara, k a r i s m a and Samarkand, and crushed each rebellious slave or independent savage who dared to resist. Malik passed the Sihan or Yuxerxes, the last boundary of Persian civilization. The hordes of Turkestan yielded to his supremacy, his name was inserted on the coins, and in the prayers of Kashgar, a Tartar kingdom on the extreme borders of China. From the Chinese frontier, he stretched his immediate jurisdiction or feudatory sway to the west and south. As far as the mountains of Georgia, the neighborhood of Constantinople, the holy city of Jerusalem, and the spicy groves of Arabia Felix. 
Instead of resigning himself to the luxury of his harem, the shepherd king, both in peace and war, was in action and in the field. By the perpetual motion of the royal camp, each province was successively blessed with his presence, and he is said to have perambulated twelve times the wide extent of his dominions, which surpassed the Asiatic reign of Cyrus and the Caliphs. Of these pilgrimages, the most pious and splendid was the pilgrimage of Mecca. The freedom and safety of the caravans were protected by his arms, the citizens and pilgrims were enriched by the profusion of his alms, and the desert was cheered by the places of relief and refreshment which he instituted for the use of his brethren. Hunting was the pleasure and even the passion of the Sultan, and his train consisted of forty seven thousand horses. But after the massacre of a Turkish chase, for each piece of game he bestowed a piece of gold on the poor, a slight atonement at the expense of the people, for the cost and mischief of the amusement of kings. In the peaceful prosperity of his reign, the cities of Asia were adorned with palaces and hospitals, with mosques and colleges. Few departed from his divan without reward, and none without justice. The language and literature of Persia revived under the house of Seljuk, and if Malik emulated the liberality of a Turk less potent than himself, his palace might resound with the songs of a hundred poets. The Sultan bestowed a more serious and learned care on the reformation of the calendar, which was effected by a general assembly of the astronomers of the East. By a law of the Prophet, the Muslims are confined to the irregular course of the lunar months. In Persia, since the age of Zoroaster, the revolution of the sun has been known and celebrated as an annual festival. But after the fall of the Median Empire, the intercalculation had been neglected. The fractions of minutes and hours were multiplied into days, and the date of the springs was removed from the sign of Aries to that of Pisces. The reign of Malik was illustrated by the Galilean era, and all errors, either past or future, were corrected by a computation of time, which surpasses the Julian and approaches the accuracy of the Gregorian style. In a period when Europe was plunged into the deepest barbarism, the light and splendor of Asia may be ascribed to the docility rather than the knowledge of the Turkish conquerors. An ample share of their wisdom and virtue is due to a Persian vizier who ruled the empire under the reigns of Alp Arslan and his son. Nizam, one of the most illustrious ministers of the East, was honored by the Caliph as an oracle of religion and science. He was trusted by the Sultan as the faithful vice-regent of his power and justice. After an administration of thirty years, the fame of the vizier, his wealth, and even his services were transformed into crimes. He was overthrown by the insidious arts of a woman and a rival, and his fall was hastened by a rash declaration that his cap and inkhorn, the badges of his office, were connected by the divine decree with the throne and diadem of the Sultan. At the age of ninety-three years, the venerable statesman was dismissed by his master, accused by his enemies, and murdered by a fanatic. The last words of Nizam attested his innocence, and the remainder of Malik's life was short and inglorious. From Isfahan, the scene of this disgraceful transaction, the Sultan moved to Baghdad, with the design of transplanting the Caliph and of fixing his own residence in the capital of the Muslim world. The feeble successor of Muhammad obtained a respite of ten days, and before the expiration of the term, the barbarian was summoned by the angel of death. His ambassadors at Constantinople had asked in marriage a Roman princess, but the proposal was decently eluded, and the daughter of Alexius, who might herself have been the victim, expresses her abhorrence of his unnatural conjunction. The daughter of the Sultan was bestowed on the Caliph Muqtadi, with the imperious condition that, renouncing the society of his wives and concubines, he should forever confine himself to this honorable alliance. The greatness and unity of the Turkish Empire expired in the person of Malik Shah. His vacant throne was disputed by his brother and his four sons, and after a series of civil wars, the treaty which reconciled the surviving candidates confirmed a lasting separation in the Persian dynasty, the eldest and principal branch of the House of Seljuk. The three younger dynasties were those of Kerman of Syria and of Rome. The first of these commanded an extensive, though obscure, dominion on the shores of the Indian Ocean. The second expelled the Arabian princes of Aleppo and Damascus, and the third, our peculiar care, invaded the Roman provinces of Asia Minor. The generous policy of Malik contributed to their elevation. 
he allowed the princes of his blood, even those whom he had vanquished in the field, to seek new kingdoms worthy of their ambition. Nor was he displeased that they should draw away the more ardent spirits, who might have disturbed the tranquillity of his reign. As the supreme head of his family and nation, the great sultan of Persia commanded the obedience and tribute of his royal brethren. The thrones of Kerman and Nice, of Aleppo and Damascus, the Adabex and emirs of Syria and Mesopotamia, erected their standards under the shadow of his scepter, and the hordes of Turkmans overspread the plains of the western Asia. After the death of Malik, the bands of union and subordination were relaxed and finally dissolved. The indulgence of the house of Seljuk invested their slaves with the inheritance of kingdoms, and in the oriental style a crown of princes arose from the dust of their feet. A prince of the royal line, Catulmish, the son of Israel, the son of Seljuk, had fallen in a battle against Alp Arslan, and the humane victor had dropped a tear over his grave. His five sons, strong in arms, ambitious of power, and eager for revenge, unsheathed their scimitars against the son of Alp Arslan. The two armies expected the signal when the caliph, forgetful of the majesty which secluded him from vulgar eyes, interposed his venerable mediation. Instead of shedding the blood of your brethren, your brethren both in descent and faith, unite your forces in a holy war against the Greeks, the enemies of God and his apostle. They listened to his voice, the sultan embraced his rebellious kinsmen, and the eldest, the valiant Soliman, accepted the royal standard, which gave him the free conquest and hereditary command of the provinces of the Roman Empire, from Azurum to Constantinople, and the unknown regions of the West. Accompanied by his four brothers, he passed the Euphrates, the Turkish camp was soon seated in the neighborhood of Kutea in Phrygia, and his flying cavalry laid waste the country as far as the Hellespont and the Black Sea. Since the decline of the empire, the peninsula of Asia Minor had been exposed to the transient, though destructive, inroads of the Persians and Saracens, but the fruits of a lasting conquest were reserved for the Turkish sultan, and his arms were introduced by the Greeks, who aspired to reign on the ruins of their country. Since the captivity of Romanus, six years the feeble son of Eudocia had trembled under the weight of the imperial crown, till the provinces of the east and west were lost in the same month by a double rebellion, of either chief Nicophorus was the name, but the surnames of Bryennius and Botonietus distinguished the European and Asiatic candidates. Their reasons, or rather their promises, were weighed in the divan, and after some hesitation, Soliman declared himself in favor of Botaniatus, opened a free passage to his troops in their march from Antioch to Nice, and joined the banner of the crescent to that of the cross. After his ally had ascended the throne of Constantinople, the sultan was hospitably entertained in the suburb of Chrysopolis or Scutiari, and a body of two thousand Turks was transported into Europe, to whose dexterity and courage the new emperor was indebted for the defeat and captivity of his rival, Bryennius. But the conquest of Europe was dearly purchased by the sacrifice of Asia. Constantinople was deprived of the obedience and revenue of the provinces beyond the Bosphorus and Hellespont, and the regular progress of the Turks, who fortified the passes of the rivers and mountains, left not a hope of their retreat or expulsion. Another candidate implored the aid of the sultan. Melissenus, in his purple robes and red buskins, attended the motions of the Turkish camp, and the desponding cities were tempted by the summons of a Roman prince, who immediately surrendered them into the hands of the barbarians. These acquisitions were confirmed by a treaty of peace with the emperor Alexius. His fear of Robert compelled him to seek the friendship of Suleiman, and it was not till after the sultan's death that he extended as far as Nicomedia, about sixty miles from Constantinople, the eastern boundary of the Roman world. Trebizond alone, defended on either side by the sea and mountains, preserved at the extremity of the Euxine the ancient character of a Greek colony, and the future destiny of a Christian empire. Since the first conquest of the caliphs, the establishment of the Turks in Anatolia or Asia Minor was the most deplorable loss which the church and empire had sustained. By the propagation of the Muslim faith, Suleiman deserved the name of Ghazi, a holy champion, and his new kingdoms, of the Romans or of Rome, was added to the tables of oriental geography. 
It is described as extending from the Euphrates to Constantinople, from the Black Sea to the confines of Syria, pregnant with mines of silver and iron, of alum and copper, fruitful in corn and wine, and productive of cattle and excellent horses. The wealth of Lydia, the arts of the Greeks, the splendor of the Augustan age, existed only in books and ruins, which were equally obscure in the eyes of the Scythian conquerors. Yet in the present decay, Anatolia still contains some wealthy and populous cities, and under the Byzantine Empire they were far more flourishing in numbers, size, and opulence. By the choice of the Sultan, Nice, the metropolis of Bithynia, was preferred for his palace and fortress. The seat of the Seljukian dynasty of Rome was planted one hundred miles from Constantinople, and the divinity of Christ was denied and derided in the same temple in which it had been pronounced by the first general synod of the Catholics. The unity of God and the mission of Mohammed were preached in the mosques. The Arabian learning was taught in the schools. The Qadis judged according to the law of the Koran. The Turkish manners and language prevailed in the cities. And Turkman camps were scattered over the plains and mountains of Anatolia. On the hard conditions of tribute and servitude, the Greek Christians might enjoy the exercise of their religion. But their most holy churches were profaned, their priests and bishops were insulted, they were compelled to suffer the triumph of the pagans, and the apostasy of their brethren. Many thousand children were marked by the knife of circumcision, and many thousand captives were devoted to the service or the pleasures of their masters. After the loss of Asia, Antioch still maintained her primitive allegiance to Christ and Caesar, but the solitary province was separated from all Roman aid and surrounded on all sides by the Mohammedan powers. The despair of Philaretus, the governor, prepared the sacrifice of his religion and loyalty. Had not his guilt been prevented by his son, who hastened to the Nicene palace and offered to deliver this valuable prize into the hands of Suleiman. The ambitious sultan mounted on horseback, and in twelve nights, for he reposed in the day, performed a march of six hundred miles. Antioch was oppressed by the speed and secrecy of his enterprise, and the dependent cities, as far as Laodosia and the confines of Aleppo, obeyed the example of the metropolis. From Laodosia to the Thracian Bosphorus, or Arm of St. George, the conquests and reign of Suleiman extended thirty days' journey in length, and in breadth about ten or fifteen, between the rocks of Lycia and the Black Sea. The Turkish ignorance of navigation protected, for a while, the inglorious safety of the emperor. But no sooner had a fleet of two hundred ships been constructed by the hands of the captive Greeks than Alexius trembled behind the walls of his capital. His plaintive epistles were dispersed over Europe to excite the compassion of the Latins and to paint the danger, the weakness, and the riches of the city of Constantine. But the most interesting conquest of the Seljukian Turks was that of Jerusalem, which soon became the theatre of nations. In their capitulation with Omar, the inhabitants had stipulated the assurance of their religion and property, but the articles were interpreted by a master against whom it was dangerous to dispute. And in the four hundred years of the reign of the caliphs, the political climate of Jerusalem was exposed to the vicissitudes of storm and sunshine. By the increase of proselytes and population, the Mohammedans might excuse the usurpation of three fourths of the city, but a peculiar quarter was reserved for the patriarch with his clergy and people. A tribute of two pieces of gold was the price of protection, and the sepulchre of Christ, with the church of the resurrection, was still left in the hands of his votaries. Of these votaries, the most numerous and respectable portion were strangers to Jerusalem. The pilgrimages to the Holy Land had been stimulated rather than suppressed by the conquest of the Arabs, and the enthusiasm which had always prompted these perilous journeys was nourished by the congenial passions of grief and indignation. A crowd of pilgrims from the east and west continued to visit the Holy Sepulchre and the adjacent sanctuaries, more especially at the festival of Easter, and the Greeks and Latins, the Nestorians and Jacobites, the Copts and Abyssinians, the Armenians and Georgians, maintained the chapels, the clergy, and the poor of their respective communions. The harmony of prayer in so many various tongues, the worship of so many nations in the common temple of their religion, might have afforded a spectacle of edification and peace, but the zeal of the Christian sects was embittered by hatred and revenge, and in the kingdom of a suffering Messiah, 
who had pardoned his enemies, they aspired to command and persecute their spiritual brethren. The preeminence was asserted by the spirit and numbers of the Franks, and the greatness of Charlemagne protected both the Latin pilgrims and the Catholics of the East. The poverty of Carthage, Alexandria, and Jerusalem was relieved by the alms of that pious emperor, and many monasteries of Palestine were founded or restored by his liberal devotion. Harun al Rashid, the greatest of the Abbasides, esteemed in his Christian brother a similar supremacy of genius and power. Their friendship was cemented by a frequent intercourse of gifts and embassies, and the caliph, without resigning the substantial dominion, presented the emperor with the keys of the holy sepulchre, and perhaps of the city of Jerusalem. In the decline of the Carlovingian monarchy, the Republic of Amalfi promoted the interests of trade and religion in the East. Her vessels transported the Latin pilgrims to the coasts of Egypt and Palestine, and deserved, by their useful imports, the favor and alliance of the Fatimite caliphs. An annual fair was instituted on Mount Cavalry, and the Italian merchants founded the convent and hospital of St. John of Jerusalem, the cradle of the monastic and military order, which has since reigned in the isles of Rhodes and of Malta. Had the Christian pilgrims been content to revere the tomb of a prophet, the disciples of Mohammed, instead of blaming, would have imitated their piety. But these rigid Unitarians were scandalized by a worship which represents the birth, death, and resurrection of a god. The Catholic images were branded with the name of idols, and the Muslims smiled with indignation at the miraculous flame which was kindled on the eve of Easter in the Holy Sepulchre. This pious fraud, first devised in the ninth century, was devoutly cherished by the Latin Crusaders, and is annually repeated by the clergy of the Greek, Armenian, and Coptic sects, who impose on the credulous spectators for their own benefit, and that of their tyrants. In every age, a principle of toleration has been fortified by a sense of interest, and the revenue of the prince and his emir was increased each year, by the expense and tribute of so many thousand strangers." The revolution which transferred the scepter from the Abbasides to the Fatimites was a benefit, rather than an injury, to the Holy Land. A sovereign resident in Egypt was more sensible of the importance of Christian trade, and the emirs of Palestine were less remote from the justice and power of the throne. But the third of these Fatimite caliphs was the famous Hakem, a frantic youth, who was delivered by his impiety and despotism from the fear either of God or man. And whose reign was a wild mixture of vice and folly. Regardless of the most ancient customs of Egypt, he imposed on the women an absolute confinement. The restraint excited the clamors of both sexes, their clamors provoked his fury, a part of old Cairo was delivered to the flames, and the guards and citizens were engaged many days in a bloody conflict. At first, the caliph declared himself a zealous Mussulman, the founder or benefactor of mosques and colleges. Twelve hundred and ninety copies of the Koran were transcribed at his expense in letters of gold, and his edict extirpated the vineyards of the upper Egypt. But his vanity was soon flattered by the hope of introducing a new religion. He aspired above the fame of a prophet, and styled himself the visible image of the Most High God, who, after nine apparitions on earth, was at length manifest in his royal person. At the name of Hakem, the Lord of the living and the dead, every knee was bent in religious adoration. His mysteries were performed on a mountain near Cairo. Sixteen thousand converts had signed his profession of faith, and at the present hour, a free and warlike people, the Druzes of Mount Libanus, are persuaded of the life and divinity of a madman and a tyrant. In his divine character, Hakem hated the Jews and Christians as the servants of his rivals. While some remains of prejudice or prudence still pleaded in favor of the law of Mohammed. Both in Egypt and Palestine, his cruel and wanton persecution made some martyrs and many apostles. The common rights and special privileges of the sectaries were equally disregarded, and a general interdict was laid on the devotion of strangers and natives. The temple of the Christian world, the Church of the Resurrection, was demolished to its foundations. The luminous prodigy of Easter was interrupted, and much profane labor was exhausted to destroy the cave in the rock, which properly constitutes the holy sepulchre. 
At the report of this sacrilege, the nations of Europe were astonished and afflicted, but instead of arming in the defense of the Holy Land, they contented themselves with burning or banishing the Jews, as the secret advisers of the impious barbarian. Yet the calamities of Jerusalem were in some measure alleviated by the inconstancy or repentance of Hakim himself, and the royal mandate was sealed for the restitution of the churches, when the tyrant was assassinated by the emissaries of his sister. The succeeding caliphs resumed the maxims of religion and policy. A free toleration was again granted, with the pious aid of the emperor of Constantinople. The holy sepulchre arose from its ruins, and after a short abstinence the pilgrims returned with an increase of appetite to the spiritual feast. In the sea voyage of Palestine the dangers were frequent, and the opportunities rare, but the conversion of Hungary opened a safe communication between Germany and Greece. The charity of St. Stephen, the apostle of his kingdom, relieved and conducted his itinerant brethren, and from Belgrade to Antioch they traversed fifteen hundred miles of a Christian empire. Among the Franks, the zeal of pilgrimage was prevailed beyond the example of former times, and the roads were covered with the multitudes of either sex, and of every rank, who professed their contempt of life, so soon as they should have kissed the tomb of their Redeemer. Princes and prelates abandoned the care of their dominions, and the numbers of these pious caravans were a prelude to the armies which marched in the ensuing age under the banner of the cross. About thirty years before the first crusade, the archbishop of Mentz, with the bishops of Utrecht, Bamberg, and Ratisbon, undertook this laborious journey from the Rhine to the Jordan, and the multitude of their followers amounted to seven thousand persons. At Constantinople they were hospitably entertained by the emperor, but the ostentation of their wealth provoked the assault of the wild Arabs. They drew their swords with scrupulous reluctance, and sustained the siege in the village of Capernaum, till they were rescued by the venal protection of the Fatimite emir. After visiting the holy places they embarked for Italy, but only a remnant of two thousand arrived in safety in their native land. In Gulfus, a secretary of William the Conqueror, was a companion of this pilgrimage. He observes that they sailed from Normandy, thirty stout and well-appointed horsemen, but that they repassed the Alps, twenty miserable palmers, with the staff in their hand and the wallet at their back. After the defeat of the Romans, the tranquillity of the Fatimite caliphs was invaded by the Turks. One of the lieutenants of Malik Shah, Atsiz the Karizmian, marched into Syria at the head of a powerful army, and reduced Damascus by famine and the sword. Hems and the other cities of the province acknowledged the caliph of Baghdad and the sultan of Persia, and the victorious emir advanced without resistance to the banks of the Nile. The Fatimite was preparing to fly into the heart of Africa, but the negroes of his guard and the inhabitants of Cairo made a desperate sally, and repulsed the Turk from the confines of Egypt. In his retreat he indulged the license of slaughter and rapine. The judge and notaries of Jerusalem were invited to his camp, and their execution was followed by the massacre of three thousand citizens. The cruelty or the defeat of Aziz was soon punished by the sultan Takush, the brother of Malik Shah, who, with a higher title and more formidable powers, asserted the dominion of Syria and Palestine. The house of Seljuk reigned about twenty years in Jerusalem, but the hereditary command of the holy city and territory was entrusted or abandoned to the emir Ortok, the chief of a tribe of Turkmans, whose children, after their expulsion from Palestine, formed two dynasties on the borders of Armenia and Assyria. The Oriental Christians and the Latin pilgrims deplored a revolution, which instead of the regular government and old alliance of the caliphs, imposed on their necks the iron yoke of the strangers of the north. In his court and camp the great sultan had adopted in some degree the arts and manners of Persia, but the body of the Turkish nation, and more especially the pastoral tribes, still breathed the fierceness of the desert. From Nice to Jerusalem, the western countries of Asia were a scene of foreign and domestic hostility, and the shepherds of Palestine, who held a precarious sway on a doubtful frontier, had neither leisure nor capacity to await the slow profits of commercial and religious freedom. 
The pilgrims, who, through innumerable perils, had reached the gates of Jerusalem, were the victims of private rapine or public oppression, and often sunk under the pressure of famine and disease, before they were permitted to salute the holy sepulchre. A spirit of native barbarism, or recent zeal, prompted the Turkmans to insult the clergy of every sect. The patriarch was dragged by the hair along the pavement, and cast into a dungeon, to extort a ransom from the sympathy of his flock, and the divine worship in the Church of the Resurrection was often disturbed by the savage rudeness of its masters. The pathetic tale excited the millions of the West to march under the standard of the cross to the relief of the Holy Land, and yet how trifling is the sum of these accumulated evils, if compared with the single act of the sacrilege of Hakem, which had been so patiently endured by the Latin Christians! A slighter provocation inflamed the more irascible temper of their descendants. A new spirit had arisen of religious chivalry and papal domination. A nerve was touched of exquisite feeling, and the Origin and Numbers of the First Crusade Characters of the Latin Princes Their March to Constantinople Policy of the Greek Emperor Alexius Conquest of Nice, Antioch, and Jerusalem by the Franks, Deliverance of the Holy Sepulchre, Godfrey of Bouillon, First King of Jerusalem, Institutions of the French or Latin Kingdom. About twenty years after the conquest of Jerusalem by the Turks, the Holy Sepulchre was visited by a hermit of the name of Peter, a native of Amiens in the province of Picardy in France. His resentment and sympathy were excited by his own injuries and the oppression of the Christian name. He mingled his tears with those of the patriarch, and earnestly inquired if no hopes of relief could be entertained from the Greek emperors of the East. The patriarch exposed the vices and weakness of the successors of Constantine. I will rouse, exclaimed the hermit, the martial nations of Europe in your cause and Europe was obedient to the call of the hermit. The astonished patriarch dismissed him with epistles of credit and complaint, and no sooner did he land at Bari than Peter hastened to kiss the feet of the Roman pontiff. His stature was small, his appearance contemptible, but his eye was keen and lively, and he possessed that vehemence of speech which seldom fails to impart the persuasion of the soul. He was born of a gentleman's family, for we must now adopt a modern idiom, and his military service was under the neighboring counts of Boulogne, the heroes of the First Crusade. But he soon relinquished the sword and the world, and if it be true that his wife, however noble, was aged and ugly, he might withdraw with less reluctance from her bed to a convent, and at length to a hermitage. In this austere solitude his body was emaciated, his fancy was inflamed, whatever he wished he believed, whatever he believed he saw in dreams and revelations. From Jerusalem the pilgrim returned an accomplished fanatic, but as he excelled in the popular madness of the times, Pope Urban II received him as a prophet, applauded his glorious design, promised to support it in a general council, and encouraged him to proclaim the deliverance of the Holy Land. Invigorated by the approbation of the pontiff, his zealous missionary traversed, with speed and success, the provinces of Italy and France. His diet was abstemious, his prayers long and fervent, and the alms which he received with one hand he distributed with the other. His head was bare, his feet naked, his meager body was wrapped in a coarse garment. He bore and displayed a weighty crucifix, and the ass on which he rode was sanctified in the public eye by the service of the man of God. He preached to innumerable crowds in the churches, the streets, and the highways. The hermit entered with equal confidence the palace and the cottage, and the people, for all was people, was impetuously moved by his call to repentance and arms. When he painted the sufferings of the natives and pilgrims of Palestine, every heart was melted to compassion, every breast glowed with indignation, when he challenged the warriors of the age to defend their brethren and rescue their savior. His ignorance of art and language was compensated by sighs and tears and ejaculations, and Peter supplied the deficiency of reason by loud and frequent appeals to Christ and his mother 
to the saints and angels of paradise with whom he had personally conversed. The most perfect orator of Athens might have envied the success of his eloquence. The rustic enthusiast inspired the passions which he felt, and Christendom expected with impatience the counsels and decrees of the supreme pontiff. The magnanimous spirit of Gregory the Seventh had already embraced the design of arming Europe against Asia. The ardor of his zeal and ambition still breathes in his epistles, from either side of the Alps fifty thousand Catholics had enlisted under the banner of St. Peter, and his successor reveals his intention of marching at their head against the impious sectaries of Mahomet. But the glory or reproach of executing, though not in person, this holy enterprise was reserved for Urban the Second, the most faithful of his disciples. He undertook the conquest of the East, whilst the larger portion of Rome was possessed and fortified by his rival Gribert of Ravenna, who contended with Urban for the name and honors of the pontificate. He attempted to unite the powers of the West at a time when the princes were separated from the church and the people from their princes by the excommunication which himself and his predecessors had thundered against the emperor of the king of France. Philip I of France supported with patience the censures which he had provoked by his scandalous life and adulterous marriage. Henry IV of Germany asserted the right of investitures, the prerogative of confirming the bishops by the delivery of the ring and crozier. But the emperor's party was crushed in Italy by the arms of the Normans and the Countess Mathilda, and the long quarrel had been recently envenomed by the revolt of his son Conrad and the shame of his wife, who, in the synods of Constance and Placentia, confessed the manifold prostitutions to which she had been exposed by a husband regardless of her honor and his own. So popular was the cause of Urban, so weighty was his influence, that the council which he summoned at Placentia was composed of two hundred bishops of Italy, France, Burgundy, Swabia, and Bavaria. 4,000 of the clergy and 30,000 of the laity attended this important meeting, and, as the most spacious cathedral would have been inadequate to the multitude, the session of seven days was held in a plain adjacent to the city. The ambassadors of the Greek emperor, Alexius Comnenus, were introduced to plead the distress of their sovereign and the danger of Constantinople, which was divided only by a narrow sea from the victorious Turks the common enemies of the Christian name. In their suppliant address they flattered the pride of the Latin princes, and, appealing at once to their policy and religion, extorted them to repel the barbarians on the confines of Asia, rather than to expect them in the heart of Europe. At the sad tale of the misery and perils of their eastern brethren, the assembly burst into tears. The most eager champions declared their readiness to march, and the Greek ambassadors were dismissed with the assurance of a speedy and powerful succor. The relief of Constantinople was included in the larger and more distant project of the deliverance of Jerusalem, but the prudent Urban adjourned the final decision to a second synod, which he proposed to celebrate in some city of France in the autumn of the same year. The short delay would propagate the flame of enthusiasm, and his firmest hope was in a nation of soldiers still proud of the preeminence of their name and ambitious to emulate their hero Charlemagne, who, in the popular romance of Turpin, had achieved the conquest of the Holy Land. A latent motive of affection or vanity might influence the choice of Urban. He himself was a native of France, a monk of Clugny, and the first of his countrymen who ascended the throne of St. Peter, the Pope had illustrated his family and province, nor is there perhaps a more exquisite gratification than to revisit, in a conspicuous dignity, the humble and laborious scenes of our youth. It may occasion some surprise that the Roman pontiff should erect, in the heart of France, the tribunal from whence he hurled his anathemas against the king, but our surprise will vanish so soon as we form a just estimate of a king of France in the eleventh century. Philip I was the great-grandson of Hugh Capet, the founder of the present race, who, in the decline of Charlemagne's posterity, 
added the regal title to his patrimonial estates in Paris and Orleans. In this narrow compass he was possessed of wealth and jurisdiction, but in the rest of France, you and his first descendants were no more than feudal lords of about sixty dukes and counts, of independent and hereditary power, who disdained the control of laws and legal assemblies, and whose disregard of their sovereign was revenged by the disobedience of their inferior vassals. At Clermont, in the territories of the Count of Auvergne, the Pope might brave with impunity the resentment of Philip, and the council which he convened in that city was not less numerous or respectable than the Synod of Placentia. Besides his court and council of Roman cardinals, he was supported by thirteen archbishops and two hundred and twenty-five bishops. The number of Mitrid prelates was computed at four hundred, and the fathers of the church were blessed by the saints and enlightened by the doctors of the age. From the adjacent kingdoms a martial train of lords and knights of power and renown attended the council, in high expectation of its resolved, and such was the ardor of zeal and curiosity, that the city was filled, and many thousands in the month of November erected their tents or huts in the open field. A session of eight days produced some useful or edifying canons for the reformation of manners. A severe censor was pronounced against the license of private war. The truce of God was confirmed. A suspension of hostilities during four days of the week. Women and priests were placed under the safeguard of the church. A protection of three years was extended to husbandmen and merchants, the defenseless victims of military rapine. But a law, however venerable be the sanction, cannot suddenly transform the temper of the times, and the benevolent efforts of Urban deserve the less praise, since he labored to appease some domestic quarrels that he might spread the flames of war from the Atlantic to the Euphrates. From the Synod of Placentia the rumor of his great design had gone forth among the nations, the clergy on their return had preached in every diocese the merit and glory of the deliverance of the Holy Land, and when the Pope ascended a lofty scaffold in the market-place of Clermont, his eloquence was addressed to a well-prepared and impatient audience. His topics were obvious, his exhortation was vehement, his success inevitable. The orator was interrupted by the shout of thousands, who, with one voice, and in their rustic idiom, exclaimed aloud, God wills it, God wills it. It is indeed the will of God, replied the Pope, and let this memorable word, the inspiration surely of the Holy Spirit, be forever adopted as your cry of battle, to animate the devotion and courage of the champions of Christ. His cross is the symbol of your salvation. Wear it, a red, a bloody cross, as an external mark on your breasts or shoulders, as a pledge of your sacred and irrevocable engagement. The proposal was joyfully accepted. Great numbers, both of the clergy and laity, impressed on their garments the sign of the cross, and solicited the Pope to march at their head. This dangerous honor was declined by the more prudent successor of Gregory, who alleged the schism of the church and the duties of his pastoral office, recommending to the faithful, who were disqualified by sex or profession, by age or infirmity, to aid with their prayers and alms, the personal service of their robust brethren. The name and powers of his legate he devolved on Adamar, bishop of Poi, the first who had received the cross at his hands. The foremost of the temporal chiefs was Raymond, count of Toulouse, whose ambassadors in the council excused the absence and pledged the honor of their master. After the confession and absolution of their sins, the champions of the cross were dismissed with a superfluous admonition to invite their countrymen and friends, and their departure for the Holy Land was fixed to the festival of the Assumption, the 15th of August of the ensuing year. So familiar, and as it were so natural to man, is the practice of violence, that our indulgence allows the slightest provocation, the most disputable right, as a sufficient ground of national hostility. But the name and nature of a holy war demands a more rigorous scrutiny. Nor can we hastily believe that the servants of the Prince of Peace 
would unsheath the sword of destruction unless the motive were pure, the quarrel legitimate, and the necessity inevitable. The policy of an action may be determined from the tardy lessons of experience, but before we act our conscience should be satisfied of the justice and propriety of our enterprise. In the age of the Crusades, the Christians, both of the East and West, were persuaded of their lawfulness and merit. Their arguments were clouded by the perpetual abuse of scripture and rhetoric, but they seemed to insist on the right of natural and religious defense. Their peculiar title to the Holy Land and the impiety of their pagan and Mahometan foes. 1. The right of a just defense may fairly include our civil and spiritual allies. It depends on the existence of danger, and that danger must be estimated by the twofold consideration of the malice and the power of our enemies. A pernicious tenet has been imputed to the Mahometans the duty of extirpating all other religions by the sword. This charge of ignorance and bigotry is refuted by the Koran, by the history of the Muslim conquerors, and by their public and legal toleration of the Christian worship. But it cannot be denied that the Oriental churches are depressed under their iron yoke, that in peace and war they assert a divine and indefeasible claim of universal empire, and that in their orthodox creed the unbelieving nations are continually threatened with the loss of religion or liberty. In the eleventh century the victorious arms of the Turks presented a real and urgent apprehension of these losses. They had subdued in less than thirty years the kingdoms of Asia as far as Jerusalem and the Hellespont, and the Greek empire tottered on the verge of destruction. Besides an honest sympathy for their brethren, the Latins had a right and interest in the support of Constantinople, the most important barrier of the West, and the privilege of defense must reach to prevent as well as to repel an impending assault. But the salutary purpose might have been accomplished by a moderate succor, and our calmer reason must disclaim the innumerable hosts and remote operations which overwhelmed Asia and depopulated Europe. 2. Palestine could add nothing to the strength or safety of the Latins, and fanaticism alone could pretend to justify the conquest of that distant and narrow province. The Christians affirmed that their inalienable title to the promised land had been sealed by the blood of their divine Savior. It was their right and duty to rescue their inheritance from the unjust possessors who profaned the sepulture and oppressed the pilgrimage of his disciples. Vainly would it be alleged that the preeminence of Jerusalem and the sanctity of Palestine have been abolished with the Mosaic law, that the God of the Christians is not a local deity, and that the recovery of Bethlehem or Calvary, his cradle or his tomb, will not atone for the violation of the moral precepts of the gospel. Such arguments glance aside from the leaden shield of superstition, and the religious mind will not easily relinquish its hold on the sacred ground of mystery and miracle. 3. But the holy wars which have been waged in every climate of the globe, from Egypt to Livonia, and from Peru to Hindostan, require the support of some more general and flexible tenet. It has been often supposed, and sometimes affirmed, that a difference of religion is a worthy cause of hostility, that obstinate unbelievers may be slain or subdued by the champions of the cross, and that grace is the sole foundation of dominion as well as of mercy. Above four hundred years before the first crusade, the eastern and western provinces of the Roman Empire had been acquired about the same time and in the same manner by the barbarians of Germany and Arabia. Time and treaties had legitimated the conquest of the Christian Franks, but in the eyes of their subjects and neighbors, the Mahometan princes were still tyrants and usurpers, who, by the arms of war or rebellion, might be lawfully driven from their unlawful possession. As the manners of the Christians were relaxed, their discipline of penance was enforced, and with the multiplication of sins, the remedies were multiplied. In the primitive church, a voluntary and open confession prepared the work of atonement, 
In the Middle Ages, the bishops and priests interrogated the criminal, compelled him to account for his thoughts, words, and actions, and prescribed the terms of his reconciliation with God. But as this discretionary power might alternately be abused by indulgence and tyranny, a rule of discipline was framed to inform and regulate the spiritual judges. This mode of legislation was invented by the Greeks. Their penitentials were translated or imitated in the Latin church, and in the time of Charlemagne, the clergy of every diocese were provided with a code, which they prudently concealed from the knowledge of the vulgar. In this dangerous estimate of crimes and punishments, each case was supposed, each difference was remarked by the experience or penetration of the monks. Some sins are enumerated which innocence could not have suspected, and others which reason cannot believe. And the more ordinary offenses of fornication and adultery, of perjury and sacrilege, of rapine and murder, were expiated by a penance, which, according to the various circumstances, was prolonged from forty days to seven years. During this term of mortification, the patient was healed, the criminal was absolved, by a salutary regimen of fasts and prayers. The disorder of his dress was expressive of grief and remorse, and he humbly abstained from all the business and pleasure of social life. But the rigid execution of these laws would have depopulated the palace, the camp, and the city. The barbarians of the West believed and trembled, but nature often rebelled against principle, and the magistrate labored without effect to enforce the jurisdiction of the priest. A literal accomplishment of penance was indeed impracticable. The guilt of adultery was multiplied by daily repetition. That of homicide might involve the massacre of a whole people. Each act was separately numbered, and in those times of anarchy and vice, a modest sinner might easily incur a debt of three hundred years. His insolvency was relieved by a commutation or indulgence. A year of penance was appreciated at twenty-six solidi of silver, about four pounds sterling, for the rich, at three solidi, or nine shillings, for the indigent. And these alms were soon appropriated to the use of the church, which derived from the redemption of sins an inexhaustible source of opulence and dominion. A debt of three hundred years, or twelve hundred pounds, was enough to impoverish a plentiful fortune. The scarcity of gold and silver was supplied by the alienation of land, and the princely donations of Pepin and Charlemagne are expressly given for the remedy of their soul. It is a maxim of the civil law that whoever cannot pay with his purse must pay with his body, and the practice of flagellation was adopted by the monks, a cheap though painful equivalent. By a fantastic arithmetic, a year of penance was taxed at three thousand lashes, and such was the skill and patience of the famous hermit, St. Dominic of the Iron Carras, that in six days he could discharge an entire century by a whipping of three hundred thousand stripes. His example was followed by many penitents of both sexes, and, as a vicarious sacrifice was accepted, a sturdy disciplinarian might expiate on his own back the sins of his benefactors. These compensations of the purse and person introduced, in the eleventh century, a more honorable mode of satisfaction, the merit of military service against the Saracens of Africa and Spain had been allowed by the predecessors of Urban the Second. In the Council of Clermont, that pope proclaimed a plenary indulgence to those who should enlist under the banner of the cross, the absolution of all their sins, and a full receipt for all that might be due of canonical penance. The cold philosophy of modern times is incapable of feeling the impression that was made on a sinful and fanatic world. At the voice of their pastor, the robber, the incendiary, the homicide, arose by the thousands to redeem their souls, by repeating on the infidels the same deeds which they had exercised against their Christian brethren, and the terms of atonement were eagerly embraced by offenders of every rank and denomination. None were pure, none were exempt from the guilt and penalty of sin. 
and those who were the least amenable to the justice of God and the Church were the best entitled to the temporal and eternal recompense of their pious courage. If they fell, the spirit of the Latin clergy did not hesitate to adorn their tomb with the crown of martyrdom, and should they survive, they could expect without impatience the delay and increase of their heavenly reward. They offered their blood to the Son of God, who had laid down his life for their salvation. They took up the cross and entered with confidence into the way of the Lord. His providence would watch over their safety. Perhaps his visible and miraculous power would smooth the difficulties of their holy enterprise. The cloud and pillar of Jehovah had marched before the Israelites into the promised land. Might not the Christians more reasonably hope that rivers would open for their passage, that the walls of their strongest cities would fall at the sound of their trumpets, and that the sun would be arrested in his mid-career to allow them time for the destruction of the chiefs and soldiers who marched to the holy sepulchre, I will dare to affirm that all were prompted by the spirit of enthusiasm, the belief of merit, the hope of reward, and the assurance of divine aid. But I am equally persuaded that in many it was not the soul, that in some it was not the leading principle of action. The use and abuse of religion are feeble to stem. They are strong and irresistible to impel the stream of national manners. Against the private wars of the barbarians, their bloody tournaments, licentious love, and judicial duels, the popes and synods might ineffectually thunder. It is a more easy task to provoke the metaphysical disputes of the Greeks, to drive into the cloister the victims of anarchy or despotism, to sanctify the patience of slaves and cowards, or to assume the merit of the humanity and benevolence of modern Christians. War and exercise were the reigning passions of the Franks or Latins. They were enjoined, as a penance, to gratify those passions, to visit distant lands, and to draw their swords against the nation of the East. Their victory, or even their attempt, would immortalize the names of the intrepid heroes of the cross, and the purest piety could not be insensible to the most splendid prospect of military glory. In the petty quarrels of Europe they shed the blood of their friends and countrymen for the acquisition, perhaps, of a castle or a village. They could march with alacrity against the distant and hostile nations who were devoted to their arms. Their fancy already grasped the golden scepters of Asia, and the conquest of Apulia and Sicily by the Normans might exalt to royalty the hopes of the most private adventurer. Christendom, in her rudest state, must have yielded to the climate and cultivation of the Mahometan countries, and their natural and artificial wealth had been magnified by the tales of pilgrims and the gifts of an imperfect commerce. The vulgar, both the great and small, were taught to believe every wonder of lands flowing with milk and honey, of mines and treasures, of gold and diamonds, of palaces of marble and jasper, and of odoriferous groves of cinnamon and frankincense. In this earthly paradise each warrior depended on his sword to carve a plenteous and honorable establishment which he measured only by the extent of his wishes. Their vassals and soldiers trusted their fortunes to God and their master. The spoils of a Turkish emir might enrich the meanest follower of the camp, and the flavor of the wines, the beauty of the Grecian women, were temptations more adapted to the nature than to the profession of the champions of the cross. The love of freedom was a powerful incitement to the multitudes who were oppressed by feudal or ecclesiastical tyranny. Under this holy sign, the peasants and burghers, who were attached to the servitude of the glebe, might escape from a haughty lord and transplant themselves and their families to a land of liberty. The monk might release himself from the discipline of his convent. The debtor might suspend the accumulation of usury and the pursuit of his creditors 
and outlaws and malefactors of every caste might continue to brave the laws and elude the punishment of their crimes. These motives were potent and numerous. When we have singly computed their weight on the mind of each individual, we must add the infinite series, the multiplying powers of example and fashion. The first proselytes became the warmest and most effectual missionaries of the cross. Among their friends and countrymen, they preached the duty, the merit, and the recompense of their holy vow, and the most reluctant hearers were insensibly drawn within the whirlpool of persuasion and authority. The martial youths were fired by the reproach or suspicion of cowardice, the opportunity of visiting with an army the sepulture of Christ was embraced by the old and infirm, by women and children who consulted rather their zeal than their strength, and those who in the evening had derided the folly of their companions were the most eager the ensuing day to tread in their footsteps. The ignorance which magnified the hopes diminished the perils of the enterprise. Since the Turkish conquest, the paths of pilgrimage were obliterated. The chiefs themselves had an imperfect notion of the length of the way and the state of their enemies, and such was the stupidity of the people that, at the sight of the first city or castle beyond the limits of their knowledge, they were ready to ask whether that was not the Jerusalem, the term and object of their labors. Yet the more prudent of the crusaders, who were not sure that they should be fed from heaven with a shower of quails or manna, provided themselves with those precious metals which in every country are the representatives of every commodity. To defray, according to their rank, the expenses of the road, princes alienated their provinces, nobles their land and castles, peasants their cattle and the instruments of husbandry. The value of property was depreciated by the eager competition of multitudes, while the price of arms and horses was raised to an exorbitant height by the wants and impatience of the buyers. Those who remained at home, with sense and money, were enriched by the epidemical disease. The sovereigns acquired at a cheap rate the domains of their vassals, and the ecclesiastical purchasers completed the payment by the assurance of their prayers. The cross, which was commonly sued on the garment in cloth or silk, was inscribed by some zealots on their skin. A hot iron or indelible liquor was applied to perpetuate the mark, and a crafty monk, who showed the miraculous impression on his breast, was repaid with the popular veneration and the richest benefices of Palestine. The 15th of August had been fixed in the Council of Claremont for the departure of the pilgrims, but the day was anticipated by the thoughtless and needy crowd of plebeians, and I shall briefly dispatch the calamities which they inflicted and suffered before I enter on the more serious and successful enterprise of the chiefs. Early in the spring, from the confines of France and Lorraine, above sixty thousand of the populace of both sexes flocked round the first missionary of the crusade, and pressed him with clamorous importunity to lead them to the holy sepulchre. The hermit, assuming the character, without the talents or authority of a general, impelled or obeyed the forward impulse of his votaries along the banks of the Rhine and Danube. Their wants and numbers soon compelled them to separate, and his lieutenant, Walter the Penniless, a valiant though needy soldier, conducted a vanguard of pilgrims whose condition may be determined from the proportion of eight horsemen to fifteen thousand foot. The example and footsteps of Peter were closely pursued by another fanatic, the monk Godescal, whose sermons had swept away fifteen or twenty thousand peasants from the villages of Germany. Their rear was again pressed by a herd of two hundred thousand, the most stupid and savage refuse of the people, who mingled with their devotion a brutal license of rapine, prostitution, and drunkenness. 
some counts and gentlemen, at the head of three thousand horse, attended the motions of the multitude to partake in the spoil. But their genuine leaders, may we credit such folly, were a goose and a goat, who were carried in front, and to whom these worthy Christians ascribed an infusion of the divine spirit. Of these, and of other bands of enthusiasts, the first and most easy warfare was against the Jews, the murderers of the Son of God. In the trading cities of the Moselle and the Rhine, their colonies were numerous and rich, and they enjoyed, under the protection of the emperor and the bishops, the free exercise of their religion. At Verdun, Treves, Mentz, Spires, Worms, many thousands of that unhappy people were pillaged and massacred, nor had they felt a more bloody stroke since the persecution of Hadrian. A remnant was saved by the firmness of their bishops, who accepted a feigned and transient conversion. But the more obstinate Jews opposed their fanaticism to the fanaticism of the Christians, barricaded their houses, and precipitating themselves, their families, and their wealth into the rivers or the flames, disappointed the malice, or at least the avarice, of their implacable foes. Between the frontiers of Austria and the seat of the Byzantine monarchy, the crusaders were compelled to traverse an interval of six hundred miles, the wild and desolate countries of Hungary and Bulgaria. The soil is fruitful and intersected with rivers, but it was then covered with morasses and forests, which spread to a boundless extent whenever man has ceased to exercise his dominion over the earth. Both nations had imbibed the rudiments of Christianity. The Hungarians were ruled by their native princes, the Bulgarians by a lieutenant of the Greek emperor, but on the slightest provocation their ferocious nature was rekindled, and ample provocation was afforded by the disorders of the first pilgrims. Agriculture must have been unskillful and languid among a people whose cities were built of reeds and timber, which were deserted in the summer season for the tents of hunters and shepherds. A scanty supply of provisions was rudely demanded, forcibly seized, and greedily consumed, and on the first quarrel the crusaders gave a loose to indignation and revenge. But their ignorance of the country, of war, and of discipline, exposed them to every snare. The Greek prefect of Bulgaria commanded a regular force. At the trumpet of the Hungarian king, the eighth or the tenth of his martial subjects bent their bows and mounted on horseback. Their policy was insidious, and their retaliation on these pious robbers was unrelenting and bloody. About a third of the naked fugitives, and the hermit Peter was of the number, escaped to the Thracian mountains, and the emperor, who respected the pilgrimage and succor of the Latins, conducted them by secure and easy journeys to Constantinople, and advised them to await the arrival of their brethren. For a while they remembered their faults and losses, but no sooner were they revived by the hospitable entertainment then their venom was again inflamed. They stung their benefactor, and neither gardens nor palaces nor churches were safe from their depredations. For his own safety, Alexius allured them to pass over to the Asiatic side of the Bosphorus, but their blind impetuosity soon urged them to desert the station which he had assigned, and to rush headlong against the Turks, who occupied the road to Jerusalem. The hermit, conscious of his shame, had withdrawn from the camp to Constantinople, and his lieutenant, Walter the Penniless, who was worthy of a better command, attempted without success to introduce some order and prudence among the herd of savages. They separated in quest of prey, and themselves fell an easy prey to the arts of the sultan. By a rumor that their foremost companions were rioting in the spoils of his capital, Solomon tempted the main body to descend into the plain of Nice. They were overwhelmed by the Turkish arrows, 
and a pyramid of bones informed their companions of the place of their defeat. Of the first crusaders, three hundred thousand had already perished, before a single city was rescued from the infidels, before their graver and more noble brethren had completed the preparations of their enterprise. None of the great sovereigns of Europe embarked their persons in the first crusade. The emperor Henry the Fourth was not disposed to obey the summons of the Pope. Philip I of France was occupied by his pleasures. William Rufus of England, by a recent conquest, the kings of Spain were engaged in a domestic war against the Moors, and the northern monarchs of Scotland, Denmark, Sweden, and Poland were yet strangers to the passions and interests of the South. The religious ardor was more strongly felt by the princes of the second order, who held an important place in the feudal system. Their situation will naturally cast, under four distinct heads, the review of their names and characters, but I may escape some needless repetition by observing at once that courage and the exercise of arms are the common attribute of these Christian adventurers. 1. The first rank, both in war and council, is justly due to Godfrey of Bouillon, and happy would it have been for the crusaders if they had trusted themselves to the sole conduct of that accomplished hero, a worthy representative of Charlemagne, from whom he was descended in the female line. His father was of the noble race of the Counts of Boulogne. Brabant, the lower province of Lorraine, was the inheritance of his mother, and by the emperor's bounty he was himself invested with that ducal title, which has been improperly transferred to his lordship of Bouillon in the Ardennes. In the service of Henry the Fourth, he bore the great standard of the empire, and pierced with his lance the breast of Rodolph, the rebel king. Godfrey was the first who ascended the walls of Rome, and his sickness, his vow, perhaps his remorse, for bearing arms against the Pope, confirmed an early resolution of visiting the Holy Sepulchre, not as a pilgrim, but a deliverer. His valor was matured by prudence and moderation. His piety, though blind, was sincere, and in the tumult of a camp, he practiced the real and fictitious virtues of a convent. Superior to the private factions of the chiefs, he reserved his enmity for the enemies of Christ, and though he gained a kingdom by the attempt, his pure and disinterested zeal was acknowledged by his rivals. Godfrey of Bouillon was accompanied by his two brothers, by Justus the Elder, who had succeeded to the county of Boulogne, and by the younger Baldwin, a character of more ambiguous virtue. The Duke of Lorraine was alike celebrated on either side of the Rhine. From his birth and education he was equally conversant with the French and Teutonic languages. The barons of France, Germany, and Lorraine assembled their vassals, and the confederate force that marched under his banner was composed of fourscore thousand foot and about ten thousand horse. 2. In the Parliament that was held at Paris in the King's presence about two months after the Council of Clermont, Hugh, Count of Vermandois, was the most conspicuous of the princes who assumed the cross, but the appellation of the great was applied, not so much to his merit or possessions, though neither were contemptible, as to the royal birth of the brother of the King of France. Robert, Duke of Normandy, was the eldest son of William the Conqueror, but on his father's death he was deprived of the kingdom of England by his own indolence and the activity of his brother Rufus. The worth of Robert was degraded by an excessive levity and easiness of temper. His cheerfulness seduced him to the indulgence of pleasure. His profuse liberality impoverished the prince and people. His indiscriminate clemency multiplied the number of offenders, and the amiable qualities of a private man became the essential defects of a sovereign. For the trifling sum of ten thousand marks, he mortgaged Normandy during his absence 
to the English usurper. But his engagement and behavior in the holy war announced in Robert a reformation of manners, and restored him in some degree to the public esteem. Another Robert was Count of Flanders, a royal province, which in this century gave three queens to the thrones of France, England, and Denmark. He was surnamed the Sword and Lance of the Christians, but in the exploits of a soldier he sometimes forgot the duties of a general. Stephen, Count of Chartres, of Blois, and of Troyes, was one of the richest princes of the age, and the number of his castles has been compared to the three hundred and sixty-five days of the year. His mind was improved by literature, and in the council of the chiefs, the eloquent Stephen was chosen to discharge the office of their president. These four were the principal leaders of the French, the Normans, and the pilgrims of the British Isles, but the list of the barons, who were possessed of three or four towns, would exceed, says a contemporary, the catalogue of the Trojan War. 3. In the south of France, the command was assumed by Adamar, Bishop of Poi, the Pope Legate, and by Raymond, Count of St. Giles and Tholouse, who added the prouder titles of Duke of Narbonne and Marquise of Provence. The former was a respectable prelate, alike qualified for this world and the next. The latter was a veteran warrior who had fought against the Saracens of Spain and who consecrated his declining age not only to the deliverance but to the perpetual service of the Holy Sepulchre. His experience and riches gave him a strong ascendant in the Christian camp, whose distress he was often able and sometimes willing to relieve. But it was easier for him to extort the praise of the infidels than to preserve the love of his subjects and associates. His eminent qualities were clouded by a temper haughty, envious, and obstinate, and though he resigned an ample patrimony for the cause of God, his piety in the public opinion was not exempt from avarice and ambition. A mercantile rather than a martial spirit prevailed among his provincials, a common name which included the natives of Auvergne and Languedoc, the vassals of the kingdom of Burgundy or Arlay. From the adjacent frontier of Spain he drew a band of hardy adventurers. As he marched through Lombardy, a crowd of Italians flocked to his standard, and his united force consisted of one hundred thousand horse and foot. If Raymond was the first to enlist and the last to depart, the delay may be excused by the greatness of his preparation and the promise of an everlasting farewell. 4. The name of Bohemond, the son of Robert Guiscard, was already famous by his double victory over the Greek emperor, but his father's will had reduced him to the principality of Tarentum, and the remembrance of his eastern trophies, till he was awakened by the rumor and passage of the French pilgrims. It is in the person of this Norman chief that we may seek for the coolest policy and ambition with a small allay of religious fanaticism. His conduct may justify a belief that he had secretly directed the design of the Pope, which he affected to second with the astonishment and zeal. At the siege of Amalfi, his example and discourse inflamed the passions of a confederate army. He instantly tore his garment to supply crosses for the numerous candidates, and prepared to visit Constantinople and Asia at the head of ten thousand horse and twenty thousand foot. Several princes of the Norman race accompanied this veteran general, and his cousin Tancray was the partner rather than the servant of the war. In the accomplished character of Tancray we discover all the virtues of a perfect knight, the true spirit of chivalry, which inspired the generous sentiments and social offices of man far better than the base philosophy or the baser religion of the times. Between the age of Charlemagne and that of the Crusades, a revolution had taken place among the Spaniards, the Normans, and the French, which was gradually extended to the rest of Europe. 
the service of the infantry was degraded to the plebeians, the cavalry formed the strength of the armies, and the honorable name of Miles, or soldier, was confined to the gentlemen who served on horseback, and were invested with the character of knighthood. The dukes and counts, who had usurped the rights of sovereignty, divided the provinces among their faithful barons. The barons distributed among their vassals the fiefs or benefices of their jurisdiction, and these military tenants, the peers of each other and of their lord, composed the noble or equestrian order, which disdained to conceive the peasant or burgher as of the same species with themselves. The dignity of their birth was preserved by pure and equal alliances. Their sons alone, who could produce four quarters, or lines of ancestry, without spot or reproach, might legally pretend to the honor of knighthood. But a valiant plebeian was sometimes enriched and ennobled by the sword, and became the father of a new race, a single knight could impart, according to his judgment, the character which he received, and the warlike sovereigns of Europe derived more glory from this personal distinction than from the luster of their diadem. This ceremony, of which some traces may be found in Tacitus and the woods of Germany, was in its origin simple and profane. The candidate, after some previous trial, was invested with the sword and spurs, and his cheek or shoulder was touched with a slight blow as an emblem of the last affront which it was lawful for him to endure. But superstition mingled in every public and private action of life. In the holy wars it sanctified the profession of arms, and the order of chivalry was assimilated in its rights and privileges to the sacred orders of priesthood, the bath and white garment of the novice were an indecent copy of the regeneration of baptism. His sword, which he offered on the altar, was blessed by the ministers of religion. His solemn reception was preceded by fasts and vigils, and he was created a knight in the name of God, of St. George, and of St. Michael the Archangel. He swore to accomplish the duties of his profession, and education, example, and the public opinion were the inviolable guardians of his oath. As the champions of God and the ladies, I blush to unite such discordant names, he devoted himself to speak the truth, to maintain the right, to protect the distressed, to practice courtesy, a virtue less familiar to the ancients, to pursue the infidels, to despise the allurements of ease and safety, and to vindicate in every perilous adventure the honor of his character. The abuse of the same spirit provoked the illiterate knight to disdain the arts of industry and peace, to esteem himself the sole judge and avenger of his own injuries, and proudly to neglect the laws of civil society and military discipline. Yet the benefits of this institution to refine the temper of barbarians, and to infuse some principles of faith, justice, and humanity were strongly felt and have been often observed. The asperity of national prejudice was softened, and the community of religion and arms spread a similar color and generous emulation over the face of Christendom. Abroad in enterprise and pilgrimage, at home in martial exercise, the warriors of every country were perpetually associated, and impartial taste must prefer a Gothic tournament to the Olympic games of classic antiquity. Instead of the naked spectacles which corrupted the manners of the Greeks and banished from the stadium the virgins and matrons, the pompous decoration of the lists was crowned with the presence of chaste and high-born beauty from whose hands the conqueror received the prize of his dexterity and courage. The skill and strength that were exerted in wrestling and boxing bear a distant and doubtful relation to the merit of a soldier, but the tournaments, as they were invented in France, and eagerly adopted both in the East and West, presented a lively image of the business of the field. 
the single combats, the general skirmish, the defense of a pass or castle, were rehearsed as in actual service, and the contest, both in Rio and mimic war, was decided by the superior management of the horse and lance. The lance was the proper and peculiar weapon of the knight. His horse was of a large and heavy breed, but this charger, till he was roused by the approaching danger, was usually led by an attendant, and he quietly rode a pad or palfrey of a more easy pace. His helmet and sword, his greaves and buckler, it would be superfluous to describe, but I may remark that at the period of the Crusades the armor was less ponderous than in later times, and that, instead of a massy cuirass, his breast was defended by a hauberk or coat of mail. When their long lances were fixed in the rest, the warriors furiously spurred their horses against the foe, and the light cavalry of the Turks and Arabs could seldom stand against the direct and impetuous weight of their charge. Each knight was attended to the field by his faithful squire, a youth of equal birth and similar hopes. He was followed by his archers and men-at-arms, and four or five or six soldiers were computed as the furniture of a complete lance. In the expeditions to the neighboring kingdoms or the Holy Land, the duties of the feudal tenure no longer subsisted. The voluntary service of the knights and their followers were either prompted by zeal or attachment, or purchased with rewards and promises, and the numbers of each squadron were measured by the power, the wealth, and the fame of each independent chieftain. They were distinguished by his banner, his armorial coat, and his cry of war, and the most ancient families of Europe must seek in these achievements the origin and proof of their nobility. In this rapid portrait of chivalry, I have been urged to anticipate on the story of the Crusades, at once an effect and a cause of this memorable institution. Such were the troops, and such the leaders who assumed the cross for the deliverance of the holy sepulchre. As soon as they were relieved by the absence of the plebeian multitude, they encouraged each other by interviews and messages to accomplish their vow and hasten their departure. Their wives and sisters were desirous of partaking the danger and merit of the pilgrimage. Their portable treasures were conveyed in bars of silver and gold, and the princes and barons were attended by their equipage of hounds and hawks to amuse their leisure and to supply their table. The difficulty of procuring sustenance for so many myriads of men and horses engaged them to separate their forces. Their choice or situation determined the road, and it was agreed to meet in the neighborhood of Constantinople, and from thence to begin their operations against the Turks. From the banks of the Meuse and the Moselle, Godfrey of Bouillon followed the direct way of Germany, Hungary, and Bulgaria, and as long as he exercised the sole command, every step afforded some proof of his prudence and virtue. On the confines of Hungary, he was stopped three weeks by a Christian people, to whom the name, or at least the abuse, of the cross was justly odious. The Hungarians still smarted with the wounds which they had received from the first pilgrims. In their turn they had abused the right of defense and retaliation, and they had reason to apprehend a severe revenge from a hero of the same nation, and who was engaged in the same cause. But after weighing the motives and the events, the virtuous duke was content to pity the crimes and misfortunes of his worthless brethren, and his twelve deputies, the messengers of peace, requested in his name a free passage and an equal market. To remove their suspicions, Godfrey trusted himself and afterwards his brother to the faith of Carloman, king of Hungary, who treated them with a simple but hospitable entertainment. The treaty was sanctified by their common gospel, and a proclamation, under pain of death, restrained the animosity and license of the Latin soldiers. From Austria to Belgrade, they traversed the plains of Hungary without enduring or offering an injury, and the proximity of Carloman, who hovered on their flanks with his numerous cavalry, 
was a precaution not less useful for their safety than for his own. They reached the banks of the Save, and no sooner had they passed the river than the king of Hungary restored the hostages and saluted their departure with the fairest wishes for the success of their enterprise. With the same conduct and discipline, Godfrey pervaded the woods of Bulgaria and the frontiers of Thrace, and might congratulate himself that he had almost reached the first term of his pilgrimage without drawing his sword against a Christian adversary. After an easy and pleasant journey through Lombardy, from Turin to Achiella, Raymond and his provincials marched forty days through the savage country of Dalmatia and Sclavonia. The weather was a perpetual fog, the land was mountainous and desolate, the natives were either fugitive or hostile, loose in their religion and government, they refused to furnish provisions or guides, murdered the stragglers, and exercised by day and night the vigilance of the count, who derived more security from the punishment of some captive robbers than from his interview and treaty with the prince of Skodra. His march between Durazzo and Constantinople was harassed, without being stopped, by the peasants and soldiers of the Greek emperor, and the same faint and ambiguous hostility was prepared for the remaining chiefs who passed the Adriatic from the coast of Italy. Bohemond had arms and vessels, and foresight and discipline, and his name was not forgotten in the provinces of Epirus and Thessaly. Whatever obstacles he encountered were surmounted by his military conduct and the valor of Tancred, and if the Norman prince affected to spare the Greeks, he gorged his soldiers with the full plunder of an heretical castle. The nobles of France pressed forwards with vain and thoughtless ardor, of which their nation has been sometimes accused. From the Alps to Apulia, the march of Hugh the Great, of the two Roberts, and of Stephen of Chartres, through a wealthy country and amidst the applauding Catholics, was a devout or triumphant progress. They kissed the feet of the Roman pontiff, and the golden standard of St. Peter was delivered to the brother of the French monarch. But in this visit of piety and pleasure, they neglected to secure the season and the means of their embarkation. The winter was insensibly lost. Their troops were scattered and corrupted in the towns of Italy. They separately accomplished their passage, regardless of safety or dignity, and within nine months from the Feast of the Assumption, the day appointed by Urban, all the Latin princes had reached Constantinople. But the Count of Vermandois was produced as a captive his foremost vessels were scattered by a tempest, and his person, against the law of nations, was detained by the lieutenants of Alexius. Yet the arrival of you had been announced by four-and-twenty knights in golden armor, who commanded the emperor to revere the general of the Latin Christians, the brother of the king of kings. In some oriental tale I have read the fable of a shepherd, who was ruined by the accomplishment of his own wishes. He had prayed for water, the Ganges was turned into his grounds, and his flock and cottage were swept away by the inundation. Such was the fortune, or at least the apprehension, of the Greek emperor, Alexius Comnenus, whose name has already appeared in this history, and whose conduct is so differently represented by his daughter Anne, and by the Latin writers, in the council of Placentia, his ambassadors had solicited a moderate succor, perhaps of ten thousand soldiers, but he was astonished by the approach of so many potent chiefs and fanatic nations. The emperor fluctuated between hope and fear, between timidity and courage, but in the crooked policy which he mistook for wisdom, I cannot believe, I cannot discern, that he maliciously conspired against the life or honor of the French heroes. The promiscuous multitudes of Peter the Hermit were savage beasts, alike destitute of humanity and reason. Nor was it possible for Alexius to prevent or deplore their destruction. The troops of Godfrey and his peers were less contemptible, but not less suspicious, to the Greek emperor. Their motives might be pure and pious, but he was equally alarmed by his knowledge of the ambitious Bohemond, 
and his ignorance of the transalpine chiefs. The courage of the French was blind and headstrong. They might be tempted by the luxury and wealth of Greece, and elated by the view and opinion of their invincible strength, and Jerusalem might be forgotten in the prospect of Constantinople. After a long march and painful abstinence, the troops of Godfrey encamped in the plains of Thrace. They heard with indignation that their brother, the Count of Vermandois, was imprisoned by the Greeks, and their reluctant duke was compelled to indulge them in some freedom of retaliation and rapine. They were appeased by the submission of Alexius. He promised to supply their camp, and as they refused in the midst of winter to pass the Bosphorus, their quarters were assigned among the gardens and palaces on the shores of that narrow sea but an incurable jealousy still rankled in the minds of the two nations, who despised each other as slaves and barbarians. Ignorance is the ground of suspicion, and suspicion was inflamed into daily provocations. Prejudice is blind, hunger is deaf, and Alexius is accused of a design to starve or assault the Latins in a dangerous post on all sides encompassed with the waters. Godfrey sounded his trumpets, burst the net, overspread the plain, and insulted the suburbs, but the gates of Constantinople were strongly fortified, the ramparts were lined with archers, and, after a doubtful conflict, both parties listened to the voice of peace and religion. The gifts and promises of the emperor insensibly soothed the fierce spirit of the western strangers. As a Christian warrior, he rekindled their zeal for the prosecution of their holy enterprise, which he engaged to second with his troops and treasures. On the return of spring, Godfrey was persuaded to occupy a pleasant and plentiful camp in Asia, and no sooner had he passed the Bosphorus than the Greek vessels were suddenly recalled to the opposite shore. The same policy was repeated with the succeeding chiefs, who were swayed by the example and weakened by the departure of their foremost companions. By his skill and diligence, Alexius prevented the union of any two of the confederate armies at the same moment under the walls of Constantinople, and before the feast of the Pentecost not a Latin pilgrim was left on the coast of Europe. The same arms which threatened Europe might deliver Asia and repel the Turks from the neighboring shores of the Bosphorus and Hellespont. The fair provinces from Nice to Antioch were the recent patrimony of the Roman emperor, and his ancient and perpetual claim still embraced the kingdoms of Syria and Egypt. In his enthusiasm, Alexius indulged, or affected, the ambitious hope of leading his new allies to subvert the thrones of the East, but the calmer dictates of reason and temper dissuaded him from exposing his royal person to the faith of unknown and lawless barbarians. His prudence, or his pride, was content with exhorting from the French princes an oath of homage and fidelity, and a solemn promise that they would either restore or hold their Asiatic conquests as the humble and loyal vassals of the Roman Empire. Their independent spirit was fired at the mention of this foreign and voluntary servitude. They successively yielded to the dexterous application of gifts and flattery, and the first proselytes became the most eloquent and effectual missionaries to multiply the companions of their shame. The pride of you of Vermandois was soothed by the honors of his captivity, and in the brother of the French king, the example of submission was prevalent and weighty. In the mind of Godfrey of Bouillon, every human consideration was subordinate to the glory of God and the success of the crusade. He had firmly resisted the temptations of Bohemond and Raymond, who urged the attack and conquest of Constantinople. Alexius esteemed his virtues, deservedly named him the champion of the empire, and dignified his homage with the filial name and rights of adoption. The hateful Bohemond was received as a true and ancient ally, and if the emperor reminded him of former hostilities, it was only to praise the valor that he had displayed, and the glory that he had acquired in the fields of Durazzo and Larissa. The son of Guiscard was lodged and entertained, and served with imperial pomp, one day, as he passed through the gallery of the palace 
a door was carelessly left open to expose a pile of gold and silver, of silk and gems, of curious and costly furniture, that was heaped, in seeming disorder, from the floor to the roof of the chamber. What conquests, exclaimed the ambitious miser, might not be achieved by the possession of such a treasure? It is your own, replied a Greek attendant, who watched the motions of his soul, and Bohemond, after some hesitation, condescended to accept this magnificent present. The Norman was flattered by the assurance of an independent principality, and Alexius alluded, rather than denied, his daring demand for the office of great domestic or general of the East. The two Roberts, the son of the conqueror of England, and the kinsmen of three queens, bowed in their turn before the Byzantine throne. A private letter of Stephen of Chartres attests his admiration to the emperor, the most excellent and liberal of men, who taught him to believe that he was a favorite, and promised to educate and establish his youngest son. In his southern province, the Count of St. Giles and Thoulouse faintly recognized the supremacy of the King of France a prince of a foreign nation and language. At the head of a hundred thousand men, he declared that he was the soldier and servant of Christ alone, and that the Greek might be satisfied with an equal treaty of alliance and friendship. His obstinate resistance enhanced the value and the price of his submission, and he shone, says the Princess Anne, among the barbarians as the sun amidst the stars of heaven. His disgust of the noise and insolence of the French his suspicions of the designs of Bohemond, the emperor imparted to his faithful Raymond, and that aged statesman might clearly discern, that however false in friendship, he was sincere in his enmity. The spirit of chivalry was at last subdued in the person of Tancray, and none could deem themselves dishonored by the imitation of that gallant knight. He disdained the golden flattery of the Greek monarch, assaulted in his presence an insolent patrician, escaped to Asia in the habit of a private soldier, and yielded with a sigh to the authority of Bohemond and the interest of the Christian cause. The best and most ostensible reason was the impossibility of passing the sea and accomplishing their vow without the license and the vessels of Alexius, but they cherished a secret hope that as soon as they trod the continent of Asia their swords would obliterate their shame and dissolve the engagement which on his side might not be very faithfully performed. The ceremony of their homage was grateful to a people who had long since considered pride as the substitute of power. High on his throne the emperor sat mute and immovable. His majesty was adored by the Latin princes, and they submitted to kiss either his feet or his knees an indignity which their own writers are ashamed to confess and unable to deny. Private or public interests suppressed the murmurs of the dukes and counts, but a French baron, he is supposed to be Robert of Paris, presumed to ascend the throne and to place himself by the side of Alexius. The sage reproof of Baldwin provoked him to exclaim, in his barbarous idiom, Who is this rustic that keeps his seat? while so many valiant captains are standing round him. The emperor maintained his silence, dissembled his indignation, and questioned his interpreter concerning the meaning of the words, which he partly suspected from the universal language of gesture and countenance. Before the departure of the pilgrims, he endeavored to learn the name and condition of the audacious baron. I am a Frenchman, replied Robert, of the purest and most ancient nobility of my country. All that I know is that there is a church in my neighborhood, the resort of those who are desirous of approving their valor in single combat. Till an enemy appears, they address their prayers to God and his saints. That church I have frequently visited, but never have I found an antagonist who dared to accept my defiance. Alexius dismissed the challenger, with some prudent advice for his conduct in the Turkish warfare, and history repeats with pleasure this lively example of the manners of his age and country. The conquest of Asia was undertaken and achieved by Alexander with thirty-five thousand Macedonians and Greeks, 
and his best hope was in the strength and discipline of his phalanx of infantry. The principal force of the crusaders consisted in their cavalry, and when that force was mustered in the plains of Bithynia, the knights and their martial attendants on horseback amounted to one hundred thousand fighting men, completely armed with the helmet and coat of mail. The value of these soldiers deserved a strict and authentic account, and the flower of European chivalry might furnish, in a first effort, this formidable body of heavy horse. A part of the infantry might be enrolled for the service of scouts, pioneers, and archers, but the promiscuous crowd were lost in their own disorder, and we depend not on the eyes and knowledge, but on the belief and fancy of a chaplain of Count Baldwin, in the estimate of six hundred thousand pilgrims able to bear arms, besides the priests and monks, the women and children of the Latin camp. The reader starts, and before he is recovered from his surprise, I shall add, on the same testimony, that if all who took the cross had accomplished their vow, above six millions would have migrated from Europe to Asia. Under this oppression of faith, I derive some relief from a more sagacious and thinking writer, who after the same review of the cavalry accuses the credulity of the priest of Chartres, and even doubts whether the cis-alpine regions, in the geography of a Frenchman, were sufficient to produce and pour forth such incredible multitudes. The coolest skepticism will remember that of these religious volunteers great numbers never beheld Constantinople and Nice. Of enthusiasm the influence is irregular and transient. Many were detained at home by reason or cowardice, by poverty or weakness, and many were repulsed by the obstacles of the way, the more insuperable as they were unforeseen to these ignorant fanatics. The savage countries of Hungary and Bulgaria were whitened with their bones, their vanguard was cut in pieces by the Turkish sultan, and the loss of the first adventure, by the sword or climate or fatigue, has already been stated at three hundred thousand men. Yet the myriads that survived, that marched, that pressed forwards on the holy pilgrimage, were a subject of astonishment to themselves and to the Greeks. The copious energy of her language sinks under the efforts of the Princess Anne, the images of locusts, of leaves and flowers, of the sands of the sea or the stars of heaven, imperfectly represent what she had seen and heard, and the daughter of Alexius exclaims that Europe was loosened from its foundations and hurled against Asia. The ancient hosts of Darius and Xerxes labor under the same doubt of a vague and indefinite magnitude, but I am inclined to believe that a larger number has never been contained within the lines of a single camp than at the siege of Nice, the first operation of the Latin princes. Their motives, their characters, and their arms have been already displayed. Of their troops the most numerous portion were the natives of France. The Low Countries, the banks of the Rhine and Apulia, sent a powerful reinforcement. Some bands of adventurers were drawn from Spain, Lombardy, and England, and from the distant bogs and mountains of Ireland or Scotland issued some naked and savage fanatics, ferocious at home, but unwarlike abroad. Had not superstition condemned the sacrilegious prudence of depriving the poorest or weakest Christians of the merit of pilgrimage, the useless crowd, with mouths but without hands, might have been stationed in the Greek Empire, till their companions had opened and secured the way of the Lord. A small remnant of the pilgrims who passed the Bosphorus was permitted to visit the Holy Sepulchre. Their northern constitution was scorched by the rays and infected by the vapors of a Syrian sun. They consumed with heedless prodigality their stores of water and provision. Their numbers exhausted the inland country. The sea was remote, the Greeks were unfriendly, and the Christians of every sect fled before the voracious and cruel rapine of their brethren. In the dire necessity of famine, they sometimes roasted and devoured the flesh of their infant or adult captives. Among the Turks and Saracens, the idolaters of Europe were rendered more odious by the name and reputation of cannibals. 
The spies who introduced themselves into the kitchen of Bohemond were shown several human bodies turning on the spit, and the artful Norman encouraged a report which increased at the same time the abhorrence and the terror of the infidels. I have expiated with pleasure on the first steps of the crusaders, as they paint the manners and character of Europe, but I shall abridge the tedious and uniform narrative of their blind achievements, which were performed by strength and are described by ignorance. From their first station in the neighborhood of Nicomedia, they advanced in successive divisions, passed the contracted limit of the Greek empire, opened a road through the hills, and commenced, by the siege of his capital, their pious warfare against the Turkish sultan. His kingdom of Raum extended from the Hellespont to the confines of Syria, and barred the pilgrimage of Jerusalem. His name was Kilij Arslan, or Solomon, of the race of Seljuk, and son of the first conqueror, and in the defense of a land which the Turks had considered as their own, he deserved the praise of his enemies, by whom alone he is known to posterity. Yielding to the first impulse of the torrent, he deposited his family and treasure in Nice, retired to the mountains with fifty thousand horse, and twice descended to assault the camps or quarters of the Christian besiegers, which formed an imperfect circle of above six miles. The lofty and solid walls of Nice were covered by a deep ditch, and flanked by three hundred and seventy towers, and on the verge of Christendom the Moslems were trained in arms, and inflamed by religion. Before this city the French princes occupied their stations, and prosecuted their attacks, without correspondence or subordination. Emulation prompted their valor, but their valor was sullied by cruelty, and their emulation degenerated into envy and civil discord. In the siege of Nice, the arts and engines of antiquity were employed by the Latins, the mine and the battering ram, the tortoise and the belfry or movable turret, artificial fire and the catapult and ballast, the sling and the crossbow for the casting of stones and darts. In the space of seven weeks, much labor and blood were expended, and some progress, especially by Count Raymond, was made on the side of the besiegers. But the Turks could protract their resistance and secure their escape as long as they were masters of the Lake Oscanias, which stretches several miles to the westward of the city. The means of conquest were supplied by the prudence and industry of Alexius. A great number of boats was transported on sledges from the sea to the lake. They were filled with the most dexterous of his archers. The flight of the Sultana was intercepted. Nice was invested by land and water, and a Greek emissary persuaded the inhabitants to accept his master's protection and to save themselves by a timely surrender from the rage of the savages of Europe. In the moment of victory, or at least of hope, the crusaders, thirsting for blood and plunder, were awed by the imperial banner that streamed from the citadel, and Alexius guarded, with jealous vigilance, this important conquest. The murmurs of the chiefs were stifled by honor or interest, and after a halt of nine days, they directed their march towards Phrygia under the guidance of a Greek general, whom they suspected of a secret connivance with the sultan. The consort and the principal servants of Solomon had been honorably restored without ransom, and the emperor's generosity to the miscreants was interpreted as treason to the Christian cause. Solomon was rather provoked than dismayed by the loss of his capital. He admonished his subjects and allies of this strange invasion of the western barbarians. The Turkish emirs obeyed the call of loyalty or religion. The Turkmen hordes encamped round his standard, and his whole force is loosely stated by the Christians at two hundred or even three hundred and sixty thousand horse. Yet he patiently waited till they had left behind them the sea and the Greek frontier, and hovering on the flanks observed their careless and confident progress in two columns beyond the view of each other. Some miles before they could reach Dolirame in Phrygia, the left and least numerous division was surprised and attacked, and almost oppressed by the Turkish cavalry. 
the heat of the weather, the clouds of arrows, and the barbarous onset overwhelmed the crusaders. They lost their order and confidence, and the fainting fight was sustained by the personal valor rather than by the military conduct of Bohemond, Tancred, and Robert of Normandy. They were revived by the welcome banners of Duke Godfrey, who flew to their succor, with the Count of Vermandois and sixty thousand horse, and was followed by Raymond of Thoulouse, the Bishop of Poi, and the remainder of the sacred army. Without a moment's pause, they formed in new order, and advanced to a second battle. They were received with equal resolution, and in their common disdain for the unwarlike people of Greece and Asia, it was confessed on both sides that the Turks and the Franks were the only nations entitled to the appellation of soldiers. Their encounter was varied and balanced by the contrast of arms and discipline, of the direct charge and wheeling evolutions, of the couched lance and the brandished javelin, of a weighty broadsword and a crooked saber, of cumbrous armor and thin flowing robes, and of the long tartar bow and the arbalist or crossbow, a deadly weapon yet unknown to the Orientals. As long as the horses were fresh and the quivers full, Solomon maintained the advantage of the day, and four thousand Christians were pierced by the Turkish arrows. In the evening swiftness yielded to strength. On either side the numbers were equal, or at least as great as any ground could hold or any generals could manage. But in turning the hills, the last division of Raymond and his provincials was led, perhaps without design, on the rear of an exhausted enemy, and the long contest was determined. Besides a nameless and unaccounted multitude, three thousand pagan knights were slain in the battle and pursuit. The camp of Solomon was pillaged, and in the variety of precious spoil, the curiosity of the Latins was amused with foreign arms and apparel, and the new aspect of dromedaries and camels. The importance of the victory was proved by the hasty retreat of the sultan. Reserving ten thousand guards of the relics of his army, Solomon evacuated the kingdom of Raum, and hastened to implore the aid and kindle the resentment of his eastern brethren. In a march of five hundred miles, the crusaders traversed the lesser Asia, through a wasted land and deserted towns, without finding either a friend or an enemy. The geographer may trace the position of Doliram, Antioch of Pisidia, Iconium, Archelaus, and Germanicia, and may compare those classic appellations with the modern names of Eskishir, the old city, Akshir, the white city, Cogni, Erechiel, and Marash, as the pilgrims passed over a desert where a draught of water is exchanged for silver, they were tormented by intolerable thirst, and on the banks of the first rivulet their haste and intemperance were still more pernicious to the disorderly throng. They climbed with toil and danger the steep and slippery sides of Mount Taurus. Many of the soldiers cast away their arms to secure their footsteps, and had not terror preceded their van, the long and trembling file might have been driven down the precipice by a handful of resolute enemies. Two of their most respectable chiefs, the Duke of Lorraine and the Count of Thoulouse, were carried in litters. Raymond was raised, as it is said by a miracle, from a hopeless malady, and Godfrey had been torn by a bear, as he pursued that rough and perilous chase in the mountains of Pisidia. To improve the general consternation, the cousin of Bohemond and the brother of Godfrey were detached from the main army with their respective squadrons of five and of seven hundred knights. They overran in a rapid career the hills and sea coast of Cilicia from Cogni to the Syrian gates. The Norman standard was planted on the walls of Tarsus and Malmistra, but the proud injustice of Baldwin at length provoked the patient and generous Italian and they turned their consecrated swords against each other in a private and profane quarrel. Honor was the motive, and fame the reward of Tancred, but fortune smiled on the more selfish enterprise of his rival. He was called to the assistance of a Greek or Armenian tyrant, who had been suffered under the Turkish yoke to reign over the Christians of Edessa. Baldwin accepted the character of his son and champion, 
but no sooner was he introduced into the city than he inflamed the people to the massacre of his father, occupied the throne and treasure, extended his conquests over the hills of Armenia and the plain of Mesopotamia, and founded the first principality of the Franks or Latins, which subsisted fifty-four years beyond the Euphrates. Before the Franks could enter Syria, the summer and even the autumn were completely wasted. The siege of Antioch, or the separation and repose of the army during the winter season, was strongly debated in their council. The love of arms and the holy sepulchre urged them to advance, and reason perhaps was on the side of resolution, since every hour of delay abates the fame and force of the invader, and multiplies the resources of defensive war. The capital of Syria was protected by the river Orontes, and the iron bridge of nine arches derives its name from the massy gates of the two towers, which are constructed at either end. They were opened by the sword of the Duke of Normandy. His victory gave entrance to three hundred thousand crusaders, an account which may allow some scope for losses and desertion, but which clearly detects much exaggeration in the review of Nice. In the description of Antioch, it is not easy to define a middle term between her ancient magnificence under the successors of Alexander and Augustus, and the modern aspect of Turkish desolation. The Tetropolis, or four cities, if they retained their name and position, must have left a large vacuity in a circumference of twelve miles, and that measure, as well as the number of four hundred towers, are not perfectly consistent with the five gates, so often mentioned in the history of the siege, yet Antioch must have still flourished as a great and populous capital. At the head of the Turkish emirs, Bagision, a veteran chief, commanded in the place. His garrison was composed of six or seven thousand horse, and fifteen or twenty thousand foot. One hundred thousand Moslems are said to have fallen by the sword, and their numbers were probably inferior to the Greeks, Armenians, and Syrians, who had been no more than fourteen years the slaves of the house of Seljuk. From the remains of a solid and stately wall, it appears to have arisen to the height of threescore feet in the valleys, and wherever less art and labor had been applied, the ground was supposed to be defended by the river, the morass, and the mountains. Notwithstanding these fortifications, the city had been repeatedly taken by the Persians, the Arabs, the Greeks, and the Turks. So large a circuit must have yielded many previous points of attack, and in a siege that was formed about the middle of October, the vigor of the execution could alone justify the boldness of the attempt. Whatever strength and valor could perform in the field was abundantly discharged by the champions of the cross, in the frequent occasions of sallies, of forage, of the attack and defense of convoys, they were often victorious, and we can only complain that their exploits are sometimes enlarged beyond the scale of probability and truth. The sword of Godfrey divided a Turk from the shoulder to the haunch, and one half of the infidel fell to the ground, while the other was transported by his horse to the city gate. As Robert of Normandy rode against his antagonist, I devote thy head, he piously exclaimed, to the demons of hell, and that head was instantly cloven to the breast by the resistless stroke of his descending falchion. But the reality, or the report of such gigantic prowess, must have taught the Moslems to keep within their walls, and against those walls of earth or stone the sword and the lance were unavailing weapons. In the slow and successive labors of the siege, the crusaders were supine and ignorant, without skill to contrive, or money to purchase, or industry to use, the artificial engines and implements of assault. In the conquest of Nice, they had been powerfully assisted by the wealth and knowledge of the Greek emperor. His absence was poorly supplied by some Genoese and Pecian vessels that were attracted by religion or trade to the coast of Syria. The stores were scanty, the return precarious, and the communication difficult and dangerous. Indolence or weakness had prevented the Franks from investing the entire circuit, and the perpetual freedom of two gates relieved the wants and recruited the garrison of the city. 
At the end of seven months, after the ruin of their cavalry, and an enormous loss by famine, desertion, and fatigue, the progress of the crusaders was imperceptible, and their success remote. If the Latin Ulysses, the artful and ambitious Bohemond, had not employed the arms of cunning and deceit, the Christians of Antioch were numerous and discontented. Phyraus, a Syrian renegado, had acquired the favor of the emir and the command of three towers, and the merit of his repentance disguised to the Latins, and perhaps to himself, the foul design of perfidy and treason. A secret correspondence, for their mutual interest, was soon established between Phyraus and the prince of Tarento, and Bohemond declared, in the council of the chiefs, that he could deliver the city into their hands. But he claimed the sovereignty of Antioch as the reward of his service, and the proposal which had been rejected by the envy was at length extorted from the distress of his equals. The nocturnal surprise was executed by the French and Norman princes, who ascended in person the scaling ladders that were thrown from the walls. Their new proselyte, after the murder of his too scrupulous brother, embraced and introduced the servants of Christ. The army rushed through the gates, and the Moslems soon found that although mercy was hopeless, resistance was impotent. But the citadel still refused to surrender, and the victims themselves were speedily encompassed and besieged by the innumerable forces of Kerboga, prince of Mosul, who, with twenty-eight Turkish emirs, advanced to the deliverance of Antioch. Five and twenty days the Christians spent on the verge of destruction, and the proud lieutenant of the caliph and the sultan left them only the choice of servitude or death. In this extremity they collected the relics of their strength, sallied from the town, and in a single memorable day annihilated or dispersed the host of Turks and Arabians, which they might safely report to have consisted of six hundred thousand men. Their supernatural allies I shall proceed to consider. The human causes of the victory of Antioch were the fearless despair of the Franks, and the surprise, the discord, perhaps the errors of their unskillful and presumptuous adversaries, the battle is described with as much disorder as it was fought, but we may observe the tent of Kerboga, a movable and spacious palace, enriched with the luxury of Asia, and capable of holding above two thousand persons. We may distinguish his three thousand guards, who were cased, the horse as well as the men, in complete steel. In the eventful period of the siege and defense of Antioch, the crusaders were alternately exalted by victory or sunk in despair, either swelled with plenty or emaciated with hunger. A speculative reasoner might suppose that their faith had a strong and serious influence on their practice, and that the soldiers of the cross, the deliverers of the holy sepulchre, prepared themselves by a sober and virtuous life for the daily contemplation of martyrdom. Experience blows away this charitable illusion, and seldom does the history of profane war display such scenes of intemperance and prostitution as were exhibited under the walls of Antioch. The grove of Daphne no longer flourished, but the Syrian air was still impregnated with the same vices. The Christians were seduced by every temptation that nature either prompts or reprobates. The authority of the chiefs was despised and sermons and edicts were alike fruitless against those scandalous disorders, not less pernicious to military discipline than repugnant to evangelic purity. In the first days of the siege and the possession of Antioch, the Franks consumed with wanton and thoughtless prodigality the frugal subsistence of weeks and months. The desolate country no longer yielded a supply, and from that country they were at length excluded by the arms of the besieging Turks. Disease, the faithful companion of want, was envenomed by the rains of the winter, the summer heats, unwholesome food, and the close imprisonment of multitudes. The pictures of famine and pestilence are always the same and always disgustful, and our imagination may suggest the nature of their sufferings and their resources. 
the remains of treasure or spoil were eagerly lavished in the purchase of the vilest nourishment, and dreadful must have been the calamities of the poor, since, after paying three marks of silver for a goat and fifteen for a lean camel, the Count of Flanders was reduced to beg a dinner, and Duke Godfrey to borrow a horse. Sixty thousand horse had been reviewed in the camp. Before the end of the siege they were diminished to two thousand, and scarcely two hundred fit for service could be mustered on the day of battle. Weakness of body and terror of mind extinguished the ardent enthusiasm of the pilgrims, and every motive of honor and religion was subdued by the desire of life. Among the chiefs, three heroes may be found without fear or reproach. Godfrey of Bouillon was supported by his magnanimous piety, Bohemond by ambition and interest, and Tancre declared, in the true spirit of chivalry, that as long as he was at the head of forty knights, he would never relinquish the enterprise of Palestine. But the Count of Thoulouse and Provence was suspected of a voluntary indisposition. The Duke of Normandy was recalled from the seashore by the censures of the church. You the Great, though he led the vanguard of the battle, embraced an ambiguous opportunity of returning to France, and Stephen, Count of Chartres, basely deserted the standard which he bore and the council in which he presided. The soldiers were discouraged by the flight of William, Viscount of Melun, surnamed the Carpenter, from the weighty strokes of his axe, and the saints were scandalized by the fall of Peter the Hermit, who, after arming Europe against Asia, attempted to escape from the penance of a necessary fast. Of the multitude of recreant warriors, the names, says an historian, are blotted from the book of life, and the opprobrious epithet of the rope-dancers was applied to the deserters who dropped in the night from the walls of Antioch. The emperor Alexius, who seemed to advance to the succor of the Latins, was dismayed by the assurance of their hopeless condition. They expected their fate in silent despair. Oaths and punishments were tried without effect, and to rouse the soldiers to the defense of the walls, it was found necessary to set fire to their quarters. For their salvation and victory, they were indebted to the same fanaticism which had led them to the brink of ruin. In such a cause, and in such an army, visions, prophecies, and miracles were frequent and familiar. In the distress of Antioch, they were repeated with unusual energy and success. St. Ambrose had assured a pious ecclesiastic that two years of trial must precede the season of deliverance and grace. The deserters were stopped by the presence and reproaches of Christ himself. The dead had promised to arise and combat with their brethren. The virgin had obtained the pardon of their sins, and their confidence was revived by a visible sign, the seasonable and splendid discovery of the holy lance. The policy of their chiefs has on this occasion been admired, and might surely be excused, but a pious bod is seldom produced by the cool conspiracy of many persons, and a voluntary impostor might depend on the support of the wise and the credulity of the people. Of the diocese of Marcel, there was a priest of low cunning and loose manners, and his name was Peter Bartholomew. He presented himself at the door of the council chamber to disclose an apparition of St. Andrew, which had been thrice reiterated in his sleep with a dreadful menace, if he presumed to suppress the commands of heaven. At Antioch, said the apostle, in the church of my brother St. Peter, near the high altar, is concealed the steel head of the lance that pierced the side of our Redeemer. In three days that instrument of eternal, and now temporal, salvation will be manifested to his disciples. Search, and ye shall find, bear it aloft in battle, and that mystic weapon shall penetrate the souls of the miscreants. The Pope's legate, the Bishop of Poi, affected to listen with coldness and distrust, but the revelation was eagerly accepted by Count Raymond, whom his faithful subject, in the name of the Apostle, had chosen for the guardian of the Holy Lance. The experiment was resolved, and on the third day, after a due preparation of prayer and fasting, 
the priest of Marcel introduced twelve trusty spectators, among whom were the count and his chaplain, and the church doors were barred against the impetuous multitude. The ground was opened in the appointed place, but the workmen, who relieved each other, dug to the depth of twelve feet, without discovering the object of their search. In the evening, when Count Raymond had withdrawn to his post, and the wary assistants began to murmur, Bartholomew, in his shirt and without shoes, boldly descended into the pit. The darkness of the hour and of the place enabled him to secrete and deposit the head of a Saracen lance, and the first sound, the first gleam of the steel, was saluted with a devout rapture. The holy lance was drawn from its recess, wrapped in a veil of silk and gold, and exposed to the veneration of the crusaders. Their anxious suspense burst forth in a general shout of joy and hope, and the desponding troops were again inflamed with the enthusiasm of valor. Whatever had been the arts, and whatever might be the sentiments of the chiefs, they skillfully improved this fortunate revolution by every aid that discipline and devotion could afford. The soldiers were dismissed to their quarters, with an injunction to fortify their minds and bodies for the approaching conflict, freely to bestow their last pittance on themselves and their horses, and to expect with the dawn of day the signal of victory. On the festival of St. Peter and St. Paul, the gates of Antioch were thrown open. A martial psalm, Let the Lord arise and let his enemies be scattered, was chanted by a procession of priests and monks. The battle array was marshaled in twelve divisions, in honor of the twelve apostles, and the holy lance, in the absence of Raymond, was entrusted to the hands of his chaplain. The influence of his holy relic was felt by the servants and perhaps by the enemies of Christ, and its potent energy was heightened by an accident, a stratagem, or a rumor of a miraculous complexion. Three knights, in white garments and resplendent arms, either issued or seemed to issue from the hills. The voice of Adamar, the Pope's legate, proclaimed them as the martyrs St. George, St. Theodore, and St. Maurice. The tumult of battle allowed no time for doubt or scrutiny, and the welcome apparition dazzled the eyes or the imagination of a fanatic army. In the season of danger and triumph, the revelation of Bartholomew of Marcel was unanimously asserted, but as soon as the temporary service was accomplished, the personal dignity and liberal arms which the Count of Thoulouse derived from the custody of the Holy Lance provoked the envy and awakened the reason of his rivals. A Norman clerk presumed to sift, with a philosophic spirit, the truth of the legend, the circumstances of the discovery, and the character of the prophet, and the pious Bohemon described their deliverance to the merits and intercession of Christ alone. For a while, the provincials defended their national palladium with clamors and arms and new visions condemned to death and hell, the profane skeptics who presumed to scrutinize the truth and merit of the discovery. The prevalence of incredulity compelled the author to submit his life and veracity to the judgment of God. A pile of dry faggots, four feet high and fourteen long, was erected in the midst of the camp. The flames burnt fiercely to the elevation of thirty cubits, and a narrow path of twelve inches was left for the perilous trial. The unfortunate priest of Marcel traversed the fire with dexterity and speed, but the thighs and belly were scorched by the intense heat. He expired the next day, and the logic of believing minds will pay some regard to his dying protestations of innocence and truth. Some efforts were made by the provincials to substitute a cross, a ring, or a tabernacle in the place of the holy lance, which soon vanished in contempt and oblivion. Yet the revelation of Antioch is gravely asserted by succeeding historians, and such is the progress of credulity, that miracles most doubtful on the spot and at the moment will be received with implicit faith at a convenient distance of time and space. The prudence or fortune of the Franks had delayed their invasion till the decline of the Turkish Empire. Under the manly government of the three first sultans, the kingdoms of Asia were united in peace and justice, 
and the innumerable armies which they led in person were equal in courage and superior in discipline to the barbarians of the west but at the time of the crusades the inheritance of malek shah was disputed by his four sons their private ambition was insensible of the public danger and in the vicissitudes of their fortune the royal vassals were ignorant or regardless of the true object of their allegiance the twenty-eight emirs who marched with the standard of kerboga were his rivals or enemies their hasty levies were drawn from the towns and tents of mesopotamia and syria and the turkish veterans were employed or consumed in the civil wars beyond the tigris the caliph of egypt embraced this opportunity of weakness and discord to recover his ancient possessions and his sultan afdal besieged jerusalem and tyre expelled the children of ortok and restored in palestine the civil and ecclesiastical authority of the fatimes they heard with astonishment of the vast armies of christians that had passed from europe to asia and rejoiced in the sieges and battles which broke the power of the turks the adversaries of their sect and monarchy but the same christians were the enemies of the prophet and from the overthrow of nice and antioch the motive of their enterprise which was gradually understood would urge them forwards to the banks of the jordan or perhaps of the nile an intercourse of epistles and embassies which rose and fell with the events of war was maintained between the throne of cairo and the camp of the latins and their adverse pride was the result of ignorance and enthusiasm the ministers of egypt declared in a haughty or insinuated in a milder tone that their sovereign the true and lawful commander of the faithful had rescued jerusalem from the turkish yoke and that the pilgrims if they would divide their numbers and lay aside their arms should find a safe and hospitable reception at the sepulchre of jesus in the belief of their lost condition the caliph mostali despised their arms and imprisoned their deputies the conquest and victory of antioch prompted him to solicit these formidable champions with gifts of horses and silk robes of vases and purses of gold and silver and in his estimate of their merit or power the first place was assigned to bohemond and the second to godfrey in either fortune the answer of the crusaders was firm and uniform they disdained to inquire into the private claims or possessions of the followers of mahomet whatsoever was his name or nation the usurper of jerusalem was their enemy and instead of prescribing the mode and terms of their pilgrimage it was only by a timely surrender of the city and province their sacred right that he could deserve their alliance or deprecate their impending and irresistible attack yet this attack when they were within the view and reach of their glorious prize was suspended above ten months after the defeat of kerboga the zeal and courage of the crusaders were chilled in the moment of victory and instead of marching to improve the consternation they hastily dispersed to enjoy the luxury of syria the causes of this strange delay may be found in the want of strength and subordination in the painful and various service of antioch the cavalry was annihilated many thousands of every rank had been lost by famine sickness and desertion the same abuse of plenty had been productive of a third famine and the alternative of intemperance and distress had generated a pestilence which swept away above fifty thousand of the pilgrims few were able to command and none were willing to obey the domestic feuds which had been stifled by common fear were again renewed in acts or at least in sentiments of hostility the fortune of baldwin and bohemond excited the envy of their companions the bravest knights were enlisted for the defense of their new principalities and count raymond exhausted his troops and treasures in an idle expedition into the heart of syria the winter was consumed in discord and disorder a sense of honor and religion was rekindled in the spring and the private soldiers less susceptible of ambition and jealousy awakened with angry clamors the indolence of their chiefs in the month of may the relics of this army proceeded from antioch to laodicea about forty thousand latins of whom no more than fifteen hundred horse and twenty thousand foot were capable of immediate service 
Their easy march was continued between Mount Libanus and the seashore. Their wants were liberally supplied by the coasting traders of Genoa and Pisa, and they drew large contributions from the emirs of Tripoli, Tyre, Sidon, Acre, and Caesarea, who granted a free passage and promised to follow the example of Jerusalem. From Caesarea they advanced into the Midland country. Their clerks recognized the sacred geography of Leda, Ramla, Emmaus, and Bethlehem, and as soon as they descried the holy city, the crusaders forgot their toil. Jerusalem has derived some reputation from the number and importance of her memorable sieges. It was not till after a long and obstinate contest that Babylon and Rome could prevail against the obstinacy of the people, the craggy ground that might supersede the necessity of fortifications, and the walls and towers that would have fortified the most accessible plain. These obstacles were diminished in the age of the Crusades. The bulwarks had been completely destroyed and imperfectly restored. The Jews, their nation, and worship were forever banished. But nature is less changeable than man, and the sight of Jerusalem, though somewhat softened and somewhat removed, was still strong against the assaults of an enemy. By the experience of a recent siege and a three years' possession, the Saracens of Egypt had been taught to discern, and in some degree to remedy, the defects of a place, which religion as well as honor forbade them to resign. Aladdin, or Iftikhar, the caliph's lieutenant, was entrusted with the defense. His policy strove to restrain the native Christians by the dread of their own ruin and that of the holy sepulchre, to animate the Muslims by the assurance of temporal and eternal rewards. His garrison is said to have consisted of forty thousand Turks and Arabians, and if he could muster twenty thousand of the inhabitants, it must be confessed that the besieged were more numerous than the besieging army. Had the diminished strength and numbers of the Latins allowed them to grasp the whole circumference of four thousand yards, about two English miles and a half, to what useful purpose should they have descended into the valley of Ben-Hinnon and Torrent of Cedron, or approached the precipices of the south and east, from whence they had nothing either to hope or fear? Their siege was more reasonably directed against the northern and western sides of the city. Godfrey of Bullion erected his standard on the first swell of Mount Calvary. To the left, as far as St. Stephen's Gate, the line of attack was continued by Tancray and the two Roberts, and Count Raymond established his quarters from the citadel to the foot of Mount Sion, which was no longer included within the precincts of the city. On the fifth day, the crusaders made a general assault, in the fanatic hope of battering down the walls without engines, and of scaling them without ladders. By the dint of brutal force, they burst the first barrier, but they were driven back with shame and slaughter to the camp. The influence of vision and prophecy was deadened by the too frequent abuse of those pious stratagems, and time and labor were found to be the only means of victory. The time of the siege was indeed fulfilled in forty days, but they were forty days of calamity and anguish. A repetition of the old complaint of famine may be imputed in some degree to the voracious or disorderly appetite of the Franks, but the stony soil of Jerusalem is almost destitute of water, the scanty springs and hasty torrents were dry in the summer season, nor was the thirst of the besiegers relieved, as in the city, by the artificial supply of cisterns and aqueducts. The circumjacent country is equally destitute of trees for the uses of shade or building, but some large beams were discovered in a cave by the crusaders. A wood near Sycam, the enchanted grove of Tasso, was cut down. The necessary timber was transported to the camp by the vigor and dexterity of Tancray, and the engines were framed by some Genoese artists, who had fortunately landed in the harbor of Jaffa. Two movable turrets were constructed at the expense and in the stations of the Duke of Lorraine and the Count of Thoulouse, and rolled forwards with devout labor, not to the most accessible, but to the most neglected parts of the fortification. Raymond's tower was reduced to ashes by the fire of the besieged, 
but his colleague was more vigilant and successful. The enemies were driven by his archers from the rampart, the drawbridge was let down, and on a Friday, at three in the afternoon, the day and hour of the Passion, Godfrey of Bouillon stood victorious on the walls of Jerusalem. His example was followed on every side by the emulation of valor, and about four hundred and sixty years after the conquest of Omar, the holy city was rescued from the Mahometan yoke. In the pillage of public and private wealth, the adventurers had agreed to respect the exclusive property of the first occupant, and the spoils of the great mosque, seventy lamps and massy vases of gold and silver, rewarded the diligence and displayed the generosity of Tan Cray. A bloody sacrifice was offered by his mistaken votaries to the god of the Christians. Resistance might provoke, but neither age nor sex could mollify their implacable rage. They indulged themselves three days in a promiscuous massacre, and the infection of the dead bodies produced an epidemical disease. After seventy thousand Muslims had been put to the sword, and the harmless Jews had been burnt in their synagogue, they could still reserve a multitude of captives, whom interest or lassitude persuaded them to spare. Of these savage heroes of the cross, Tancre alone betrayed some sentiments of compassion, yet we may praise the more selfish lenity of Raymond, who granted a capitulation and safe conduct to the garrison of the citadel. The holy sepulchre was now free, and the bloody victors prepared to accomplish their vow. Bareheaded and barefoot, with contrite hearts and in an humble posture, they ascended the hill of Calvary amidst the loud anthems of the clergy, kissed the stone which had covered the Savior of the world, and bedewed with tears of joy and penitence the monument of their redemption. This union of the fiercest and most tender passions has been variously considered by two philosophers, by the one as easy and natural, by the other as absurd and incredible. Perhaps it is too rigorously applied to the same persons and the same hour. The example of the virtuous Godfrey awakened the piety of his companions. While they cleansed their bodies, they purified their minds. Nor shall I believe that the most ardent in slaughter and rapine were the foremost in the procession to the holy sepulchre. Eight days after this memorable event, which Pope Urban did not live to hear, the Latin chiefs proceeded to the election of a king, to guard and govern their conquests in Palestine. You the Great and Stephen of Chartres had retired with some loss of reputation, which they strove to regain by a second crusade and an honorable death. Baldwin was established at Edessa and Bohemond at Antioch, and two Roberts, the Duke of Normandy and the Count of Flanders, preferred their fair inheritance in the West to a doubtful competition or a barren scepter. The jealousy and ambition of Raymond were condemned by his own followers, and the free, the just, the unanimous voice of the army proclaimed Godfrey of Bouillon, the first and most worthy of the champions of Christendom. His magnanimity accepted a trust as full of danger as of glory, but in a city where his savior had been crowned with thorns, the devout pilgrim rejected the name and ensigns of royalty, and the founder of the kingdom of Jerusalem contented himself with the modest title of defender and baron of the holy sepulchre. His government of a single year, too short for the public happiness, was interrupted in the first fortnight by a summons to the field, by the approach of the vizier or sultan of Egypt, who had been too slow to prevent but who was impatient to avenge the loss of Jerusalem. His total overthrow in the battle of Ascalon sealed the establishment of the Latins in Syria, and signalized the valor of the French princes, who in this action bade a long farewell to the holy wars. Some glory may be derived from the prodigious inequality of numbers, though I shall not count the myriads of horse and foot on the side of the Fatimes, but except three thousand Ethiopians or blacks, who were armed with flails or scourgers of iron, the barbarians of the south fled on the first onset, and afforded a pleasing comparison between the active valor of the Turks and the sloth and effeminacy of the natives of Egypt. 
After suspending before the holy sepulchre the sword and standard of the sultan, the new king, he deserves the title, embraced his departing companions, and could retain only with the gallant Tancray three hundred knights and two thousand foot soldiers for the defense of Palestine. His sovereignty was soon attacked by a new enemy, the only one against whom Godfrey was a coward, Adamar, Bishop of Poi, who excelled both in counsel and action, had been swept away in the last plague at Antioch. The remaining ecclesiastics preserved only the pride and avarice of their character, and their seditious clamors had required that the choice of a bishop should precede that of a king. The revenue and jurisdiction of the lawful patriarch were usurped by the Latin clergy. The exclusion of the Greeks and Syrians was justified by the reproach of heresy or schism, and under the iron yoke of their deliverers, the Oriental Christians regretted the tolerating government of the Arabian caliphs. Damebert, Archbishop of Pisa, had long been trained in the secret policy of Rome. He brought a fleet at his countrymen to the succor of the Holy Land, and was installed without a competitor, the spiritual and temporal head of the church. The new patriarch immediately grasped the scepter, which had been acquired by the toil and blood of the victorious pilgrims, and both Godfrey and Bohemond submitted to receive at his hands the investiture of their feudal possessions. Nor was this sufficient. Damebert claimed the immediate property of Jerusalem and Jaffa. Instead of a firm and generous refusal, the hero negotiated with the priest. A quarter of either city was ceded to the church, and the modest bishop was satisfied with an eventual reversion of the rest on the death of Godfrey without children, or on the future acquisition of a new seat at Cairo or Damascus. Without this indulgence, the conqueror would have almost been stripped of his infant kingdom, which consisted only of Jerusalem and Jaffa, with about twenty villages and towns of the adjacent country. Within this narrow verge, the Mahometans were still lodged in some impregnable castles, and the husbandman, the trader, and the pilgrim were exposed to daily and domestic hostility. By the arms of Godfrey himself, and of the two Baldwins, his brother and cousin, who succeeded to the throne, the Latins breathed with more ease and safety, and at length they equaled, in the extent of their dominions, though not in the millions of their subjects, the ancient princes of Judah and Israel. After the reduction of the maritime cities of Laodicea, Tripoli, Tyre, and Ascalon, which were powerfully assisted by the fleets of Venice, Genoa, and Pisa, and even of Flanders and Norway, the range of sea-coast from Scandaroon to the borders of Egypt was possessed by the Christian pilgrims. If the prince of Antioch disclaimed his supremacy, the counts of Edessa and Tripoli owned themselves the vassals of the king of Jerusalem. The Latins reigned beyond the Euphrates, and the four cities of Hems, Hama, Damascus, and Aleppo were the only relics of the Mahometan conquests in Syria. The laws and language the manners and titles of the French nation and Latin church were introduced into these transmarine colonies. According to the feudal jurisprudence, the principal states and subordinate baronies descended in the line of male and female secession, but the children of the first conquerors, a motley and degenerate race, were dissolved by the luxury of the climate. The arrival of the new crusaders from Europe was a doubtful hope and a causal event, the service of the feudal tenure was performed by six hundred and sixty-six knights, who might expect the aid of two hundred more under the banner of the Count of Tripoli, and each knight was attended to the field by four squires or archers on horseback. Five thousand and seventy sergeants, most probably foot soldiers, were supplied by the church and cities, and the whole legal militia of the kingdom could not exceed eleven thousand men a slender defense against the surrounding myriads of Saracens and Turks. But the firmest bulwark of Jerusalem was founded on the knights of the Hospital of St. John and of the Temple of Solomon, on the strange association of a monastic and military life, which fanaticism might suggest, but which policy must approve. The flower of the nobility of Europe aspired to wear the cross and to profess the vows of these respectable orders, 
their spirit and discipline were immortal, and the speedy donation of twenty-eight thousand farms or manors enabled them to support a regular force of cavalry and infantry for the defense of Palestine. The austerity of the convent soon evaporated in the exercise of arms. The world was scandalized by the pride, avarice, and corruption of these Christian soldiers. Their claims of immunity and jurisdiction disturbed the harmony of the church and state, and the public peace was endangered by their jealous emulation. But in their most dissolute period, the knights of the hospital and temple maintained their fearless and fanatic character. They neglected to live, but they were prepared to die in the service of Christ, and the spirit of chivalry, the parent and offspring of the Crusades, has been transplanted by this institution from the Holy Sepulchre to the Isle of Malta. The spirit of freedom, which pervades the feudal institutions, was felt in its strongest energy by the volunteers of the cross, who elected for their chief the most deserving of his peers, amidst the slaves of Asia, unconscious of the lesson or example, a model of political liberty was introduced, and the laws of the French kingdom are derived from the purest source of equality and justice. Of such laws, the first and indispensable condition is the assent of those whose obedience they require, and for whose benefit they are designed. No sooner had Godfrey of Bouillon accepted the office of supreme magistrate, then he solicited the public and private advice of the Latin pilgrims, who were the best skilled in the statutes and customs of Europe. From these materials, with the counsel and approbation of the patriarch and barons, of the clergy and laity, Godfrey composed the Ossise of Jerusalem, a precious monument of feudal jurisprudence. The new code, attested by the seals of the king, the patriarch, and the viscount of Jerusalem, was deposited in the holy sepulchre, enriched with the improvements of succeeding times, and respectfully consulted as often as any doubtful question arose in the tribunals of Palestine. With the kingdom and city all was lost. The fragments of the written law were preserved by jealous tradition and variable practice till the middle of the thirteenth century. The code was restored by the pen of John de Boleyn, Count of Jaffa, one of the principal feudatories, and the final revision was accomplished in the year 1369 for the use of the Latin kingdom of Cyprus. The justice and freedom of the constitution were maintained by two tribunals of unequal dignity, which were instituted by Godfrey of Bouillon after the conquest of Jerusalem. The king in person presided in the upper court, the court of the barons. Of these, the foremost conspicuous were the prince of Galilee, the lord of Sidon and Caesarea, and the counts of Jaffa and Tripoli, who, perhaps with the constable and marshal, were in a special manner the compeers and judges of each other. But all the nobles, who held their lands immediately of the crown, were entitled and bound to attend the king's court, and each baron exercised a similar jurisdiction on the subordinate assemblies of his own feudatories. The connection of lord and vassal was honorable and voluntary. Reverence was due to the benefactor, protection to the dependent, but they mutually pledged their faith to each other, and the obligation on either side might be suspended by neglect or dissolved by injury. The cognizance of marriages and testaments was blended with religion and usurped by the clergy, but the civil and criminal causes of the nobles, the inheritance and tenure of their fiefs, formed the proper occupation of the supreme court. Each member was the judge and guardian both of public and private rights. It was his duty to assert with his tongue and sword the lawful claims of the lord, but if an unjust superior presumed to violate the freedom or property of a vassal, the confederate peers stood forth to maintain his quarrel by word and deed. They boldly affirmed his innocence and his wrongs, demanded the restitution of his liberty or his lands, suspended after a fruitless demand their own service, rescued their brother from prison, and employed every weapon in his defense, without offering direct violence to the person of their lord, which was ever sacred in their eyes. In their pleadings, replies, and rejoinders, the advocates of the court were subtle and copious, but the use of argument and evidence was often superseded by judicial combat, 
and the Ossisse of Jerusalem admits in many cases this barbarous institution, which has been slowly abolished by the laws and manners of Europe. The trial by battle was established in all criminal cases which affected the life or limb or honor of any person, and in all civil transactions of or above the value of one mark of silver. It appears that in criminal cases the combat was the privilege of the accuser, who, except in a charge of treason, avenged his personal injury or the death of those persons whom he had a right to represent. But wherever, from the nature of the charge, testimony could be obtained, it was necessary for him to produce witnesses of the fact. In civil cases, the combat was not allowed as the means of establishing the claim of the demandant, but he was obliged to produce witnesses who had, or assumed to have, knowledge of the fact. The combat was then the privilege of the defendant, because he charged the witness with an attempt by perjury to take away his right. He came, therefore, to be in the same situation as the appellant in criminal cases. It was not then as a mode of proof that the combat was received, nor as making negative evidence, according to the supposition of Montesquieu. But in every case, the right to offer battle was founded on the right to pursue by arms the redress of an injury, and the judicial combat was fought on the same principle and with the same spirit as a private duel. Champions were only allowed to women and to men maimed or past the age of sixty. The consequence of a defeat was death to the person accused, or to the champion or witness, as well as to the accuser himself. But in civil cases, the demandant was punished with infamy and the loss of his suit, while his witness and champion suffered ignominious death. In many cases, it was in the opinion of the judge to award or to refuse the combat, but two are specified in which it was the inevitable result of the challenge. If a faithful vassal gave the lead to his compeer, who unjustly claimed any portion of their lord's demences, or if an unsuccessful suitor presumed to impeach the judgment and veracity of the court. He might impeach them, but the terms were severe and perilous. In the same day he successively fought all the members of the tribunal, even those who had been absent. A single defeat was followed by death and infamy, and where none could hope for victory, it is highly probable that none would adventure the trial. In the Ossisse of Jerusalem, the legal subtlety of the Count of Jaffa is more laudably employed to elude than to facilitate the judicial combat, which he derives from a principle of honor rather than of superstition. Among the causes which enfranchised the plebeians from the yoke of feudal tyranny, the institution of cities and corporations is one of the most powerful, and if those of Palestine are coeval with the First Crusade, they may be ranked with the most ancient of the Latin world. Many of the pilgrims had escaped from their lords under the banner of the cross, and it was the policy of the French princes to tempt their stay by the assurance of the rights and privileges of free men. It is expressly declared in the Ossisse of Jerusalem that after instituting for his knights and barons the court of peers in which he presided himself, Godfrey of Bullion established a second tribunal, in which his person was represented by his viscount. The jurisdiction of this inferior court extended over the burgess of the kingdom, and it was composed of a select number of the most discreet and worthy citizens, who were sworn to judge, according to the laws of the actions and fortunes of their equals. In the contest and settlement of new cities, the example of Jerusalem was imitated by the kings and their great vassals, and above thirty similar corporations were founded before the loss of the Holy Land. Another class of subjects, the Syrians or Oriental Christians, were oppressed by the zeal of the clergy and protected by the toleration of the state. Godfrey listened to their reasonable prayer that they might be judged by their own national laws. A third court was instituted for their use of limited and domestic jurisdiction. The sworn members were Syrians in blood, language, and religion, but the office of the president, an Arabic of the race, was sometimes exercised by the viscount of the city. At an immeasurable distance below the nobles, the burgess, and the strangers, the Ossisse of Jerusalem condescends to mention the villains and slaves, the peasants of the land, and the captives of war, 
who were almost equally considered as the objects of property. The relief or protection of these unhappy men was not esteemed worthy of the care of the legislator, but he diligently provides for the recovery, though not indeed for the punishment, of the fugitives. Like hounds or hawks, who had strayed from the lawful owner, they might be lost and claimed. The slave and falcon were of the same value, but three slaves, or twelve oxen, were accumulated to equal the price of the war-horse, and a sum of three hundred pieces of gold was fixed, in the age of chivalry, as the equivalent of the more noble animal.